The Light We Lost, a post-apocalyptic survival thriller. Lost Light, Book One. Written by Kyla Stone. Read for you by Stacy Glomboski. Preface. This story takes place in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Real towns and cities are used in this novel. However, Occasional liberties have been taken by the author for the sake of the story. While the Munising Police Department and Alger County Sheriff's Office are real institutions, the versions within these pages are entirely fictional. Thank you in advance for understanding an author's creative license. Something started in the north band of the sky. All that part of the sky appeared burning in fiery flames. It seemed that the sky was burning. At midnight, great fiery rays rose above the castle, which were dreadful and fearful. Everybody went to the countryside to see this great sign. Actual eyewitness account from Lisbon, March 6th, 1582. Love is the last light spoken. Dylan Thomas 1. Shiloh Easton Day 1 Shiloh Easton woke with blood on her hands, heat on her face, her cheeks, stones dug into her spine, grass tickled her bare arms. Blinking, Shiloh stared up at a hard blue sky, no clouds. The round disk of the sun peeked between her eyelashes, too bright to look at. At the fringes of her vision, towering jack pines, eastern hemlocks, and cottonwoods stretched for the heavens. But heaven was too far to reach. Hell was right here beside her. Wetness on her fingers, blood, slick and technicolor red. It splattered her forearms, slippery on her palms, red lines beneath her fingernails. Somehow she understood it was not her blood. The terror was like biting into a live wire. Her stomach churned. She sat up, white spots spinning in front of her eyes. Don't look. A primal instinct echoed from the deepest part of herself. Whatever you do, don't look. Shiloh forced herself to look. Her legs stretched out in front of her, worn jeans with holes in the knees, sneakers stained with mud. Past her feet lay hard-packed dirt. Glass shards and tiny bits of metal and plastic glinted in the sunlight. The ground was torn up in the shape of footprints. Here and there, tufts of grass were matted down. A rusted forklift sat to her right, next to a tiered rack of scavenged tires and rims. In front of her stood row after row of junked vehicles, cars and trucks and vans by the dozens. Her eyes skipped past the unmoving shape lying a few yards away. The thing she didn't want to see, didn't want to know. She couldn't remember what had happened, why blood streaked her hands. Unsteadily, she stood. Dizziness washed over her. Shards of glass stuck to her hair, to her jeans. She bent double, gasping, her hands on her thighs. Fear stuck in her chest like a fish hook. Shiloh blinked, her mouth moving, silently repeating the only words that could calm her. Montgomery, Alabama. Juneau, Alaska. Phoenix, Arizona. The places she so desperately yearned to see, but never had. A collection in her head. Lists of cities, states, and countries. Places she would visit someday. Stealing herself, she straightened. Her bloody fingers curled into fists at her sides, fingernails digging hard into her palms. Her eyes settled on the lumpy form her brain had refused to register a body. With a rush of hollow horror, 
she took it in. The scuffed work boots, worn jeans, plaid shirt with the sleeves rolled up to the forearms, the familiar red handkerchief tied around the neck. His head was turned to the side, body splayed like he'd fallen backward or had been pushed. She took a step closer, forced herself to circle the body. Little Rock, Arkansas. Sacramento, California. Denver, Colorado. His faded John Deere cap lay a yard away in the grass. Blotches of crimson darkened the olive green fabric. A crowbar lay beside the hat. It glistened red, tufts of hair and bits of flesh clinging to the iron. The hard, grizzled features had gone slack, silver gray hair blackened on one side with blood and other things she didn't want to consider. Bits of bone, brain matter. The left side of his face was caved in. He was dead. Her grandfather was dead. She felt dazed, shaken. Her guts twisted with grief and fear. What had happened? She didn't know. She didn't remember. Her mind was a blank. The blankness terrified her. Her memory was like a movie reel, fluttering to a jagged stop. There was nothing, just an emptiness, a sensation of falling, of cold fear, like plunging into a frigid lake. Why couldn't she remember? She'd fallen through a hole in time. It had happened before. Her mind had gone blank. A chunk of minutes or hours that disappeared. A total blackout. All this blood. The torn up ground. Her dead grandfather. And her brother. Where was he? Cody was supposed to be here. He helped in the salvage yard every day after school operating the forklift, cutting up metal, organizing scraps, stacking tires. Cody! She screamed his name. Her ragged voice echoed back at her. Cody! There was nothing. The evening sun slanted into her eyes, painting the wrecked vehicles in shades of gold. Where are you? No one answered. Her heart felt like it was splintering inside her chest. Panic bit at her. She fought it back. A chain link fence topped by razor wire circled the salvage yard. A hundred yards beyond the salvage yard, a ramshackle two-story house stood atop the hill. White paint faded to gray. The forest crept in on all sides, deep shadows spilling like oil, hiding its secrets. Her grandfather owned 200 acres of wilderness abutting Lake Superior, the great northern lake that held its own secrets, its own ghosts. Shiloh had been born here. She'd lived in this beautiful, half-wild place her entire life, every day of the last 13 years. This was her home. Cody had been here when it happened. She couldn't remember, but she knew. Now he was gone. Whoever had come here and done this to her grandfather had also done something to her brother. She felt it. She knew it. Not dead, though. He couldn't be dead. She should call 911. Jackson Cross would come, the undersheriff with a mournful face who looked at her like he was seeing a ghost. She knew what would happen. The thing the county had threatened a dozen times. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services would come, too. The social workers. The prying questions and pitying eyes. They would abduct her from her life. Separate her from her brother. Take her to strangers or a group home, which might as well be a cage. She would fade. Disappear. Lose herself. This was where she belonged, wandering the woods, fishing the rivers, prowling the cliffs of Lake Superior with the wind in her hair, the sun on her face, dirt between her toes. One thought embedded in her brain like a splinter. She needed to find her brother. At 14, 
Cody was brooding and brilliant, a sarcastic and isolated loner. He loved to draw in his notebooks and go night fishing. His hair was a scruffy, dirty blonde, where hers was black as oil. His eyes blue, where hers glittered like bits of coal. He teased her relentlessly. She loved him wholeheartedly. They had no one but each other. Cody needed her now more than ever. The sun sank low on the horizon, descending behind the trees. The chill in the air raised goosebumps on her bare arms. How much time did she have before someone came to the house? Hours? A day? Her grandfather was gone. There was nothing she could do for him now. She couldn't stay here. There was one place she could go, somewhere only Cody knew about, somewhere the authorities would never find her. From there, she could hole up and begin the search for her brother. Shiloh moved woodenly down the rows of gutted vehicles and exited the gate, not bothering to lock the padlock, then headed up to the house. Her legs felt like lead, but she burned with a resolve that sparked brighter and brighter with every step. Inside the shadowed house, she moved to the kitchen and washed her hands in the metal sink until they were red and raw. She scrubbed beneath her nails. She could feel the blood seeping into the cracks in her skin, staining her soul. She yanked her long black hair into a ponytail, then dressed in hiking pants and boots, her favorite Star Wars Do or Do Not t-shirt, layered over a long sleeve shirt and a forest green windbreaker. In her backpack, she packed clothes, a water bottle, purification tablets, a compass, and a topographical map of the area, along with a poncho, tarp, sleeping bag, headlamp, and fire starter from their camping supplies. She went into Cody's room and stole his favorite black hoodie. It smelled like him, of paint and charcoal and canvas. Then she packed nuts, SpaghettiOs, Pop-Tarts, and Snickers candy bars. The only thing in her nightstand drawer was a Dangerfield Praxis lockpick set Cody had gotten her. It included a short and medium hook, half diamond, and various rake picks. Cody alone knew she was a thief. A bit of a kleptomaniac, a collector of secrets. She shoved it in her pocket and went for the ten-point turbo crossbow that hung on its hook beside her bed. She slung it over her shoulder with the limbs down, tucked under her arm, then grabbed extra bolts and added them to the quiver attached to the stock. Her grandfather had bought her the crossbow for her 11th birthday. A fresh pang of sorrow struck her. Grief and fear ebbed and swelled, threatening to overwhelm her. She rubbed the back of her arm across her face and moved on to the next task, the next thing. If Cody was out there, she would find him. Before she left the house, she stuffed her grandfather's cell phone in her pocket. She had no friends or family to call. No father who knew of her existence. No doting grandmothers or card-playing, cigar-smoking uncles. She had a nebulous idea of an aunt out there somewhere. Her mother's sister. A stranger she didn't remember. Shiloh was entirely on her own. As she passed the kitchen, headed for the back door, she grabbed the emergency wind-up radio on the scarred kitchen table. Darkness pressed against the windows, heavy with foreboding. Shiloh wasn't afraid of the dark. Something snagged her eye. Her grandfather read the Marquette Mining Journal. She paused, one hand on the crossbow strap, the other gripping the radio, and stared. Two articles dominated the front page. The first headline read, Geomagnetic storms predicted to hit northern hemisphere. Auroras expected. Her teacher had discussed the solar storms in science class. At the time, it had fascinated her. It was the second headline that stopped her in her tracks. Convicted, broken heart killer Eli Pope to be released on technicality.
The newspaper was today's edition, dated May 17th. Her heart thumped harder, a stuttering drum against her ribs. Cold washed over her, icing her veins. She knew who he was, what that man had taken from her. This was not the first time she'd awoken next to a dead body. With trembling hands, Shiloh seized the keys to the Honda 4 Tracks Rubicon ATV hanging on a hook by the back door. As she reached for the door handle, the overhead light flickered out. Everything went dark. Silence descended. Shiloh flicked the kitchen light switch. Nothing. She tried the ceiling fan. Same thing. She blinked to adjust to the shadows and pulled the cell phone out of her pocket. It was on, but had no bars. That wasn't unusual this far north. Shiloh opened the front door and stepped out onto the porch. Outside, it was night. There were no stars, no moon. It was the aurora that transfixed her. Above the tree line to the north, Undulating ribbons of fiery blood red draped the sky, pulsating, brightening, softening, then growing brighter still. Transparent waves of scarlet, crimson, and burgundy woven with threads of tangerine and flame. The world was on fire. Shiloh left her grandfather's house for the last time, crossbow in hand, terror and courage ablaze in her heart. Whoever had taken her brother and murdered her grandfather would pay, and she would start with her mother's killer. Two, Eli Pope, day one. Eli Pope prepared himself to fight to the death. Darius Sykes, was coming to kill him. Eli's gaze sharpened, his shoulders stiff, his gaze unmoving. He stood with an unnatural stillness at the back of the prison library, where he'd worked for the last three years. It was the only place in this hellhole that brought him any sense of quiet, of peace. Alert, he waited, his muscles coiled, hands tightened into fists. He felt the stack of bookcases at his back, the cart of returned hardbacks two feet to his right. Twelve rows of bookcases stood in the center of the room, rectangular tables bolted to the floor on either side. Fluorescent lights buzzed overhead. No other inmates were present, no correctional officers nearby either. The library was the least supervised area of the prison. Sykes knew that. He would have planned for it. Eli sensed them like predators in the water. Three of them were slinking closer. A thug named Angel Flood approached to Eli's left, creeping between the bookcases. Eli recognized the sound of his dragging left leg, his halting footsteps, a soft rasp on the carpet. Fat Tommy lurked along the wall of bookcases to the right, beneath the high rectangular window. He stank of commissary-procured Axe body spray. Eli couldn't see Sykes, but he felt him, sensed his malignant presence. Sykes wouldn't miss his last chance at Eli. The inmates knew. They'd heard the COs talking. Hell, half of them had watched the news conference that morning. The Michigan Court of Appeals had overturned his conviction on the basis of an illegal search and seizure. Everything, the investigation, the trial, the witness testimonies, the boxes of evidence. It was all going to be undone. Eli Pope was about to be released from prison. In the yard, in the chow hall, in the showers and hallways, he felt their hatred, their resentment, the shared indignation threatening to boil over. He only needed to survive today. Prison smelled like a mix of fear and desperation resignation, and rage. Eight years Eli had spent buried alive in Alger Correctional Facility, a high-security prison located in Alger County in the Mideastern Upper Peninsula. How he despised this place, the claustrophobia, 
the cramped hot cells, the incessant stench of piss and sweat. His fellow prisoners little more than animals, their eyes flat and cunning, like the men who were coming for him now. Overhead, the fluorescent lights flickered and went out. Cat calls and shouts echoed down the corridor from the main rec room, whoops and yells. The monkeys rattled their cages. He waited for the generator to come back on. It didn't. Shadows darkened the prison library. A reddish, watery light streamed through the high, narrow windows along the far wall. Sunset had come and gone. Eli blinked to adjust his vision. He scanned the aisles, his spine to the bookcase, and reached for a hardback copy of War and Peace. It was thick, heavy. Someone's red sharpie had scrawled an explicit insult across the worn, leather-bound cover. It would work for what he needed. His heart rate increased. Adrenaline iced his veins. He gripped the book in both hands and waited for them. Wiry muscles roped his arms, bulging as he flexed. Scars marred his knuckles, his chest, his lower back. In prison, you never turned your back, never let your guard down, never truly slept. Always ready for the creak of footsteps, a sharpened shank sliding between your ribs. There were many ways to get hurt in prison, more ways to hurt. Eli made sure he did the hurting. His years in the military gave him a brutal edge that most inmates had learned to respect. He knew two things, never back down, never show fear. No need to hide, Sykes, Eli said. In the center aisle, an inmate stepped into view. Darius Sykes was thick as a tank, with large muscular hands. Prison-made tattoos snaked up his ham-sized biceps. His acorn brown hair was shorn close to his skull. His full lips and sensuous mouth gave him an almost feminine appearance. Anyone who registered that softness as weakness soon learned to regret it, if they lived that long. The dead fish look in his eyes revealed his true nature. I've been waiting for this heart to heart, Pope, Sykes said with a soft smile. Sykes was a dangerous, skilled killer. He was serving three consecutive life sentences and ruled every square inch of this godforsaken place. As a Hells Angels biker, he'd murdered six members of a rival gang and arranged their corpses in a macabre display along M28 from Wakefield to Sault Ste. Marie. He'd also slaughtered his rival's families, including three children. Sykes had tried to recruit Eli to join his gang of thugs. When he'd refused to kowtow, Sykes had ordered his assassination. The would-be assassin ended up a corpse in the shower, the spray of hot washing away the blood, the incriminating evidence. No cameras were allowed in the showers. Inmates exercised their rights to privacy. Since then, Eli had lived with a target painted on the back of his prison jumpsuit. Sykes wanted Eli on his knees wanted him to suffer, to confess, to beg for mercy before the end. Eli would die standing before he'd live a moment on his knees. I feel like you've been avoiding me, Sykes said. Eli said nothing. His gaze flicked past Sykes to Angel and Fat Tommy. They stepped out from behind two stacks and flanked Sykes. Twenty feet from Eli, approximately 45 degrees to his left and right. Angel was a skinny Hispanic gangbanger with teardrop tattoos on his face and a gold tooth. Fat Tommy was bald as a cue ball and weighed 300 pounds. Immense rolls of fat strained the fabric of his prison jumpsuit. Sykes' lips thinned. You think you've got a miracle up your sleeve, but you ain't walking out of here, Redskin. Not crawling, neither. Eli didn't blink. Racial slurs against his Ojibwe heritage were nothing new in this place. Nothing new outside of these walls, either. He knew what they saw. A black-haired, sharp-faced Native American 
with death in his dark eyes. His strong, powerful body built for killing. He was incredibly fit, doing hundreds of push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups in his cell each night, and weightlifting in the prison gym. Trained in Krav Maga, he was a force to be reckoned with. Eli checked Angel and Fat Tommy again. Their hands were visible. Angel held a plastic shank in his right hand, low at his side. Fat Tommy's hands were empty, but he could shatter bones with those hammer-like fists. Something happened to the power, Fat Tommy said in a thick, throated southern drawl. No cameras. Nobody's gonna see nothing. Eli didn't take his eyes off his adversaries. He didn't care why the power was out. He sensed the empty space, the lack of other bodies, of prying eyes. No one else was here or anywhere in the vicinity. The library was empty for a reason. The CO who normally supervised the library was likely sick in a bathroom from food poisoning or otherwise occupied. Maybe the COs had been paid off. Or maybe they'd chosen to look the other way. It wouldn't make the reports. Some official excuse would be made. No one would look too closely. Not the warden, not the DA, nor the governor. The inmates and COs were united in their loathing for the broken heart killer. Everyone wanted Eli Pope dead. Three. Eli Pope. Day one. Eli slowed his breathing. His pulse steadied. He readied himself. These thugs thought they could steal what had already been stolen long ago. But he had nothing left. Nothing but the lethal ability to kill and to maim. The skill to cause grievous bodily harm. After years of repressing his fury, he would release it. He would give these animals exactly what they wanted. Fat Tommy cracked his knuckles. You thought you were getting out of this joint, didn't you? The irony of it just kills me. It's called poetic justice, Sykes smiled, his full lips worming back from his crooked teeth. He had the face of an eel. No one is coming. I saw to that. Eli knew the consequences for killing one of them would be dire. It was three stone-cold killers against one. He did not have the luxury of holding back. Not if he wished to survive. He had to go in full throttle. He had to drop them as quickly as possible so he didn't get taken to the ground. Death by stabbing wasn't how he planned to go. Eli clenched his jaw. He tightened his grip on the book. They were coming for him, no matter what he said or did. The eerie reddish shadows deepened. Sykes' eyes glimmered. He gave the smallest shake of his head. Fat Tommy and Angel rushed Eli. They lunged from two different directions, coming at him from opposite sides. Angel, with that vicious shank held low and glinting. Fat Tommy up and swinging. Fat Tommy's bulk made him slow but the power behind a single punch could knock a man out cold. Angel reached him first. Eli's training kicked in. He stepped into Angel's attack, fast and efficient, as lethal as a cobra. Angel darted in and stabbed with the shank. Eli pivoted toward Angel, sidestepped fast, and raised war and peace. He slammed it hard across the man's face. The thick book smashed his nose. Blood spurted from his nostrils. Angel's head snapped back, his nose broken. His forward momentum was cut short. The shank scraped harmlessly across Eli's right side. One eye on the two other attackers, Eli adjusted his grip and slammed the book sideways into the inmate's throat. Angel threw up an arm, absorbing some of the blow. The impact still dropped him to the ground. He sagged to the floor. He landed on his stomach, mouth opened like a fish, as he gasped for oxygen. The hand holding the shank wavered. Eli raised his leg and brought his foot down hard, hoping to crush the first vertebra. He missed, 
but the man's scapula gave a sickening crack. His arm was dislocated and fractured. He wouldn't be stabbing anyone anytime soon. As Tommy lunged from the right, Eli whipped sideways, fainting left. He absorbed the blow meant for his skull with his shoulder. Pain exploded in his muscles, tendons, ligaments. Ignoring the pain, Eli headbutted Fat Tommy. With a crunch, the man's cheekbone fractured. Eli seized the inmate's massive shoulders with both hands and slammed his forehead into his face. He followed with a swift elbow to the side of the head. Screaming, Fat Tommy crumpled. He clutched his broken nose and shattered cheekbones. Blood poured between his fingers. Eli had no time to worry about consequences. Sykes had reached him with the knife. It was not a prison shank fashioned from melted plastic, but a butcher's blade from the prison kitchen, 12 inches long and brutally sharp. With a roar, he attacked Eli, slicing in quick, powerful jabs. Eli's adrenaline surged. He held the book in front of his vulnerable torso, protecting the internal organs in his stomach. Sykes' first knife thrust struck the cover, punching through leather and reams of paper. Sykes yanked the knife out. War and peace went flying. The book tumbled across Angel's unconscious form, thudding to the carpet. Sykes came at Eli again, growling, slashing, and stabbing. Eli backed up swiftly, out of range of the blade. Attempting to block or seize the knife was pointless. Trying to stop a knife was like trying to stop water from flowing. It was impossible not to get wet. Instead, he seized an encyclopedia from the shelf and hurled it at Sykes. It struck his right shoulder. Sykes winced, but kept coming at him. He dodged between bookcases and tables bolted to the floor. Eli turned and sprinted down the stacks to the government section. This was Eli's library. Like any proper tier one operator, he'd prepared for contingencies. In the center of a giant economics tome, Eli found the object he needed. Inside the cutout within the thick pages lay a shank Eli had fashioned from a section of metal bunk bed shaved to a vicious point. As Sykes charged him from behind, Eli ripped out the shank. He spun and stepped left, slashing hard. The shank sliced across Sykes' hands. With a shriek, Sykes dropped the butcher knife. Blood dripped to the carpet. Sykes' fleshy lips opened in a startled O. Oh. Eli thrust the shank into the man's exposed stomach. The homemade blade ripped through the jumpsuit, then glanced off something hard. Underneath Sykes' uniform, he wore several layers of cardboard and newspaper as makeshift armor, a common prison tactic. Sykes had prepared, too. Sykes scrambled for the butcher knife. Eli didn't give him the chance. With his left hand, he seized the man's thick neck and shoved him back against the bookcase. With his other hand, he drew the shank back to drive it into Sykes' throat. Pope! A correctional officer burst into the library. Stop! Eli didn't move a muscle. Didn't remove the shank from Sykes. He was so close, he could count the broken blood vessels in the convict's bloated cheeks. The point pricked Sykes' Adam's apple. Pope, the CO said, breathless. Eli recognized his voice. He glimpsed the vague shape of the man out of the corner of his eye a young CO named Ivan Davis. Don't do this. Too late, Eli growled. If you kill him, you're going away forever. They will put you in isolation, throw away the key, and you will never see the light of day again. Anger burned through him. His hands shook. Eli pressed the point of the shank harder into the man's throat. Sykes' eyes popped. Red veins streaked the yellowish sclera. His mouth opened, his purple tongue protruding. Pope. Davis reached for his baton with one hand, his radio with the other. A canister of pepper spray was looped to his belt. He raised the radio to his mouth. Don't make me call it in. With tremendous willpower, Eli stepped back and lowered the shank. 
Sykes sagged. He clutched at his throat, gasping for oxygen. Warily, Eli watched him, making sure the threat remained neutralized. His heart hammered against his ribs. Indignation burned through his veins. His fingers would not uncurl from the shank's handle. He imagined all the ways he could kill this man. All the ways he should have. Sykes destroyed whatever he touched. He killed women and children. Eli loathed him. At least he was in here, locked up among other monsters. At least he would never again get out to hunt the innocent in the Upper Peninsula. Sykes massaged his injured throat. Malice flashed in his eyes. When he spoke, his voice was hoarse. I will come for you. When I get out, and I will, I will come to your town, your house, your bedroom. I will find everyone you love, and I will hunt them down and slit their throats in front of you, one by one. Eli stared at him, dead-eyed. It'll be a short hunt. I love no one. Let's go. With a frown, the CO glanced down at Angel, unconscious on the floor. Fat Tommy had pissed himself. The sharp scent of urine stung Eli's nostrils. Davis radioed for medical aid for the injured convicts and gestured for Eli to follow him out. I need escorts for three injured inmates to medical. Looks like we might need an ambulance. I'll kill you, Sykes screamed at Eli. That's a promise. The CO turned to Sykes. Shut the hell up. He glanced at Eli and tilted his chin toward the door. Pope, I said let's go. Eli hated to take his eyes off his adversaries, even ones incapacitated. But he obediently followed the CO, his senses alert for any movement behind him. None came. Still, he could feel Sykes' malevolent presence at his back. Even imprisoned, as long as he was alive. Sykes would be a threat. Four, Eli Pope, day one. Eli's footfalls echoed along the concrete corridor. The hoots and cat calls faded into background noise, barely discernible as they traveled from the depths of the interior to the perimeter. Four COs rushed past them toward the library, batons drawn. They didn't glance at Eli. Damn reports, Davis muttered. I'll be writing reports all damn day. Are you taking me to a holding cell? They might put him in solitary. He imagined the confined space, the dank air filling up his lungs, a choking sense of hopelessness. He despised solitary, almost as much as Jen Pop. Davis shook his head. The warden wants you released immediately. Eli rubbed his sore knuckles and flexed his fingers. Pain radiated from his shoulder. He'd nearly killed three men. This didn't make sense. What? I know it was Sykes. I know what they had planned. Davis eyed him, frowning. The warden doesn't want a madhouse of press, or fights, or prying eyes. He just wants you gone. The governor agreed, and here we are. Eli stared at him. Nickerson has the library on Mondays. He was nowhere in sight. The COs were in on it. In the library, Sykes and his friends would be strip searched, then escorted to holding cells before being evaluated by a medical team. The officers would find the contraband weapons. Investigative services would be brought in. Their cells would be searched, inmates interviewed, cameras reviewed, evidence collected. The COs would be looked at, too. It wouldn't look good for the warden or the COs involved. Even with the cameras glitchy, there would be evidence. No wonder the warden wanted him gone. No one is going to admit that, Davis said. Eli didn't care who admitted to what. He just wanted out. Not... Everyone was involved. I was raised Baptist. Davis said it slow, like he was chewing the words, rolling them in his mouth. My father always 
preached that no man is beyond God's grace, no matter what he's done. Some men are, Eli said. Unlike the other COs, who were either disinterested or cruel, Davis was kind and patient. He treated the worst of humanity with dignity. Eli hated him for it. The worst of humanity didn't deserve an ounce of pity or compassion. These thugs deserved the hell they'd found themselves in. They deserved worse. Given the chance, Eli would take great pleasure in exacting justice himself. Some crimes were unforgivable. Some criminals were monsters, not men. Davis shrugged. The press would usually be camped outside the gates. Lucky for you, the news cycles are covering the sun thing. Davis paused, like he expected Eli to ask what he meant or comment about the weather. Eli didn't either. Davis continued, nonplussed. The news reporters said there might be temporary communication and power interruptions. <laughs> Not like we aren't used to that up here. Is that what took out the power? Davis shrugged. Must be. And the generator? Davis shrugged. Dunno. I heard there was an issue, but the technicians fixed it. We're operating on emergency backup, which means no TV in the rec room. Eli managed a grunt. His legs trembled from the adrenaline dump. All he wanted to do was lie down and sleep. He hadn't slept well in eight years. Davis glanced at him. You need medical to check you out? They came at you pretty good. He sucked blood from between his teeth. Just get me out. I'd feel the same way. They strode down various hallways. At each door, Davis hit the buzzer and stated his radio call sign. The CO in the main control room verified his identity via the CCTV camera near the door and buzzed them through. In the rec room, the inmates were rowdy, booing and hissing. A few slumped, staring at the dead screen in confusion, like they expected it to spontaneously combust. You want to stop at your cell? What for? Your personal property, journals, pictures, whatever. I have no personal property, Eli said. Anything that needs to be returned to the property room? Davis asked. TVs, radios, anything like that? Eli shook his head. No pictures? His cell was as barren as his soul. No. Davis nodded to himself. Sure, sure, okay. He turned right and led Eli down another hallway to an office. A mountain of paperwork waited for him, which he signed as a woman with colorless hair in her fifties droned, sign here, twenty times. He signed for an envelope with a debit card inside, giving him access to what remained of his commissary account. At receiving, he went through another endless series of locked doors and gates, the walls shades of dull gray or vomit green. They returned his clothes, his wallet with his expired driver's license, and his dog tags. He put his dog tags on. How he had missed the familiar feel of the chain around his neck, the tags against his chest beneath his shirt. Five minutes later, he was outside the fence. It was like stepping out of a cave into a different universe. The road was deserted. The chilly air smelled of pine trees, gasoline, and dirt. It was only 40 degrees, but he didn't care. The breeze on his skin felt sweet as a kiss. No gray walls, no COs with weapons, no predators with eyes like devils and teeth like wolves. Would you look at that, Davis said. Eli raised his gaze to the sky. The transparent reddish flames of the northern lights flickered overhead, dancing and undulating, almost like a living thing. You have someone to pick you up? Davis asked. Nope. No one? No one. You have a cell phone? Eli shook his head. Davis hesitated. There's a payphone at the Bear Trap Bar a mile down the road. You'll know it when you see it. You can call a cab. They know the number. 
Eli said nothing. A bar at the end of the world. A desolate place for ex-convicts with nowhere to go and no one to love them. He couldn't think of anything more depressing. Davis shook his head, sighed, and turned back for the prison gates. Good luck, man. You can do whatever you want. You're free. Eli didn't respond. Eight years he'd spent in a dungeon, convicted of a crime he had not committed. He was supposed to wither and die in there, or bleed out on the shower floor. Now, he was out. He'd never expected this. Eli started walking, one foot in front of the other, gravel beneath his boots. His boots. Not the state's property, his own. He wore the khaki hiking pants and black t-shirt he'd worn the day they had come for him. The day Jackson Cross had come for him. Eli would never forget the look in his friend's eyes as he'd slapped the cuffs on Eli's wrists. The pain in his voice as he'd read him his rights. The judgment and condemnation. What was left for him in Christmas, Michigan? In Alger County? What was left for him anywhere? His father's house? A bit of cash in his pocket? His dog tags? Eli looked up at the heavens. The ephemeral northern lights spread across the dome of the sky like the mushroom cloud of a nuclear blast. He blinked and kept walking. Something sparked to life in his chest, hard and bright. An inexplicable desire to weep. There was only one thing he wanted. Davis's words rattled in his brain. Freedom. Such a charged word. He'd fought for freedom, joined the military for freedom, risked his life and sacrificed brothers in arms for it. He'd had it stolen from him, too. He touched his dog tags beneath his t-shirt. To Eli Pope, freedom meant one thing. He had one goal in his ruined life. Vengeance. He would find the person or people who had framed him for murder, who had destroyed his life, and kill them. Not quickly, but slowly, with great care and attention to detail. He felt no shame at the thought, no remorse, only a burning hatred. They had taken an innocent man and turned him into a monster. A monster was what they'd wanted, so a monster he would become. Hell, he already was. Five, Jackson Cross, day one. Jackson Cross watched the sky turn to fire. Here in the northern reaches of the Upper Peninsula, the northern lights were not a rare occurrence. They appeared in the dead of a winter, at night, but usually in shades of green or violet. The news had reported the eerie red aurora sightings across the United States, Canada, even into northern Mexico and as far as India, Japan, and China. Unlike many, it gave him a disquieting feeling of dread. Deputy Sheriff? Michelle Carpenter asked. Jackson stood outside the IGA country store in Christmas, Michigan, which Michelle Carpenter owned and managed. I know what you're thinking, Jackson, Mrs. Carpenter said. It's different this time. I know it is. I can feel it. This wasn't the first time Jackson had been called here. Ruby Carpenter, a beautiful redhead with attitude to spare, was a troubled 16-year-old. She'd been arrested for shoplifting and underage drinking. Last year, she'd run away three times. A lost cause, the sheriff claimed. Jackson Cross, however, was the patron saint of lost causes. Or so Lily Easton had told him once. In the seven years he'd served as undersheriff for Alger County, Jackson had worked plenty of similar cases. Most had not ended well. 
He scratched his stubbled jaw and glanced down at his notebook. Let me check into this and get back to you, Michelle. Mrs. Carpenter's eyes welled with tears. I know I haven't been the best mother, Jackson. I know my failings. She gestured vaguely with one trembling hand. This place, it can be hard on the young ones. Jackson knew it. He'd grown up here. This place was in his bones, had dug in beneath his breastbone like a lover or a parasite. Everyone complained, but few people left once they got a taste of it. The isolation and peace, the stunning but forlorn beauty, the closeness, the connection, the comfort of people you'd known your whole life. It was different for this generation, though. Fewer jobs, even less opportunities. The small towns and wild spaces could become claustrophobic, could strangle you. Girls like Ruby needed out. They needed something this place couldn't give them. Mrs. Carpenter met his gaze. Bring my baby home. Jackson ran a hand through his must, sand-colored hair. At six foot three, he was tall and broad-shouldered. Handsome enough, but he was married to the job. We'll find her, Michelle. I promise. Devin Harris, the new deputy, exited the patrol truck and strode across the parking lot, her expression tense as she shoved her long black braids over her shoulder. She was short, but fit and muscular. Her warm brown skin crinkled around her eyes when she smiled. She wasn't smiling now. A call just came in, boss. We've got a dead body. Jackson stiffened. He remembered the last time a body had been found in Christmas, Michigan. The broken heart killer case. The brutal crime that had nearly destroyed their small town. That had ripped apart friendships, families, and left them all scarred. Who? Mrs. Carpenter asked, stricken. Who is it? Caucasian male in his sixties. They haven't yet officially identified the victim. Beside him, Mrs. Carpenter let out her breath. Not her daughter, not her problem, but definitely Jackson's. What else? He asked. The 911 dispatcher said the witness reported signs of foul play. He reached for his radio. Where? Off County Road 581. Jackson froze. Give me the address again. He prayed it would be different this time, that he'd heard wrong. Devin rattled it off. He hadn't. That's Amos Easton's place, Mrs. Carpenter said. It was still cold in May, around 50 degrees, since summer didn't reach the Upper Peninsula until July. A chill passed through him that had nothing to do with the weather. Anyone else? He asked Devin, his chest tight. Any children involved? She shook her head. That's all I have. Trepidation flared through him. He needed to get to the scene. He needed to make sure. Let's go. Please don't forget about my daughter, Michelle Carpenter said. I won't, he promised but he was already striding toward the white and brown patrol truck emblazoned with Alger County Sheriff in orange on both sides. He gestured to Devin. Get in. Devin hurried after him. I get to drive. Absolutely not. She huffed, but didn't argue. Jackson knew the county and forest roads, the campsites, the ATV, hiking, and snowmobile trails like the back of his hand. He knew every resident of Christmas, population 400, and many in Munising, the closest town and home to the famed Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. They left Mrs. Carpenter standing forlornly in front of her store, the siding peeling, the weed-choked asphalt peppered with cracks. Jackson drove west on M28. Huge jack pines rose on either side of the road. They passed local stores and restaurants with holiday-inspired names. Yule Log Resort, Silent Night Campsite, Santa's Storage Facilities. For a few minutes, 
Devin stared down at the phone in her lap, frowning. She was from Detroit. It showed. Stupid Sprint. They promised cell service here. First thing you should know about the UP is cell service is a gamble anywhere, no matter who you have. Be prepared for that. Just great. Devin rolled her eyes and switched on the radio. The channels were all static. This is eerie, this solar storm thing. I've never seen anything like it. They turned right on County Highway 589, headed northwest. Lake Superior stretched to their right. The water shimmered tangerine. The rippling waves glittered as they reflected the aurora's colors. He could feel the lake, that sense of vastness. The native Ojibwe people called the lake Gichigaming, the great water. TikTok is down, Devin said. Maybe so many people are posting photos of the northern lights that it crashed. He had no idea what the hell TikTok even was. Devin was young, only 27. At 36, he felt ancient, weary to his bones. Hell of a day to find a body. Yeah. She chewed her thumbnail. You know who it is, don't you? The victim. He gave a curt nod as he turned left onto County Highway 587. His fingers gripped the steering wheel as a lifetime of memories assaulted him. Every detail was seared into his mind. The silent house, the bed, the faint spatters of blood, the cold, dead body of the girl. So vibrant in life, so shockingly still in death. Lily Easton, here and then gone, in a blink, in a frenzy of violence. The girl he'd loved from afar his entire life. His best friend had killed her. And Jackson, a naive, fresh-faced deputy, had helped convict him. Now this, a killer released on a technicality, a dead body found on the same property, separated by eight years and a lifetime of grief. Above them, the solar storms lit up the sky in crimson waves. The aurora had a weight to it, a physical presence. He could feel it pressing down upon his soul. As they drove up the narrow, winding driveway, a disconcerting sensation gripped him like some terrible thing was bearing down on them all. Six, Jackson Cross, day one. It was nearly 10 p.m. by the time they reached the eastern place. A weed-choked gravel road led them through three miles of towering red and white pines, sugar maples, and balsam fir trees. Dense underbrush scraped the sides of the patrol truck. The aurora was so bright that Jackson exited the vehicle with his flashlight in hand, but switched it off. Everything was bathed in an eerie, reddish glow, like shadows cast by an immense fire. Three county sheriff's vehicles were parked in the gravel lot. Two Munising Police Department squad cars had parked behind them. The Munising Police and Alger County Sheriff Departments often worked together, especially on big cases. If it was an important case, the state police would be brought in. Ahead of them, the white farmhouse was perched on the knoll of a hill. The salvage yard was located down the hill to the right, ringed by fencing lined with concertina wire. Devon had gone silent. The sense of menace was palpable as if Lily Easton's blood still soaked the fabric of this place. Stealing himself, Jackson took the lead and Devon followed, cursing as she nearly tripped on the uneven ground. Glass, bits of plastic, and debris crunched beneath their shoes. It was impossible not to step on anything. Jackson strained his ears. Subdued voices drifted from the salvage yard. Insects trilled in the woods. A neighbor's dog barked. 
Three deputies stood around a cordoned off section in the center of the salvage yard, a large area bound by fluttering crime scene tape. Gas powered searchlights cast bright white light across the crime scene. Crime scene technicians had been called in, but communication was sporadic tonight. Even the radios were staticky. One of the deputies was hunting down the sheriff in person. The medical examiner from Munising had just arrived. A police officer had driven out to Aw Train to her home to pick her up. Several cops and deputies processed the scene, taking photographs, dusting for prints, and cataloging evidence. The ME ducked beneath the perimeter of red tape that secured the immediate area around the victim, or hot zone, and examined the body. Venla Vertanen was a stout Finnish woman in her fifties with short white blonde hair. She wore PPE over slacks and a sweater. Medical examiner was stenciled onto the back of her windbreaker. Outside the main perimeter of yellow crime scene tape, Deputy Randy Hastings smoked a cigarette. Jackson approached him. Pressure was building behind his eyes. Concern gnawed at him. Has the house been cleared? Easton's grandkids live with him. The rookie deputy, Phil Nash, nodded. We did. All buildings on the property are empty. He held his breath. No sign of the kids? Are you sure? Nobody's home, Nash said. Jackson pulled a pair of latex gloves from his jacket pocket. Who called it in? A customer, Hastings said. Jim Hart is interviewing him at the station. Okay, good. Relief flared through him, but it was fleeting. Shiloh and Cody should be here. They're too young to drive. Besides, Easton's truck is still in the driveway. Maybe they're with friends, Devin said. Maybe, Jackson said, but he didn't believe it. Apprehension coiled in his gut. The possibility that one or both of them might be dead and hidden somewhere on the property made him physically ill. At Lily's funeral, he'd made a promise to her casket. He would watch out for her children, but especially Shiloh. Six-year-old Cody had been at a sleepover the night of the homicide. Five-year-old Shiloh had been there, in that house. No one knew exactly what had occurred that night, only that the killer, Eli Pope, had done terrible things. Though he'd left the little girl alive and physically untouched. They'd found her with smears of Lily's blood on her shirt, her cheeks, her hands. She'd been rocking in a corner, incoherent with terror. She'd mumbled a few things, but nothing they'd been able to use. Jackson suspected that she'd witnessed the horror. He cared for both kids. But it was Shiloh who'd stolen his heart. Shiloh, who reminded him so much of her mother. Black hair and blacker eyes, small and sharp, 100 pounds of spit and fire. She was Lily Easton's daughter, through and through. He checked on them once or twice a month, bringing Shiloh Snickers and Twizzlers, gummy bears and gum for Cody. And books. That girl loved books, especially travel books. As if that would make up for his inability to protect her mother from the one danger he should have seen coming. With a deep breath, he forced himself to focus on the current crime scene. It was the best way to help them now. What do we have on the victim? Hasting gestured vaguely with his cigarette. He wore a khaki trench coat. In his mid-sixties, he sported a middle-aged gut and a receding hairline. The Vic is Amos Easton, 69 years old, Caucasian. Jackson shone the flashlight across the scene. The corpse lay face up in a wide circle of dirt, next to a gray Kia Rio with the guts torn out of its engine. He recognized the red handkerchief, the John Deere cap, the silver hair. The caved-in skull and collapsed facial structure were harder to recognize. Looks like he got his head bashed in by that crowbar over there. Hasting hooked his thumb at a long, thin shape lying in the dirt. Bits of bone 
and brain matter clung to the iron. Blood looks dry. Across the victim's chest, the blood spatters appeared to be smeared as if he'd been touched. There were indentations in the dirt, a couple of red streaks, like maybe someone had knelt beside the body. The perpetrator? Or one of the kids? Afterward? Who'd have a reason to do this? Nash couldn't grow a full beard yet. His uniform hung off his narrow shoulders like a coat hanger. But his posture was straight, his blue eyes sharp. Sure wasn't robbery, Hastings said. The watch and wallet are still on the body. The business could have been the target, Jackson said, though he didn't believe it. Devon made a face as she scanned the salvage yard, taking in the rows of dilapidated vehicles, the piles of scrap metal, stacks of mufflers and tires and coils of wire and hoses. Who could tell if something is missing? We'll have to compare everything here to the inventory. And that's assuming he kept good records. Sounds like a job for the rookie, Hastings said dryly. Nash frowned, but didn't argue. Who'd steal from Easton? What's even worth stealing here? One of the munising police officers approached them. He tipped his gas station coffee cup in greeting without smiling. Exactly my thoughts. Ramon Moreno sported long black hair tied back in a ponytail, bronze skin and a full beard. He had a sharp, sarcastic sense of humor. That's what you're gonna find out while I go back to my soft, comfortable bed. You wish, Devin said. We all wish, Hastings said with a sigh. Devin turned in a slow circle, appraising the property. How much land did he own? 200 acres, Jackson said. A good portion of it is waterfront, to the northwest. Devin whistled. Wonder why he never sold it. This junkyard can't bring in that much. Hell, he probably pays more in taxes for the land than the business is worth. Moreno slurped his coffee. It's a losing proposition, all right. Lots of folks here are in the same position, Jackson said. Poverty was endemic in much of the Upper Peninsula, which had lost the copper and ore mining and timber industries that had once thrived here, leaving behind hundreds of abandoned mines and thousands of tree stumps. Jackson zipped his jacket against the dropping temperature. Easton would never sell this place. It's been in his family for 150 years, handed down from the old timber barons of the 20th century. It's the one thing he has. Or had. Devon shivered. I'd rather be in Tahiti, sunning myself and sipping martinis handmade by my personal bartender. Amen, sister, Moreno said. Jackson watched the M.E. place small paper bags over the victim's hands to preserve trace evidence beneath the fingernails. They'd swab his hands for DNA. She annotated something in a folder and then stood, preparing to move the corpse into a black body bag which she would transport to the morgue. Moreno mopped his brow with a handkerchief. It was 45 degrees, but they all felt it. The pressure building, the heat of an unseen wildfire about to overtake them. What can you tell us, doctor? Jackson asked. From my preliminary examination, death appears to have been caused by blunt force trauma. The position of a depressed fracture on the posterior right side of the cranium is consistent with violent assault. From that tire iron right there? Hastings asked. Could be. I still have to conduct the autopsy and tox report. Estimated time of death? Marino asked. Dr. Vertanen pointed to various body parts as she spoke. Algor mortis can be quite unreliable, of course. Liver mortis can take up to 12 hours. The process is still incomplete. Here and here, rigor mortis has appeared in the small muscles of the face, followed by the muscles in the upper and lower limbs. However, the abdominal muscles are still soft. Approximate time of death is between four and six this afternoon. 
judging by lividity. The body does not appear to have been moved. Jackson nodded to himself, working his jaw as he considered the angles, the odds. He turned to Devin. What do you see? Her eyes narrowed. She scanned the scene again, taking her time. Definite signs of a struggle? She walked the perimeter of the crime scene tape, careful not to disturb the ground, weaving between half-disassembled vehicles. We'll have to cast every footprint, lots of fingerprints and footprints from customers. She paused, looking down, and frowned. There's something dark over here. Looks like blood. Jackson tagged it, and they kept moving. She circled the crime scene like a wary creature sniffing for danger. Once, twice, three times, expanding with each circle. Her flashlight swept back and forth. The glow from the aurora tinged everything crimson. Her shadow moved ahead of him, wavering with the sweeping flashlight beam. Jackson followed, looking for evidence, saying nothing, his heart in his throat. He feared what they might find. Past the perimeter of the fence line, the trees reached for the sky, trunks lined up like sentinels. The shadows deepened. The vehicles seemed to crouch, as if they were living machines made of flesh and blood rather than steel, plastic, and glass. Devin halted and pointed. Another set of prints. He came up beside her. Several footprints headed north. The treads were shallow possibly a pair of sneakers. He squinted. Maybe a size nine, a small man, or a teenage boy? Devin nodded. Could be Cody's prints. You probably wouldn't have customers coming out to the back of the fence on a regular basis. The footprints could have been left at any time. Jackson squatted and shone the light on the ridges in the dirt. Dark red specks drew his attention. If that's the Vic's blood inside the print, then the suspect got blood on his shoe as he left. The prints are spread wide, like he or she was running. Fleeing the crime scene, Devin said. Witness or perpetrator? Either way, a person of interest. We'll get the crime scene text on this right away. She pointed the flashlight. They head northwest, right to the fence line. What's that? The flashlight highlighted a broken section of fence, hidden behind a stack of rusted bumpers. They approached, skirting the footprints, careful not to damage potential evidence. Jackson squatted, pointing at the tear in the fence that started at the ground and sliced upward approximately three feet. This was cut with wire cutters. And not recently. You can see rust here on the ends. The ground is scraped clear. The section of fence was pulled back frequently. Someone's used this as a way to get in and out. Cody? We're going to find out. Jackson stood heavily, his knees creaking, and headed back toward the crime scene, Devin on his heels. He wished he was fly fishing along the Pere Marquette River. Hell, he wished he was anywhere but here, facing down the black hole of his past. Seven, Jackson Cross, day one. Suspects? Devin asked once they were back at the crime scene. Who'd want to kill the old man? Moreno snorted. <laughs> Where do you want to start? Easton had been universally disliked. A hermit, an isolated survivalist type. He loved his spirits and gambling. Over the years, he'd alienated neighbors and friends. Back when he was married, law enforcement had regularly received domestic dispute calls. The wife always dropped the charges. She'd died of cancer when Jackson was 10. Easton had been a difficult man. Most people passed him off as a degenerate drunk, but he was a cunning SOB. Or he had been. The suspect list was a long one. It'd take legwork and resources to winnow it down. Jackson had a suspect in mind. No one would like it.
he hated it himself. Jackson gave a weary sigh. Eli Pope. Devon shot him a confused glance. Hastings and Nash looked troubled. Moreno scowled through his beard. The veteran cops and deputies knew. No one needed to say it aloud. Eli Pope would have a good reason for wanting Easton dead. Eight years ago, Easton had fingered Eli Pope as the suspect in his daughter's homicide, then smeared Eli's name in an infamous television interview with CBS Evening News. In part due to Easton's public accusations, the investigation had quickly narrowed the suspect pool to one. Eli wouldn't forget something like that. He was a man who nursed his grievances. He did not forgive. And now he was free. Maybe, Hastings allowed. The broken heart killer is still in prison, Moreno said. Maybe he'll get shivved on the toilet. A man can dream. They released him, Jackson said. The warden had alerted the sheriff in case Eli headed home. Jackson knew he would. Where else would he go? Moreno let out a colorful curse. What time? We need to find out. We'll add him to the list, Hastings said. No one wanted to think about Eli Pope back in the world, prowling the streets of their community, hunting for beautiful young women to steal away, or seeking vengeance against the town who'd turned on him. Something dark and ugly slithered behind Jackson's breastbone. His breath quickened as a memory flashed through his mind. He shoved it down deep. This grisly homicide couldn't be related to that. The sin he'd committed all those years ago was dead and buried. Except that it wasn't. It had just resurrected itself in the form of Eli Pope. Across the clearing, an owl hooted. Jackson swept the flashlight back and forth. The light glinted off metal, piercing dark corners. There were a hundred places to hide, a thousand. Something snagged his eye, a tiny flash of color. Skirting the crime scene, he approached the object and squatted. Approximately five yards southwest of the victim sat a crushed green Ford Taurus. Its front windshield was busted out, the metal frame twisted and smashed. A square of fabric was caught on a tooth of glass. He placed an evidence tag on the ground beside the Taurus and gestured for one of the deputies to take pictures. He retrieved a small manila envelope and carefully tweezed the fragment of cotton from the jagged windshield frame. What did you find, boss? Devin asked. This is a small enough space for a 13-year-old girl if she were trying to hide. Maybe she heard the shouting, or she knew the perp was trouble as soon as he appeared. Or Amos did, and he told her to hide. She went through the window, crouched down in the footwell. Easy enough for your shirt to snag right here while you were scrambling inside. That's a big jump to make, Hastings said. I don't see it. This is from Shiloh's shirt. How do you know that? Marino asked. Jackson examined the small square of fabric. It was two inches by an inch and a half, dark gray with a yellow ironed on edge of a partial letter. It wasn't much to go on, but it was enough. He'd seen her wear it. He visualized the faded image of Yoda, the yellow print. Do or do not, there is no try. Moreno scoffed. <laughs> Even if it is hers, that fabric could have been there for weeks. I don't think so, Jackson said. It rained this morning. The ground is still damp, which is why we've got good footprints to cast. This shirt is fresh. It smells like downy fabric softener, lavender. How the hell can you smell that, man? Moreno asked, disbelieving. He'd always had a keen sense of smell. Lily had never worn perfume, but she'd used the same fabric softener her entire life. Easton was a habitual man. If Downey had worked for him and for his daughters, it would work for his grandkids. Shiloh smelled like her mother. I'm sure the judge will love that, Moreno scoffed. How did you know it was the killer? 
The scent was zestfully clean, your honor. Devon nibbled on her thumbnail. She might have seen it, the homicide. Jackson suspected the same thing. She's a material witness. So is her brother, at a minimum. We need to find them both, sooner rather than later. No one said anything for a moment. They studied the crime scene, listened to the night insects churring, watched the bugs swarming in the searchlights. The night grew colder. The crime scene techs would scrape the salvage yard and surrounding area with a fine-tooth comb. If there was something else out here, they would find it. Tomorrow we'll gather a team to search the woods, interview friends and family, canvas the neighbors. We need to put out a bolo for Shiloh and Cody. The group nodded, their faces somber. And Eli Pope is our top priority. Good luck, Moreno muttered. We're not doing jack squat with the power down across the UP. It's not just us. Everyone's out across the country. All because of these damn lights. It'll be back up tomorrow, Devin said, too brightly. Everything back to normal. Jackson felt as far from normal as if normal no longer existed. Everything was tilted on its axis, time spinning, cause and effect turned on its side. He was a man of order, of rules, of law. He liked things to make sense. East and dead, after all this time, didn't make sense. Moreno was right. That blood-red sky didn't make sense. It was after 2 a.m. by the time Jackson and Devin exited the salvage yard and made their way up the hill toward the parking lot. The trees threw murky shadows across the oil-black grass. The aurora blotted out the stars. Who do we notify? Devin asked. The next of kin? Jackson stilled. There's only one person. Easton's wife died 25 years ago. No living parents, no aunts or uncles. No one except Lena. A flood of memories struck him. Lena had been the older, responsible sister to Lily's reckless charm. Lena's blue eyes were serious, while Lily's brown ones had danced with mischief. Lena's hair rippled in long chestnut waves, where Lily's hair had been dark and curly. They had both been beautiful. Lena is Easton's other daughter, he paused. She lives in Tampa. They were estranged. She'll come back when she hears her father is dead. Things went badly the last time they saw each other. He didn't mention the trial. She hasn't been back. Not in eight years. What about the kids? They'd be her niece and nephew, right? Jackson thought about the last time they'd spoken. Each year he called Lena on November 25th, the anniversary of her sister's death. They didn't share much anymore, but they would always share that. They were the two people who'd loved Lily Easton the most in the world. Time seemed to thin, the past and present converging. He recalled how protective Lena had been when it came to Lily, how fiercely she'd defended her family and friends who jumped in feet first to help, no matter what was needed. That was the Lena he remembered. Poor kids, Devin said. Without her, they'll go into the system. He pulled out his phone. No service, and it was late. He'd call her tomorrow. She'll come, Jackson said. She's the only family they have left. Lena will come. Eight. Lena Easton. Day two. We have a missing person. Those were the words that drove Lena Easton, that motivated her to get out of bed before dawn every morning, to improve with each passing day. Sweat beaded Lena's forehead and trickled down her shoulder blades. Tampa was in the middle of a heat wave. It was 90 degrees at 9 a.m. She felt every sweltering degree. Her giant Newfoundland dog sat obediently beside her, panting. Good dog, she murmured, and patted his giant furry head. Good boy, bear. The Newfie was over 150 pounds of thick, chocolate-brown fur. 
He was pure loyalty, adoration, and mischievous affection. Bear was an intelligent, sensitive dog. He liked to work and loved a challenge. Lena worked as a paramedic three days a week, but her volunteer work with the Canine Search and Rescue Association was her passion, her purpose. Certified in urban and wilderness rescue, Bear was her partner, both in SAR work and in life. Lena waved at the other SAR handlers and their dogs. Base was a portable tent set up in the vacant lot next to a stucco house with Spanish tiles. Several law enforcement officials stood around, studying maps and giving orders on radios. Once everyone had arrived, the search coordinator briefed the unit. The subject is Stanley Mills, aged 82. He suffers from advanced Alzheimer's with dementia. He lives with his son in the Arbor Green neighborhood, which abuts the Lower Hillsboro Wilderness Preserve. Lena's stomach tightened. The state park contained 500 acres of woods, interspersed with rivers, streams, and mangrove-covered swampy wetlands. A lot of area to get lost in. And with the heat wave, the sun could be deadly in more ways than one. The sun found him missing at approximately 7.30 a.m. He checked with the neighbors and drove nearby neighborhoods before contacting law enforcement. Stanley was last seen wearing blue Crocs, a white T-shirt, and red cotton Snoopy pajama bottoms. His favorite buccaneer's cap is missing, so he likely took it with him. The coordinator clapped her hands. Let's go find Stanley. Lena and Bear were assigned to Quadrant 3, half of which was marshland and swamp. She hoped their subject hadn't wandered into the swamp. She hated snakes and alligators but she'd go anywhere to bring the missing home. The other handlers loaded their packs while a volunteer handed out small paper bags. Each bag contained an item of clothing worn recently by the subject. The dogs scented the items and identified their target. Find Stanley, Lena said to Bear. Go find Stanley. Good boy. And then they were off. Lena and Bear were on the hunt, working their sector. They worked in a Z pattern, scenting the air until they caught the one scent they sought. Every human being had his or her own scent. The skin gave off dead skin cells called rafts. Every person shed about 40,000 per minute. Bear's tail stiffened, his hackles going up as he caught the scent. He barked and raced into the trees, heading toward the park. Good boy! Lena scrambled after him. As they worked their way deeper into the park, Lena studied the trees, the sky, the paths, the way Stanley might have seen them. Stanley could have taken a detour, backtracked on himself, or looped away from the intended destination at any point. Inside the park, the paths were marked by different colored diamonds on the trunks of various trees, but they were easy to miss if someone became disoriented or forgot what they meant. Ahead of her, Bear sniffed the air. His tail went up, his hackles rising, and he bounded ahead and disappeared between some bushes. He'd alerted on something. Lena followed him, struggling through the swampy undergrowth, surrounded by mangroves. They were nearing the water. Bear stopped, turning in tight circles, tail wagging. She saw the disturbed ground first. A patch of leaves scraped into piles along with several damp imprints. She imagined the elderly man catching a foot on a root, tumbling forward, and landing on the heels of his hands and knees. Not three feet away, a few strands of red cotton were snagged on the thorns of a briar bush. Good boy, bear, good boy. Removing a roll of blue tape from her pocket, she marked the area, then checked her compass, figured her bearings, then called it in. Base, this is Lena. I'm a hundred yards from my east boundary just short of the swamp. I found some red threads on a briar, possibly from the Snoopy pajama pants. It looks like he fell here but got back up again. He's headed for the swamp. She and Bear kept going. Five minutes later, her radio crackled. Mace, this is Charlie. We just found one of his crocs caked with mud. Lena, Champ is alerting in your direction. Before she could say a word, Bear barked and bounded ahead. Lena hurried to catch up. 
Her boots sank into muck as she entered the marsh. Algae slicked the surface of stagnant black water. Mosquitoes swarmed in dense clouds. The sweltering heat pressed down on her. Humidity curled her hair at the base of her neck. She paused to drink bottled water from her backpack and inhaled a protein bar to keep her blood sugar levels up. She kept a collapsible water bowl for Bear and called him back to drink as well. Ten minutes later, Bear paused and looked over his shoulder. His fluffy tail drooped. He whined. It was an alert, but not the one either of them wanted. Lena's stomach dropped. She let out the breath she'd been holding. Bear was trained to alert to both the living and the dead. His alert was different for each find. Trained dogs could identify the scent of death, not just on corpses, but also on blood splatter, bone, and even cremated remains. When a person died, the scent was the same, but it had the scent of decay mixed in. The smell was unique to humans and incredibly complex. A person released 478 different chemical compounds as their body decomposed. With a heavy heart, Lena approached the spot where Bear waited, whining pitifully. Stanley Mills lay on his side in six inches of swamp. Black mud clotted his wispy white hair. Muck splattered his soaked pajama pants. In one gnarled fist, he clutched the red buccaneer's cap. Shucking her pack, Lena knelt beside him, heedless of the water drenching her pant legs, or the six-foot alligator sunning himself on the opposite bank. Stanley, can you hear me? The elderly man didn't respond. Even knowing what she would find, she still went through the motions of checking for vital signs. There was no pulse. His skin was paper white, his lips cracked. He had become severely dehydrated and had likely suffered heat stroke. Devastated, Lena rocked back on her heels, swallowed hard, closed her eyes. Sorrow washed over her in waves, mourning for an elderly man she didn't know and had never met. This was someone's father, a grandfather, someone who was loved and would be sorely missed. Every loss felt like she had personally failed. She hated it. Lena called it in on the radio, her words like stones in her throat. Then she logged in the time, date, and details in the notes on her phone. Her signal had been crappy since last night, but she didn't need cell service to take notes. Her backpack felt like it weighed a million pounds. She signaled for Bear to return to her side, which he did immediately, head down. She gave him more water from the collapsible bowl as she checked her insulin pump. The tiny screen read 140 milligrams per deciliter. Her numbers were good, though she felt sick to her stomach. They'd been searching for less than an hour. It had felt like an eternity. You did so good, boy. You did a good job. Not your fault we didn't get here in time. Crouching, hardly noticing the water sloshing over the rims of her hiking boots, Lena buried her hands in the thick fur of his neck. Bear snuffed mournfully and licked her face. She tilted her forehead. Her dog lowered his snout, their heads touched. It was one of Bear's favorite poses. Hers too. You did it. Good job. Thank you. The rest of the early afternoon was a blur, waiting for the officers to reach her location, then the flurry of activity as they loaded the body on a stretcher and hiked back to the empty house, the grieving son. On her return to base, she endured the excruciating debrief. It was late afternoon before they dismissed her. On the way to her SUV, her phone vibrated in the back pocket of her jeans. She yanked out her phone, relieved, Finally, service was back. Then she noticed the identity of the caller. She halted on the sidewalk in mid-stride. Bear sensed the tension and returned to her side, his tail thumping her shins. He looked up at her, panting, with that goofy grin. It's him, she said aloud. Before she could think better of it, she answered. Jackson? He's getting out. What? It's true. What happened? A technicality. 
the appeals court decided the initial search of his vehicle was illegal. They threw everything out, the blood, the thumbprint, fruit of the poisoned tree. She closed her eyes. Without the beer bottle, the DA doesn't have enough evidence to retry the case. He's getting out. She breathed in, breathed out, focused on her pulse, her breathing. Her sister had been dead for eight years. The man who'd been convicted of murdering her was about to be set free. He was also the only man she'd ever truly loved. I thought you should know, Lena. When? Last night. I'm sorry I couldn't get through. Service was down up here. I wanted to tell you before it was all over the news. She'd managed to shut out the past as best she could. For years, she'd ignored the annual anniversary news articles, the flurry of phone calls from intrusive journalists after a salacious tidbit, jackals feeding off her pain. Thank you for telling me. Lena, there's more. She stiffened at the strain in his voice. What? Lena, it's your father. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but he's dead. Nine. Lena Easton. Day two. Lena went still. Her body turned to stone. Her legs, her arms, her chest. Sensing her distress, Bear nuzzled her free hand. His doggy breath was hot on her skin as he licked her fingers. She patted his muzzle, ran her hands over his face, his floppy ears, the top of his giant head. Her father, the man she both hated and loved. She hated him more. She forced the words out, calm and even, like she didn't care. Like if she pretended enough, it might be true. What happened? He, Jackson's voice trailed off. Just tell me, Lena. He was murdered. Lena waited for the expected wave of grief, but it didn't come. Numbness sprouted in her chest and spread slowly outward. Her veins filled with lead. Her father had been many things but he'd made sure she could change a tire, shoot a gun, and start a fire. Much as she resented him, she'd never resented that. She squared her shoulders. Tell me everything. The perpetrator bashed in his head with a tire iron last night. Like I said, I've been trying to get a hold of you for the last 12 hours, but the solar storm. Yeah, the solar storm. As if on cue, the line went dead. She called him twice before the line reconnected. Whatever was happening with these storms, she didn't like it. It made her feel unsettled. Are you okay? Jackson asked. Typical Jackson. Always worried about other people's feelings. Can you hear me? I'm fine. Though she wasn't. Far from it. I'll be fine. Can you come home? That place isn't home, not anymore. There will always be a place for you here, Lena, no matter what. The investigation, do you know who did it? We have some leads. I promise, Lena, you'll be the first to know. She glanced across the street at the bank, sunlight glancing off the expansive glass windows, the patrons hurrying in and out, several fanning themselves with newspapers. There were more guests in line than usual. The banks had been shut down yesterday due to the power outages, but they appeared open. Several cars waited at the ATM. She made a mental note to visit an ATM and take out more cash from her dwindling bank account. She always kept 520s on hand for emergencies, but it didn't feel like enough, especially today. Where is Shiloh? What about Cody? That's what I wanted to talk to you about. The first frisson of fear scythed through her. Where are they? Tell me they're okay. They're both missing. With her free hand, she rubbed her sweaty temple. Bear leaned against her legs, whining plaintively. He sensed something was wrong. 
What does that mean? There's evidence they might have been at the scene when it happened. We're looking for them, I promise. But Lena, there's no one left to take care of them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Her breath came faster and faster, like she was running uphill, her lungs on fire. She couldn't feel her fingers gripping the phone. She imagined her niece the last time she'd seen her, at five years old. That dark fringe of hair and huge black eyes. And Cody, bright-eyed but somber, an old soul trapped in a kid's body. How fiercely she'd loved them. Then she'd walked away. It had felt like walking away from her own beating heart. Lena. A lifetime of emotions and memories and past entwined histories in that name. The heaviness with which he spoke the syllables. In her mind's eye, she saw Jackson at eight, at twelve, at fifteen, at twenty-five. She'd known him her entire life. It was more than knowing. They'd shared a friendship deeper than she'd ever known. A friendship that had survived tragedy, scandal, and heartbreak. Even sixteen hundred miles apart, she could feel him out there. She needs you. Jackson said. I, I can't. She's 13 years old, Jackson said, his voice soft as another round of static infiltrated their conversation. It would have been easy to pretend she hadn't heard, but she had. I'm not her mother. I didn't say that. I said you. Shiloh and Cody need you, Lena. Lena didn't speak. She couldn't. You need to come back. You need to come home. A burst of static, then silence. Jackson? Nothing. She tried calling him again. No service. With shaking fingers, she slid the phone back in her pocket. A tangle of emotions churned inside her. She'd sworn never to step foot in the UP again. All this time, she'd told herself they didn't need her, that her presence would cause tension and drama. Her father didn't want her there. Her father had disowned her. Hell, the whole town had. Everyone was better off without her. Those poor, grieving children would forget her. Wasn't that the best thing, to forget in a way that she never could? That's what she'd told herself every day for the last eight years. Jackson Cross was the good one, the best of them. If he promised to find her sister's children, he would do everything in his power to do so. It might not be good enough, a voice whispered in the back of her mind. Lena was the searcher, the finder of the lost. She was the one who dedicated her life to rescuing the missing. And she was damn good at it. Bear pushed his snout into her thigh. You trying to tell me something? The dog looked up at her, tail wagging eagerly. He was ready for anything Lena had ever asked of him. He'd be ready for this, too. It was Lena who felt like the ground had been ripped out from beneath her. She'd spent the last eight years running. What if she'd been wrong? 10. Jackson Cross. Day 2. By noon, Jackson had gotten his third cup of coffee from Gallery Coffee Company and picked up a mocha latte for Devin, who was a sugar junkie 24-7. He'd spent all morning knocking on the doors of the victim's neighbors before heading into the sheriff's office in Munising for the first debrief on the case. Several officers and deputies were in the briefing room by the time Jackson arrived, including Devin, Hastings, Nash, Moreno, and two others. Jim Hart, a retired Marine and longtime cop from the Munising Police Department, and Alexis Chilton, their resident tech genius. About time you showed up, Moreno said. Getting your beauty sleep? He obviously didn't get enough, Devin deadpanned. Moreno and Nash snickered. It's all fun and games until someone gets hurt. 
Jackson handed Devin her coffee and started the debrief. After a fruitless four hours of banging on doors and interviewing folks who didn't hear anything or didn't want to, I've only got this. We have a dog walker, Dorothy McAllister, who says she walked by the victim's driveway around 4.45 p.m. She didn't see anything. No vehicles passed her during her approximately 30-minute walk with her cocker spaniel, Tigger. That's smack in the middle of our time of death window, Hastings said. Marino leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. Dorothy's what, in her 80s now? How reliable is she? How's her hearing, her eyesight? She lives independently. The woman still shovels her own front porch, Jackson said. As Easton's closest neighbor, Mrs. McAllister had also been interviewed in the case eight years ago. Her reliability had been questioned then, too. She's fine. Marino raised his hands in surrender. Okay, okay. Didn't know you had such a thing for her cross. He winked. I'll remember that in the future. What else do we have? Hart asked. We do have the security footage, Devin said. Easton had three cameras. One on the house, one on the parking lot and driveway, and one covering the interior of the junkyard. The junkyard camera was inoperable. I couldn't tell whether the solar flare had something to do with it, or if it malfunctioned weeks or months ago. I ran the working footage this morning. It's only three days' worth. Then it records over itself. And? Hart asked. Nothing jumped out at me regarding the house footage. No visitors. Amos, Shiloh, and Cody appear, but seldom together. She pushed an opened file across the table. Here's the list of every vehicle that visited the Easton property over the 72 hours prior to the homicide. Five vehicles. Three, I could make out license plate numbers. For two, I could not. We do have the vehicle makes and models, however. I ran the plates. Any of these names stand out to you? Jackson read the list aloud. Every name was familiar. Gideon Crawford had been born and raised here. He had been an old boyfriend of Lily's and now worked as a dentist. Dana Lutz ran snowmobiling tours in the winter, and Scott Smith owned the local gas station. None had recent run-ins with the law. Nothing sticks out. Jackson turned to Alexis. Can you take these? Run the usual checks? See if anyone noticed anything suspicious? Alexis nodded as she chewed on her pen. In her late twenties, her strawberry blonde hair was shaved on the sides. The rest plopped on top of her head in a messy bun. She wore thick, oversized black frame glasses. Let's hope the servers are functional. Devin clicked a few buttons on her laptop and then flipped it to face the rest of the room. The grainy footage appeared, the world rendered in indistinct black and white. At approximately 6.30 p.m. last night, a white Jeep Wrangler pulls up. Walter Boone gets out, heads up to the house at 6.33 p.m., waits three minutes like he expects someone to be home, then turns and walks down the hill to the salvage yard. The officers watched the grainy figure as they followed Devin's verbal description. His body language appeared normal, his shoulders slightly hunched. No warning bells went off. Just a guy in slacks and a sweater vest who needed a new fender. They watched the empty parking lot. A minute or so later, Boone came back into view, this time moving much faster, his stride jerky and uneven, a phone pressed to his cheek. He went straight to his car fumbled to open it, then clambered inside and sat for about 60 seconds, still holding his phone. Why is he just sitting there? Hastings asked. He calls 911 here. It's grainy, but it checks out. He spoke with Tammy Dale at 6.39 p.m. Tammy was their dispatch operator, emergency operator, and administrative assistant a no-nonsense mother of four in her late fifties with fifteen grandchildren. She kept the department running like a well-oiled machine. They watched as Boone tossed his phone on the passenger seat. The grainy jeep backed up, did a U-turn, and punched the gas, roaring down the long driveway and out of sight of the camera's view. 
Devon switched off the footage and closed her laptop. 76 seconds. That's how long he's in the junkyard. Long enough to walk in, past all those cars to the center, see the Vic, and walk straight back out. Who is this guy? Anybody know him? Of course, Hastings said. He volunteer coaches the Lego Robotics Club at the high school. He coached my kid and got him a partial scholarship to MTU. He meant Michigan Technical University in Houghton. We interviewed him this morning, Marino said. His story matches with the footage. No inconsistencies. Did he touch the victim? Jackson asked. He says no. Jackson pointed to one of the crime scene photos spread out across the table. You can see here and here that the blood spatter is smeared on the victim's shirt. Like someone was checking for a heartbeat, Hastings said. Possibly. But someone definitely touched him after the assault, while the blood was still wet. Jackson and Devin exchanged a glance. It could have been the perpetrator, or one of the kids. Or the perpetrator was one of the kids. That was a thought he did not want to consider. Have the crime technicians come back with anything? Hastings asked. They're still processing the scene. Jackson rubbed his temples. The caffeine hadn't been enough to stave off a headache. We have a blood sample and a footprint, but DNA hasn't come back yet. Next suspect, Alexis deadpanned. Autopsy, Hastings asked. Scheduled for tomorrow. Jackson turned to Alexis. Where are we on financials? Alexis dropped her chewed pen to the table and pushed up her glasses. I checked with the county clerk's office. Easton owed $49,000 in back taxes at the beginning of the year. The county was threatening to foreclose on him. He was making interest-only payments, but he was behind on those, too. Then suddenly, on April 3rd of this year, he paid the debt in full. Hastings clicked his tongue. He was barely making ends meet with the junkyard business. Where the hell did he come up with that kind of money? That's a good question, Jackson said. How about his financial records? We're working on the search warrant, Moreno said. The banks are a mess right now, Alexis said. They're limiting how much people can withdraw of their own money. This geomagnetic storm really messed with their servers. My GPS was being screwy this morning, Devin said. It said the Two Eggs and Ham Cafe was located on Grand Island. It should be, Moreno quipped. Their omelets suck. It's the low Earth orbit satellites, too, Alexis said. Banking systems rely on GPS to synchronize financial transactions. If the satellites are fritzy, she shrugged. Bye, secret Cayman account. You're full of it, Chilton, Moreno said. She stared at him and wriggled her eyebrows. Am I? Okay, stay focused, everyone. Keep working on the financials, Jackson said. If Easton is hiding a deep, dark secret, that's it. Follow the money. Alexis rolled her eyes. Yeah, hello, that's what I'm doing. Hastings stood and stretched. How long is this sun thing going to be a problem? Moreno stared up at the buzzing fluorescent lights. I heard on talk radio this morning that they're predicting even more of these things. Another one tomorrow. Maybe I should go to the bank and withdraw my millions before it's too late. Maybe you should. Alexis said. I bet it's more like your last 20 bucks, though. Moreno grinned. Never have an ex-wife. Or three. They'll steal every hard-earned penny. Hard-earned? That's quite the exaggeration. Alexis shot back. Jackson had several months of supplies socked away for a rainy day. Up here, it was prudent to be prepared for emergencies. Hell, it was prudent everywhere. Still, he made a mental note to check the supplies in the basement, and maybe stock up a bit more. It wasn't something he talked about much. Moreno would never let it go.
Janet Holder said the Bear Trap Inn is completely booked, Hastings said. I heard Pictured Rocks Resorts is tapped out, and a bunch of the campgrounds, too. All the Aurora chasers want to see the best show. It's good for business. Alexis went back to chewing the tip of her pen. As long as all those tourists use cash rather than credit cards, they're going to be in for a rude awakening when their plastic rectangles don't do crap. Good riddance, Moreno rolled his eyes. Those Aurora chasers can kiss my fine Portuguese behind. They finished up with a few details, and then Jackson and Devin were on their feet, headed out again. Jackson wanted to visit the kids' school. Devin wanted to work the crime scene again, walk through it in daylight. They had secured the search warrant for the property, which was effective as long as law enforcement remained at the scene. Nash had drawn the short straw and stayed the night to maintain scene security and ensure the chain of custody remained intact. Before they could escape the building, the sheriff stomped out of his office, the glass panel shuddering in its frame as he slammed the door behind him. Brad Underwood was a stern, imposing black man in his early fifties with ramrod posture. Everything about him from his clean-shaven jaw to his bald head and hard eyes, screamed lifelong cop. How often we get a homicide around here? Sheriff Underwood asked in a loud voice. Across the foyer, Tammy Dale glanced at them from behind her desk, eyebrows raised. The sheriff shot her a look. She quickly bent her head and shuffled some papers. Not often, Sheriff, Jackson said evenly. Not often. Sheriff Underwood said in a mocking tone. The last homicide caused quite the debacle. I know that. So you're going to get this one wrapped up right quick, eh? I'll do my best. The sheriff shook his head, perpetually disappointed in Jackson. Mainly because Jackson wasn't his father, Horatio Cross, who'd served as sheriff for 18 years before retiring 10 years ago. Underwood had been the undersheriff for 15 of those 18 years. He and Horatio had been drinking buddies for decades, and still were. Jackson wasn't interested in drinking buddies. He didn't boast. He tried to keep his head down, get the job done right, and let his reputation do the talking. It didn't always work. Men like his father and Sheriff Underwood were interested in polling numbers, percentages, glowing news coverage, and cases closed, open and shut. Everything was a popularity contest to Sheriff Underwood. If he wasn't winning, heads would roll. He wasn't haunted by bloody crime scenes. He didn't spend sleepless nights consumed by guilt for what he had or hadn't done. He didn't seem to care about resolution for the victims, justice for the dead. In some ways, Jackson envied him. Sheriff Underwood tapped his foot impatiently. Why haven't you brought in Cody Easton as a suspect? We're working on bringing him in, and it's too early to determine whether he is a suspect or a witness, or if he was there at all. We're waiting on the DNA match. The sheriff grunted dismissively. <laughs> and the girl? A possible witness? We're working on finding her, too. What other suspects do you have? We canvassed the neighborhood. You know how it goes. No one heard anything. No one wants to talk. You're in charge of this case, son. Don't make me regret it. Jackson hated the man's sarcastic use of son. It fell just short of condescension. Sheriff Underwood never outright crossed the line into harassment, but he enjoyed coming close. Eight years ago, Jackson had suffered the limelight for breaking the Broken Heart Killer case. He hadn't wanted it. Underwood had, badly. Maybe that's why the man disliked him so much. Or maybe there were other, grimmer reasons. I also have the Ruby Carpenter case. Give it to someone else. Give it to Hasting or Nash. Better yet, close it. That girl is a chronic runaway. Her mother is grasping at straws and wasting this office's time, resources, and taxpayer dollars. Jackson didn't say anything. 
Sheriff Underwood leaned in close. You hearing me, Cross? I promised her mother I'd look into it. And now your good deed for the year is done. You have an actual job to catch a killer so we can all sleep at night. You understand? I understand. Jackson kept his gaze steady on the sheriffs, refusing to drop his gaze or flinch. He was used to intimidation tactics. He'd grown up with them. Bradley Underwood enjoyed keeping his officers under his thumb. He was a man for whom power and authority mattered. He was a big fish in a small pond. Until the state police or the FBI got involved. And then he wouldn't be. He wanted this case locked up and fast. So did Jackson, but for different reasons. He wanted Shiloh and Cody protected and safe. He wanted justice, true justice, to be served. Sheriff Underwood took a step closer and lowered his voice. He smelled of the cigarettes he'd been trying to quit for ten years. Cross, I need to know we're on the same page in this. You and I don't want a repeat of eight years ago. With Eli Pope freed, the citizens are already up in arms. I just had Tim Brooks in my office. Had to talk him out of an organized lynching on the front lawn of the Munising precinct. He waved a hand. Pope gets out on some asinine technicality, then we have a homicide the same day. A relative of the original victim, no less. You see where I'm going with this. How long you think before folks get crazy enough to take things into their own hands? I checked with the prison this morning, Jackson said. Eli was released several hours after Easton was killed, according to the M.E. The sheriff cursed. They'll think he did it anyway. Damn it all to hell. And then this craziness with the sky turning red. You'd think it was a plague of biblical proportions the way some folks are carrying on. I don't need that madness leaking into this case. I don't need that headache. Things are bad enough without people believing the world's about to end. Who's worried the world is going to end? The chief stared at him like he'd grown two heads. Don't you see the crazy conspiracy posts on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok? Jackson shrugged. He didn't do social media. The outdoors was his religion, church, his solace. Fly fishing, his drug of choice. It's not like that here. We got more common sense in our left nutsacks than most of those trolls south of the bridge. Doesn't mean it won't start infecting folks. The sheriff scowled. You should watch some of those videos. As if on cue, the fluorescent lights flickered overhead. Everyone groaned. A second later, they came back on as the generator rumbled to life. The sheriff let out a furious expletive. Internet's down, Tammy said from behind the counter. This is becoming a habit. The sheriff slapped a pile of intake forms off the counter. They fluttered to the tile floor behind him as he stalked back to his office. For Pete's sake, call me when the world is back to normal. A shiver of foreboding sparked up Jackson's spine. What if that's never, Moreno asked, grinning. 11. Lena Easton, Day 2. Did you see the lights last night? The nurse asked, smiling as she bent to rub Bear's floppy ears. Hard to miss, Lena said. Bear gave a grumbly moan of pleasure, tilting his head so the nurse could hit his favorite spots. The nurses loved on him every time Lena and Bear stepped through the hospital doors. Bear adored it. Every other weekend, Lena and Bear volunteered at the pediatric ward in Tampa General Hospital, visiting the patients and bringing a little joy where they could. Today wasn't their usual day, but after the death of Stanley Mills, Bear had needed to pick me up. And Lena had needed a few moments to think, to consider her options, to make a decision that would alter the trajectory of her life. Tampa General Hospital smelled like antiseptic and bleach. The lights were on, computers working, 
nurses in scrubs, and doctors in white lab coats striding here and there, holding tablets or pushing young patients in wheelchairs. Everything appeared normal. Oh, look, they're talking about the northern lights again, one of the nurses said. The nurse petting Bear lifted her head to watch the television affixed to the far wall in the visitor's area. Lena turned her attention to the screen, where the lights glowed above New York City's Times Square. A montage showed the aurora dancing above the Seine, flickering above the Roman Colosseum, the entire sky in flames over London and Amsterdam. It's magical, the nurse said. Lena stepped closer to the TV. A few people in the waiting room were watching. Most were glued to their phones, playing games or scrolling social media. The first newscaster was in his early 40s, with a face that oozed fake sincerity. He tapped his earpiece and raised his brows, his smooth forehead wrinkle-free. We're getting reports that another solar storm is on its way and should hit tomorrow in the late afternoon although we probably won't see the northern lights until it gets dark. And what does that mean, Chase? The second newscaster addressed her co-host, her voice chipper as she offered a conspiratorial grin to the camera. We can expect another fantastic light show. Get your cameras out for this one, folks. Scientists and astronomers from NASA's Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory and the Space Weather Prediction Center are forecasting a spectacular night. I didn't even know space weather was a thing. Samantha laughed too loudly. Guess I'll be checking their website next time I go to the beach, Chase. Chase's fake smile widened. Coming up next, we have a special guest. A scientist is here to shed some light on the science behind these gorgeous auroras. They introduced Isaac Richardson, a black gentleman in his mid-fifties, with distinguished gray hair and a tired smile. Thank you for having me. I run the Solar Observatory at the University of Florida. Think of SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory Satellite that observes the sun from space. I study the structure and dynamics of the sun's interior, mainly the causes and propagation of coronal mass ejections. So this is right up your alley, Dr. Richardson, Samantha said brightly. What's the difference between a solar flare, a coronal mass ejection, and these geomagnetic storms? Dr. Richardson loosened his tie. He looked nervous. A solar flare is a tremendous explosion on the sun, which happens when energy stored in twisted magnetic fields around sunspots are abruptly released. The magnetic field lines become so warped and stretched that they snap under intense tension, much like a rubber band. The plasma explodes into space as a coronal mass ejection, or CME. Oh, that sounds spectacular, Samantha cooed. Like a disaster movie. CMEs only affect the Earth if the eruption occurs in our direction. The superheated plasma increases electric currents and causes disturbances in the Earth's magnetosphere. When this happens, it's referred to as a geomagnetic storm. We've had geomagnetic storms before, Samantha said. To be honest, I never even noticed. What makes the ones we're experiencing now special? There are three major categories of solar flares. C-class and M-class flares cause little to no damage. X-class flares are the most severe and trigger the CMEs. And the CMEs then trigger the geomagnetic storms, Chase said. Correct. The most widely used method to categorize geomagnetic storms is the NOAA's G scale. G0 is considered harmless, while a G5 is considered extreme. 
Chase raised his eyebrows. His forehead didn't move. Are the storms we're experiencing G5 level? They're much stronger. The one we experienced yesterday was a G10, so ten times as powerful as a G1 storm. The ones heading toward us are significantly more powerful. Lena shivered. A low buzzing filled her ears, a sense of unease slithering through her. She'd been so focused on her job that she hadn't realized the seriousness of what was happening. Sensing Lena's anxiety, Bear climbed to his feet and pressed against the front of Lena's legs, offering comfort. His tail wagged. Lena scratched behind his ears. The scientist continued. For the last ten years, I've been developing predictive algorithms. In layman's terms, I study the sun's radioactive activity and try to predict the next geomagnetic storm, when it will hit, where it will go, that sort of thing. Does it work? Chase asked. Yes. And what is it predicting? Dr. Richardson cleared his throat. He was sweating. The sun is like a boiling cauldron spilling over. We're looking at a half dozen solar flares with multiple powerful geomagnetic storms hitting us in rapid succession. In 1859, a huge CME hit Earth. Known as the Carrington Event, the solar storms disrupted telegraph wires, shocked telegraph operators, and caused multiple fires. Chase winked. Good thing we're not using telegrams anymore. Dr. Richardson kept going like he hadn't heard him. In 2012, another CME, as powerful as the Carrington event, narrowly avoided Earth. Studies determined that it was a superstorm, a double CME. This happens when two CMEs are unleashed, separated by only a few minutes, which makes it significantly more powerful than a regular CME. Dr. Richardson swallowed. The algorithm is predicting a triple CME, each of X50 strength or more. It will be like nothing we've seen before. Samantha and Chase stared at the scientist, startled. What does that mean? Samantha asked. Dr. Richardson gazed into the camera with glazed eyes. Our electric grid won't be able to withstand the barrage. The storms will fry transformers across the northern hemisphere. The impact will be devastating. Banking systems will crash. The stock market will be erased in a day. Hundreds of millions of people will be without power or internet access or cell communications across several continents, not to mention GPS and satellite systems disruptions. Like for a few hours? Samantha ventured, her eyes wide. It would take years to repair, possibly decades. He said it matter of fact, but there was a tremor in his voice. Chase let out a chuckle. <laughs> That's a little dire, isn't it, Dr. Richardson? Lena stared at the TV in growing horror. Of course, he could be delusional. But then, so could the newscasters, with their plastic smiles. Her heart rate quickened. Her mouth went dry. Samantha shuffled several papers on her desk. She glanced down, frowned, then offered the camera an uneasy smile. The Department of Homeland Security released a statement that the U.S. power grid is hardened against these electrical currents, and any disruptions will be temporary. With all due respect, a CME of this strength hasn't hit 
Earth in modern times. We really can't say that our grid is hardened against a force of this magnitude. I wish I was mistaken. I truly do. But I'm not. Thank you for coming, Dr. Richardson. Chase turned to the camera with a broad grin. After the break, we have none other than Adele here in the studio to perform her newest single. Lena took a step backward. The hairs on her arms lifted. She envisioned empty grocery stores. Banks closed. Gas stations shuttered. Every cog in the supply chain upended. People would go hungry. Mothers and fathers and children. What would they do? How would everyone feed themselves? What would come next? If this was true, what would the world look like? In a week, in a month. A sense of despair crouched at the edges of her thoughts. The regret and loss was overwhelming. Almost too much to take in. The newscasters didn't want to believe it. Maybe it was cruel to dump more doom and gloom on a planet still recovering from a years-long pandemic. Maybe that's why the media were so mindlessly cheerful. So blissfully ignorant. No one could handle another devastating blow. The thing was, Mother Nature didn't care a lick what you could or couldn't handle. What you were or weren't prepared for, she'd kick you in the balls anyway. Lena did her best to be prepared, on a limited budget. She had a go bag in the back of her Honda Pilot. She had a stocked pantry and a back deck garden. None of that would be enough for what was coming. And she did believe that it was coming. Soon, life as everyone knew it would be over. Her current life, the life that she'd worked so hard to build, was over. She thought of her job that she loved. Her SAR volunteer work. Getting takeout from the Chinese place around the corner. Having coffee with her neighbor. It was like being pushed off a cliff. She felt disorientated, dizzy. She glanced around. Half the people weren't paying attention, but some were. They were tense and worried, speaking in low voices. A couple stood and hurried from the visiting area. She had to go, to get out of the city. Urgency pulled at her. Soon the highways would be clogged with millions of scared people with the same idea. It was 1,600 miles from Tampa to Munising, Michigan. She would go north. She would face Eli Pope. She would find her niece and nephew and bring them home. She would give them what she'd never had. Stability, security, shelter in a disintegrating world. They would figure this out together. Lena strode from the hospital through the glass doors into the sunlight. Tampa had offered noise and stimulation, sunshine and distraction, a constant blare of activity that kept the whispers in her head at bay. Now, though, she felt the buildings closing in, the crowded skyscrapers looming overhead, stifling her oxygen. Her stomach tightened in iron knots. The Newfoundland fell into step beside her. He looked up at her expectantly, his tail wagging. Lena patted Bear's head. Time to get to work. Twelve. Eli Pope. Day two. Eli stood in the living room of the silent house and listened. The lights were off. It was dark. Engine sounds grumbled in the distance. Someone was coming. They knew he was here. He'd been home for less than six hours. It was enough time to assess the supplies his father had left behind and do some packing. He planned to leave first thing in the morning. After his release, he'd been unable to get a hold of a car service that late in the day, so he'd hiked a mile to a dilapidated hotel and paid for a bed in cash. The next morning, he'd called a taxi to bring him home. Home to a vacant house. His father... Gerald Pope, aged 67, of the Ojibwe tribe, 
had died of a heart attack three months ago. The newspaper had reported he'd died of a broken heart, yet another casualty of the broken heart killer. But Eli doubted it. They had not been close. Before he'd passed, his father had abandoned the house and returned to the Bay Mills Indian Reservation in Chippewa County, located 15 miles southwest of Sault Ste. Marie. He had died there, as had Eli's mother, who'd committed suicide when he was six. The Ojibwe held a deep belief in community, in family, but Eli had never felt like he'd belonged anywhere. His lawyer had told him that the house was stuck in probate. His father had removed him from the will, instead giving the house to a distant cousin somewhere on his father's sister's side who lived in Bay Mills. Eli barely knew him. It didn't matter. The house was empty. It was quiet. No cat calls or whispered threats. No stench of sweat and fear. No iron bars. He moved through the house with a flashlight he'd retrieved from the garage. The key was still under the planter by the front door. A film of dust covered everything, the bookcases, the hand-hewn furniture, the wood-paneled walls. The house was small and simple, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a Michigan basement. But it was clean and well-preserved. Nothing felt familiar, nothing felt like his. His old bedroom had been transformed into an office years ago. Gone were the hunting and fishing gear, the dresser covered in a collection of hunting knives he'd kept sharpened to a razor's edge. However, the H&K VP9 and holster he'd kept hidden inside a vent behind the closet door was still in place, just as he'd left it. So was the yellow manila envelope stuffed with $370 in cash, an extra 17-round magazine, and a box of 9 millimeter ammunition. The gun safe in his father's closet was still there. The combination, his mother's birthday, had not been changed. Eli doubted the AK-47 he withdrew from it had been fired since he'd left. He'd already cleaned, stripped, and oiled it. Eli hadn't lived in this house for years. Not since he'd signed with the military, two weeks after he turned 18, the summer after graduation. He'd spent the first year in the 3rd Infantry Division. He got a tryout for RASP, the eight-week Ranger Assessment Selection Program. A sadistic, brutal course he wouldn't wish on his worst enemies. After passing the course, he'd joined the 75th Ranger Regiment. Six months after that, he made it through Ranger School on the first try. For seven years, he'd been part of a battalion that was ready to answer the call anywhere in the world within 72 hours. As a Tier 1 operator, he'd seen combat in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. Until he'd been arrested for murder. After his conviction, he'd been dishonorably discharged. Career over. Life over. Just like that. The engines drew closer. Eli raised his head, listening. Still barely audible, but Eli's senses were attuned to the slightest sounds, the barest ripples in the energy of the universe. Eli thumbed the last round into the spare magazine. Flicking off the flashlight, he tucked the magazine into his back pocket and the VP-9 pistol into the concealed inside the waistband holster, then grabbed the AK-47. Carrying the rifle in the low ready position, he moved swiftly through the darkened living room into the kitchen past the rucksack and camping gear laid out on the kitchen table, to the back door. He exited the house, skirted the garage, and circled to the right side of the front yard, keeping a screen of jack pines between himself and the driveway. It was after 9 p.m. The aurora hadn't shown itself tonight. In its place, the bowl of the sky was wide and black and sprinkled with ice-bright stars. The moon shone bright, bathing everything in a silvery glow. A slight breeze swished through the leaves. There were no city lights, no mechanical sounds but the trilling of insects and living things moving through the underbrush. By the time the twin beams of the headlights swung into view, washing across the front of the house, Eli was well concealed. In gathering darkness, three vehicles approached. Tires crunched gravel. 
Two trucks, both dark-colored, and a sedan. He knew what they wanted, what they were here for. Adrenaline kicked his heart into high gear. He missed his NVGs, or night vision goggles. He missed the M4556 by 45 millimeter carbine he'd carried in the 75th Ranger Regiment, along with his optics. Not to mention his plates and tactical gear. An M203 grenade launcher wouldn't be bad right about now, either. At least he had the AK-47. The semi-automatic rifle had heft. It was intimidating as hell. And the pistol sat snug in its holster at his back. He reminded himself that shooting civilians like fish in a barrel would be a quick pass back to prison. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. A part of him knew he should just slip away disappear before things escalated to violence. And yet, it wasn't in him to back down. He planned to leave at first light, but there was no way in hell he'd let them drive him to it, or allow them to think they had. Let them come. Let them see him. Let them understand that he was not afraid. That when he left, it would be his choice, not theirs. He didn't much care whether these numbskulls lived or died but he wasn't going back to prison. For however long he continued to breathe the oxygen of this damned planet, the choice would be his. He wouldn't be caged again. He'd rather go out in a spray of bullets. Eli waited, crouched between two trees with an excellent sight line to the driveway. Pine needles scratched his cheek, damp leaves beneath his boots, the scent of pine strong in his nostrils. The smells were overpowering after the years of want. The vehicles pulled close to the house, revving engines, tires spinning gravel, brights on, aggressive and posturing. They were making a point. Doors slammed open. A half dozen men poured out. They gripped crowbars. A few carried hunting rifles. Burly men. Tough men. Men who lived off this hard land and survived. Eli despised them but he did not underestimate them. On one knee, breath even, his heart rate steady, he watched. The men approached the front door of the house close together, swaggering in a pack. Five men, one woman. He was outnumbered. They had weapons. He wasn't going hand to hand with them. You didn't bring a knife to a gunfight. If it was a gunfight they wanted, he'd give it to them. A dark, Thrumming energy filled him, blood and violence, misery and pain. The choice was theirs. He rose and lifted the rifle, the stock seated against his shoulder, finger on the trigger guard. He bladed his body to remain behind the cover of the tree trunk. Get the hell off my lawn. Thirteen. Eli Pope. Day two. Eli kept his grip on the AK-47, his gaze as cold and hard as a snake's. He did not feel fear. Not this night. Not after eight years of prison, where you were either predator or prey. Eli Pope was a predator. Lower your weapons. Nice and easy. Startled, several men started to whip around. I wouldn't do that. I've got a rifle aimed at your backs. They froze in place, weapons half raised. One man swore. Damn it. Wouldn't move if I were you. Not until you lose those weapons. They cursed, furious. But they obeyed. One by one, they dropped them. A couple of tire irons, two rifles, and a revolver. One gray-haired man still clutched his pistol. Eli shifted his aim. You're in the open. I'm not. How do you think that's going to go? Johannes, a woman said. The man released a pistol and turned around. One by one, the others did as well. Eli took a step out from behind the tree. Forced to turn to face him, they squinted against the glare of the headlights. Eli saw them clearly, while he remained a shadowy silhouette. His gaze swept across the group. Fear opened in the men's faces. That terrible flash of understanding. It was Eli who held the power of life and death. They were the powerless ones in this equation. 
Eli watched them, never losing sight of their hands. As an operator, he'd patrolled environments where insurgents mixed with the civilian population. Hands hid weapons. Hands telegraphed their next move before they made it. He wouldn't put it past any of them to be incredibly stupid and try something. A grizzled man in his early 70s stepped forward. Wisps of white hair clung to his bald, liver-spotted pate. He wore hunting gear with a camo bandana tied around his forehead. Johannes Heikinen, an old-timer, the Finnish owner of a fishing charter in Munising. He lived in a fishing shack on the shores of Superior for half the year. For 30 years, he'd played poker every Thursday night with Eli's father at the Driftwood Bar. Johannes spoke with a smoker's rasp. The Broken Heart Killer. The media nicknamed him the Broken Heart Killer because he had supposedly discovered Lily with another man, then killed her in a rage. The truth was, he and Lily were not lovers in the way the media portrayed them. They'd slept together that night, after he'd seen his father and visited a few friends at a bar. The DNA evidence had proven that. Lily was a hard person to say no to, but he hadn't loved her like that and he hadn't cared who else she slept with. In the hours after he'd left her house, Lily had been assaulted, beaten, then strangled in her home. A gold half-heart locket had been placed on her stomach, a lock of her own hair left inside. Eli had not killed her. He had not left the broken heart locket behind as his signature. But no one was interested in the truth. Eli smiled flat and empty. Leave now, and I won't shoot you. One warning, for his dead father's sake. For the time Johannes Heikinen sat him at the table when he was nine years old and taught him the game, when to fold, when to call a bluff, when to go all in. That was a long time ago. Another life, another universe. Eli's gaze shifted to the rest of them. Scott Smith was in his fifties, the surly owner of the Shell gas station on Cedar Street. Eli had bought gas, ice, and bait from the man since he was six years old. Elmer Dunn was a grizzled hunter, the owner of a handful of rustic cabins he rented to fishermen and hunters on 30 acres outside of Munising, near Alger Falls. The fourth man was Tim Brooks, co-owner of the Northwoods Inn with his wife Lori. Eli had spent plenty of nights drinking at the Northwoods bar with a few buddies and talking sports with Tim, who'd often bartended while his wife ran the hotel. Eli had spent the evening before Lily was killed at the Northwoods bar. This is your warning, Tim said. Leave and never come back, or we will be forced to make you. A woman said, it'd be our sincerest pleasure. Eli knew Dana Lutz, too. In her mid-forties, her bleached blonde hair was pulled back in a bun, her toughened features pinched with anger, fine lines radiating from her eyes. She ran snowmobile tours in the winters. How the hell did they let you out? Dana asked. It was a rhetorical question. Eli's appellate attorney had argued that the cop who pulled Eli over that night did so without just cause and with racial prejudice. On appeal, the search of Eli's car where the evidence had been discovered was deemed by the Michigan Court of Appeals to be an illegal search. Therefore, the evidence found was inadmissible, a.k.a. fruit of the poisonous tree. The DA had hung his entire case on the beer bottle with Eli's thumbprint and Lily Easton's blood. Without it, they couldn't win a retrial. They'd been forced to release him, free and clear except for the people who still believed he was guilty as sin. A man moved out from behind Dana. At first, Eli didn't recognize the scruffy black goatee or the heavy gut, but the broad face and faint native features were familiar. Gideon Crawford, Eli said. Go to hell, Pope, Gideon said. Once they'd been friends, played high school football, got stoned together at beach bonfires after the prom after losing state, and when Gideon's college girlfriend had been tragically killed in a car accident. 
Pure hate blazed in Gideon's eyes. Eli didn't need daylight to see it. It emanated from the man in radioactive waves. Eight years ago, Gideon Crawford had been Lily's new boyfriend, the one who had supposedly stolen her from Eli. Gideon Crawford would have good reason to hate him. Jealousy and grief were a potent mix. And he'd been there that night at the bar, along with James Sawyer and Cyrus Lee. The last night, before Eli's whole world went to hell. Suspicion flitted through his mind. Was Gideon the one who'd framed him? Or maybe it had been Tim. Tim Brooks was Gideon's uncle. They could have done it together. Or hell, it could have been all of them. You don't belong here, Gideon said. This is my father's house. I have every right to be here. This isn't your home anymore, killer, Gideon said. Law says it is, Eli said evenly. It was a lie, but he guessed they didn't know the ins and outs of probate. He guessed correctly. Don't matter to us what the law says. We know who you are, Tim Brooks said. What you are, what you did. Far as I can tell, it's still a free country. Gideon scowled. It's not free, not for you. For a half a second, Eli faltered. The muzzle of the AK-47 lowered slightly. It took him aback. How easily people could turn on you, how little it took. They all loathed him. His old friends, the townspeople who'd known him his entire life. Their hatred was a physical thing, a weight he couldn't shake off no matter how he wished it, no matter how much he pretended he didn't care. Something released inside him, a tightness wound like a fist. He let out a breath. He knew better than to lower his weapon. One iota of weakness from him, and they'd be on him like a pack of wolves. A noise registered. The low rumble of an approaching engine. A pair of headlights swung into the driveway. The engine cut off. A car door opened. Boots hit gravel. Stop! The voice was loud and commanding a rich baritone booming through the still night. The men flinched and turned. Gideon and Tim took a few steps back, nursing their wounded pride. A figure approached, silhouetted against the headlights of the sheriff's office patrol truck, a shotgun pressed against his shoulder, not aimed at anyone yet, but ready and willing. His gaze flicked to Eli eyes narrowing at the sight of Eli Pope holding a weapon on the good citizens of Alger County. Arrest him, Gideon said. He drew on us. From where I'm standing, I see an awful lot of weapons on the ground. Looks like y'all came here looking for trouble. Shouldn't be a big surprise that you found it. Eli might have laughed if the situation wasn't so serious. Vintage Jackson. Pope threatened us. Dana pointed a finger at Eli. He should be arrested. He should be charged with... Jackson's voice remained calm, but the edge was sharp as steel. There was no give in it, no weakness. Near as I can tell, you trespassed onto his land with the intent to attack a man in his own home. If I'm making arrests, it'll be you folks. Jackson, Johannes said. He's got no rights to be here. Make him leave. I'm afraid I can't do that. And you can't either. Gideon spat on the ground. We're just doing what everyone knows is the right thing. I'm the law, Jackson said evenly. And I say to stand down. This isn't right, Gideon said. He can't be here. He's a murderer. Everyone leave. Now. Come on, Jackson. Jackson Cross swung the barrel of his shotgun toward Gideon. Last warning. If I have to bring you in, that's a second offense, Crawford. You've got that drunk driving charge on your record. You sure you want to do this? What about our weapons? Tim snarled. I'm not leaving my pistol for this psycho to steal. Get out of my sight before I arrest the lot of you for trespassing. Jackson glanced at Eli. Mr. Pope will allow you to retrieve your possessions and retreat. Through the altercation, Eli stood in stony silence. He did not move. He did not back down. He watched and said nothing. 
The group reluctantly dispersed. Within a minute, they had retreated to their vehicles. The trucks tore up the grass of the front lawn as they peeled out. One by one, they roared down the empty road back toward Munising. Eli waited for the sounds of the engines to fade to silence. Then he turned to face Jackson Cross. 14. Eli Pope, Day 2. Crickets chirped in the weeds. Stars shone bright overhead. The night was chilly, but not freezing. It was the middle of May. But here in the north, summer was still a ways off. Jackson dipped his chin. He dropped the shotgun to his side. Eli? Eli lowered his rifle. Been a long time, friend. Jackson didn't flinch. He was too strong to shrink easily made of tougher stuff than most gave him credit for. His boyish face and quick, easy smile made others underestimate him. Eli knew better. This man was no country bumpkin cop, no idiot. Though he had his blind spots, always had. One of those blind spots had been Eli himself, until it wasn't. Not your best idea to come back here, Jackson said. I didn't ask for your opinion. Suppose you're right. Still, Eli said nothing. You seem different. Prison changes a man. I suppose it would. Like war. Jackson, of course, had never been to war. Not like Eli. Two tours in Syria, one in Afghanistan. Time spent in hell holes no one here could possibly imagine. In some ways, war was like prison. Or prison was like war. Either way, it deadened you. Siphoned little bits of your soul, whatever made a person human. When you came home, if you came home, you were hurt, deep down, all the way to the marrow, so that nothing could touch it. Not even love. It's been a long time. Eli said nothing. A dozen memories flitted through his mind. Two boys laughing. Long summer days spent fly fishing snowmobiling through deep winter woods. He pushed them out. You have the right to file a complaint, a trespassing charge. I'm not pressing charges. Jackson rubbed his jaw nervously, a tell he hadn't been able to shake since he was seven years old, and he and Eli had faced off on the playground for the first time. They stood in the gravel driveway, darkness surrounding them, bats flitting and diving above the tree line. Neither of them moved. They might have been circling each other, wary as wolves, each analyzing the other for weakness, for chinks in the armor, the best method of attack. Eli flashed him a hard smile. Why are you here? To see an old friend? You are never good at lying. Jackson snorted. <laughs> no, I suppose not. I'm busy. I have work to do. I can't protect you from the townspeople, Jackson said. I can put a watch detail on your house, but we're already understaffed. I haven't asked for your protection. This is only the beginning. They'll come after you again, and they're liable to do worse next time. Eli looked up at the oil-black sky and felt the light from stars a million years old shining down on him. Open sky, endless space an expanse he never thought he'd see again. Let them come. Eli, what do you care? The words came sharp and vicious. To his credit, Jackson kept his head high. My job is to protect this county and everyone in it. You aren't here to protect me. You're here to check on me. Make sure I haven't killed some other girl yet. Isn't that what you're afraid of? Jackson swallowed. Even in the half-darkness, with the headlights blurring his shape, the truth was evident in his face. Like the others, Jackson believed in his guilt. He believed his best friend had killed his on-again, off-again lover, the woman they'd both known, but Jackson had loved. The sharp stab between Eli's ribs surprised him. He'd thought he was numb to pain, dead to sorrow. Yet it threatened to carry him away on a red tide, to drown him like Lake Superior. 
I came to ask you a few questions, Jackson said. As law enforcement, or... Eli couldn't say, as a friend. They were no longer friends. Not after the arrest, the trial, the conviction. In a professional capacity? Speak then. Jackson eyed him warily, like he could read his mind. Once upon a time, he probably could have. I'm investigating a homicide. Eli stilled. It's someone you know. Eli didn't rise to the bait. He waited, watchful and wary, for the trap he felt coming. Yesterday, Amos Easton was murdered. His mouth went bone dry. Lena's father. And Lily's father, Jackson said. Eli blinked. Of course. Jackson was silent for a minute, his jaw clenched, eyes narrowed, as if he struggled to contain his anger. Eli didn't begrudge him for it. Jackson had pined for Lily since he was twelve years old. No one had been more devastated at her death, except for her older sister, Lena. A memory flashed through his mind. Eli holding Lena, her shoulders quaking as she wept in grief and horror. Her tears, hot on his bare chest, her long chestnut waves in his face, the scent of vanilla and cinnamon in his nostrils. He braced himself. When? The medical examiner puts the death between 4 and 6 p.m. on May 17th. Who did it? That's what I'm investigating. Lots of folk are pointing their fingers your way. I was incarcerated behind concrete walls and barbed wire not to mention the dozens of armed correctional officers watching my every move, and the cameras. You can check. He narrowed his eyes. You already have. You have a motive, Jackson said, but no opportunity. You could have hired someone. Eli let out a harsh laugh. <laughs> after eight years, whatever for. If I was going to send an assassin after Easton, it would have been years ago. Because you knew you were getting out. If that was my goal, I would have done it myself. The words came out before he could stop them, but it was the truth. And Jackson knew it too. He saw it in the man's eyes. Jackson knew the violence that lived beneath Eli's skin. Why would I waste a get-out-of-jail-free card just to kill someone? Crazier things have happened. You hated Easton. You made no bones about that. Easton hated me first. He claimed I murdered his daughter. Can you blame him? Hung in the air, unspoken. The irony wasn't lost on Eli that Easton could have been the one to frame him. He wouldn't put it past the grizzled old bugger to plant evidence, to lie, to intentionally destroy Eli's life. But the geezer was dead. You're barking up the wrong tree, deputy. Under sheriff. Jackson didn't drop his gaze. He took a step forward, five feet between them, the closest they'd stood since Jackson had slapped the cuffs on him, the metal biting the skin of his wrists, fear, a bitter taste in the back of his throat. Jackson's mouth tightened. I have a dead body. I have two missing kids. It took a second for that to sink in. Lily's kids are missing, Cody and Shiloh. You think someone took them? Jackson turned the question back on him. Why would someone take them? To kill them, off-site, to dispose of the bodies elsewhere? What for? If they were witnesses to the crime? Jackson didn't speak. Eli molded over. He frowned. Or one of them is the killer. Amos had a hair-trigger temper. He'd gotten physical with Lily and Lena before. Remember that black eye Lena sported junior year? She said she walked into a door. She didn't. Jackson's expression hardened. I'll find the truth. I will hunt down whoever did this and bring them to justice, no matter who it is. I hope you do. We'll be in touch. Will we? Damn it, Eli. Jackson shook his head. For the first time, his implacable mask slipped. He ran a hand through his sandy hair until it stood on end. You 
coming back here? Why? I don't understand it. This is my home. But you... After you... Jackson's features contorted with anger and grief, with that bewildered hurt that had once skewered Eli to his soul. It did nothing to him now. His soul had died long ago. Eli stepped back onto the porch. It's time for you to leave. Jackson turned on his heel and marched toward his patrol truck. Shadows wobbled as he made his way to the driver's side door, then half turned to glance back at the house, at Eli, as if he wanted to say something. Eli didn't care what Jackson had to say. Jackson was like a dog with a bone. He did not give up or give in. He would get in the way, interfere with Eli's plans. Whether it was through this investigation of Easton or another way, he was a problem. Eli went back into the dark and silent house and shut the door behind him. He threw the deadbolt, rested the rifle against the wall, then leaned against the door. The adrenaline dump hit him. His legs went shaky as dizziness spun through him. He felt sick. The hatred of the townspeople didn't bother him, not like Jackson did. The boy he'd loved like his own family. They had been brothers in everything but blood. Eli tried to hate him, but found he couldn't. Anger, yes. Betrayal, certainly. But hatred, never. Didn't mean he wouldn't do whatever he had to do to get vengeance, no matter who tried to stop him. If it meant going head to head with his former best friend, then so be it. 15. Jackson Cross, Day 2. Jackson moved to his dresser. It had been an exhausting day. Upstairs he could hear his mother and father speaking in low tones, the creak of his sister's wheelchair. After his sister Astrid's car accident left her disabled, Jackson had moved back home to help his mother care for her. His parents were getting older. He was single. It made sense at the time. He lived in the finished basement with a kitchenette, two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a home gym. The cliffside lake house offered spectacular views of the harbor and Grand Island. The lawn was manicured. Square hedgerows lined the paver driveway. The house itself was architect designed to resemble a Lake Tahoe lodge, built of stone, cedar, and glass. Inside, reclaimed rafter beams stretched across the 20-foot-tall ceiling. Hunting trophies hung on the walls in the formal living room, dining room, and study. Mounted deer antelope, moose. Once, and only once, he'd brought Lily to the house. When she'd seen the giant ivory elephant tusks encased behind glass in his father's library, she'd smirked and said, I think he's compensating for something. It was the only time he could recall a genuine laugh at his father's expense. Mostly he felt a mix of shame and obligation in his father's imposing presence. His eyes avoided the mirror. The dresser was smooth and dust-free. His wallet and badge sat on one side. The other side was empty but for a four-by-six framed photo. Four teenagers faced the camera, grinning and hamming it up. Lily and Lena in the center, Jackson on one end, Eli on the other. They wore swimsuits. The turquoise water of the swimming hole glistened behind them, their lean, tan bodies glowing in the sunlight. Jackson with that self-conscious grin, his sandy hair tousled and sun-bleached, one arm slung across Lily's shoulder, half-turned, his gaze slanted not at the camera, but at her. Lily was his whole universe, his sun, moon, and stars. It was written across his smitten face. Lena had snuggled in next to Eli's muscled torso. His arm hugged her bare ribs, tickling her just as the photo was snapped. Those two had been inseparable through high school, destined for each other, though Amos Easton had not approved. Folks thought they'd make it, get married and have beautiful children with Eli's soulful black eyes and Lena's beaming smile. The photo had been taken the summer after graduation, before Eli left for boot camp and Lena escaped to U of M, while Lily remained behind, waitressing. Jackson had stayed in the UP to attend Michigan Technology University in Houghton, 
with plans to follow in his father's footsteps and work in law enforcement. It was a precious, glorious, perfect summer. Until Eli had slept with Lily. The spark that started the wildfire that burned their entire world to the ground. Jackson tore his gaze from the photo. The bittersweet memories flooded him each time he looked at it. A knife sliding between his ribs. He couldn't help himself. His sister Astrid had asked why he didn't throw the photo in the trash or burn it. Jackson picked up the framed photo and stared at it. He'd tried, but for some reason he never could do it. Things had been so normal then, bright and good and happy. Or perhaps Eli had never been normal, and Jackson had been willfully blind. Eli had a dark streak. Anyone close to him knew it. He was the first to hurl an insult, the first to throw himself into a bar fight. He cut school, drank too much, drove too fast, took too many risks. A propensity for violence, the forensic psychologists said afterward. Consequences had always seemed to mean little to Eli. His mother had died young. She'd shot herself in the head when he was six. That was the ugly rumor. Everyone had known it, but no one knew how to handle someone like Eli. What do you say to a hurting kid whose mom blew her own skull off? He made it easy for everyone by pushing them away first. Until he'd befriended Jackson in the third grade. They'd attended the same small school since kindergarten, but their families never socialized in the same circles. Jackson had been a shy, timid child. He was cursed with a stutter that his father's sharp disapproval and his mother's anxious coddling couldn't cure. The other kids shunned him. The teachers looked at him with pity. Only Eli didn't care. One day, three boys had encircled Jackson on the playground while the teacher was inside grading papers instead of monitoring her charges. They pushed him, taunting him, forcing him to say vulgar, forbidden words to bring out his fear, his nervousness, and his stutter. Say panties, you moron. Eli came in like a whirlwind. He'd seized handfuls of mulch and hurled it in the boys' faces. Then, without warning, He'd started punching, hitting, and kicking anybody within reach. After that day, they had become fast friends. No one picked on Jackson, or they answered to Eli. Eli was Jackson's salvation. For Eli, Jackson was the antidote to what must have been a tremendous, unmitigated loneliness. The Cross family had not approved. They were well-bred. Their ancestors had gained their wealth in copper and iron and timber for four generations. Where that wealth had disappeared to was never mentioned. Regardless, they did not fraternize with the lesser citizens of Alger County. According to Jackson's father, Eli had been a dirty Indian from a dirty Indian family, and like all Indians, he would never amount to anything. Jackson glanced at the photo again. He tried to recall who had taken the picture. James Sawyer, maybe? Or possibly Astrid? He dragged his eyes upward and met his own gaze. The face in the mirror was a stranger. He looked haggard. His eyes were shadowed. There was another reason he kept the photo. As a reminder. As penance. Ever since he could remember, he'd wanted to be an officer of the law. Put away the bad guys. Be the hero. Good and bad, black and white, there was no gray. Until there was. He had not been able to let go of Lily's death. There was little evidence. A witness deemed unreliable by the powers that be. The DA would never use the testimony. A judge would not grant a warrant. Jackson knew, in his heart, that Eli was guilty. But there was no evidence he could use, no proof. The perpetrator was going to get away with it. That he could not abide. And when he'd seen the opportunity to make it right, he'd taken it. So help him. But he had. That choice hadn't brought him the peace that he'd craved. A thousand times he'd prayed to God to absolve him. 
But God was silent. A thousand times he'd told himself he'd done the right thing, that he'd fixed an elemental wrong in the universe, that one immoral deed could correct a much greater evil. He still believed that, didn't he? Didn't he? 16. Lena Easton. Day 3. Lena lugged the last crate of supplies from the elevator of her third-story apartment and stacked it in the storage compartment of the Honda Pilot next to her go-bag. The back of the SUV and the cargo carrier were filled with supplies. She'd nicknamed the 2002 Honda Pilot the Tan Turd, since it was old, ugly, and literally falling apart. Two weeks ago, the bumper had fallen off on her way to work. She'd rescued it and taped it into place with duct tape. At least the pilot was all-wheel drive. It had its advantages. It blended in. It didn't grab attention or stand out. That was a useful trait. Almost done, she huffed to the dog. Not that you care one bit, you big oaf. Bear napped in the Honda's back seat, tongue lolling, his big furry body taking up the entire row. A few of his toys had been tossed into the footwell, his food and water in the back. She'd left the rear passenger door open until it was time to go. Hey, Ms. Easton. Lena stiffened at the sound of footsteps. She slid the crate of canned goods deeper into the back behind her duffel bag, then turned, attempting to shield her supplies with her body. Three men strolled across the parking lot of the West Shore apartment complex. They were more boys than men, still in their early twenties, with acne and spotty facial hair. She recognized two of them. The tallest one, Trevor Leonard, had dropped out of college during the pandemic and never went back. He lived with his parents. Going on a trip? Trevor asked. His expression was petulant. He looked perpetually bored. Something like that? Where are you going? His friend asked. He was shorter, heavy set, with a wisp of a goatee and skittish eyes. He kept looking down at his phone and scowling. Lena searched her brain for his name. Tyrell Jones. He and Trevor smoked weed in the stairwells and slouched around the grounds like a pair of mangy dogs. Her gaze slid to the third figure, who hung back. Josh was older, in his late twenties. Close-cut brown hair. Square jaw dusted with a five o'clock shadow at ten in the morning. She'd seen him before, lounging at a corner of the complex, watching the women, hovering over a girl as he corralled her into a stairwell and up to his apartment. Last year, rumors had swirled about a sexual assault charge. She recalled the police cruisers, the red and blue wash of lights across her bedroom window. The girl had dropped the charges and moved out, Less than a week later. Aw, man, I still can't get service, Trevor whined in a high-pitched voice. He held his phone high in the air as if searching for a signal. Not again. What the hell, man? This sucks, Josh. Josh watched her. You got service, Miss Easton? Nope. You didn't even check. She stared back at him. Unblinking. I did two minutes ago. Somewhere across the parking lot, a small dog yipped. Vehicles drove past on the road in front of the apartment complex. Staticky TVs blared from open windows. A few streets over, someone honked their horn. Everything seemed so normal. Everyone going about their regular business. It was eerie. It was easy to think you were overreacting that things would be the same tomorrow as they'd always been. I'm quite busy. Josh didn't retreat. She was almost ready to go. These hooligans were the last thing she needed. Lena had spent last night tossing and turning. Part of her had wanted to leave immediately, to drive through the night and get that much closer to her destination by dawn. But she knew herself, knew her limitations. Rest was a crucial aspect to health, especially for a diabetic. She'd learned that lesson the hard way. Besides, preparation now would pay off later. 
Last night she'd been productive. Other than her go bag that she kept in the pilot, she wasn't prepared to leave on a moment's notice. It had never been part of the plan. She'd packed toiletries and clothing in a duffel bag, then spent the rest of the evening organizing her supplies to load up in the morning. The water worked, so she filled ten one-gallon jugs she'd kept on hand for hurricane-related emergencies. Her budget was small, but over the years she'd managed to collect some useful items. The mini-fridge that would keep her insulin cold on a road trip was the most critical. This morning she'd headed to the bank, where she withdrew her limit from the ATM, and then hit the doors the second Chase opened. The teller insisted on a $1,000 limit per customer due to the ongoing system issues. Lena took the cash and ran before they closed their doors for good. Her next stop was the gas station, which was cash only. She topped off the tank, filled her four jerry cans with fuel, and purchased an up-to-date road atlas. If satellites were damaged, GPS wouldn't work. Finally, she visited several pharmacies. She stocked up on batteries, bleach, alcohol swabs, antibiotic ointment, Advil, and bandages. For her diabetes, she grabbed extra glucose meters and test strips, then added boxes of 100-pack syringes and glucose tablets. There was a quantity limit of four vials of insulin at each pharmacy, so she hopped from Walgreens to CVS to Walmart. Every pharmacy she visited was running low. People crowded the aisles more than usual. Every three months she had to get an infusion set, reservoir, and new sensors for her pump through her prescription. She could never order more, and even with insurance it cost several hundred dollars. Luckily, she'd refilled her prescription on Friday. In total, she hit eight pharmacies and procured 32 unopened vials of insulin, both long-acting and short-acting. They expired in two years. She had 24 months' worth, plus or minus, in addition to her current prescription for her pump. She wrote checks where she could and used cash where they wouldn't accept checks. By the time she'd finished, her bank account was well overdrawn. Now nearly everything was packed and ready. She just needed to get rid of these guys. Where are you going in such a hurry? Josh asked again. He outweighed her by a good hundred pounds and towered over her fit five-foot-five-inch frame. Just a weekend getaway, she said, cautious. Where? It wasn't a question. Lena raised her chin. If he was attempting to intimidate her, it wouldn't work. Savannah, she said, without missing a beat. The Weston Hotel, meeting up with a friend from college to visit Cumberland Island and see the wild horses. Lots of craziness going on right now. He circled the SUV, his hands loose at his sides, examining the vehicle, taking in the crates, the jerry cans, the jugs of water, the box of batteries, and the solar charger. He snatched the nearest cardboard box and yanked it to the edge of the storage compartment. He lifted the flaps and started rummaging inside. The box held her medic bag, which contained trauma dressings, burn gel, splints, cervical collar, gauze, and other supplies. Irritation scraped her nerves raw. What are you doing? Just looking. Don't get your panties in a wad. Behind him. Trevor and Tyrell exchanged uneasy glances. Trevor shifted awkwardly and stuffed his hands in his pockets. Hey, man, weren't we going to check out the theater? Thought we were going to catch a flick. I'm busy. He pulled out her emergency wind-up radio and solar flashlight, then tossed them back in the crate. Looks like you're packing for the apocalypse. She gave a careless shrug. Not really. Trevor and Tyrell grinned, like they wished they were somewhere else, but were clueless how to extricate themselves from the uncomfortable situation they'd found themselves in. It's just a little power outage, Josh said in a mocking tone. The internet has gone down before. Hackers and all that. It's totally normal. No reason to freak out. Yep, I'm sure you're right. Heat flushed her face her throat, 
Anxiety like spiders scrabbled over her skin. Stress raised her blood sugar, sometimes to dangerous levels. She needed to get out of here, and fast. He gave her a derisive look. You really think this is different? Those lights in the sky got you going cuckoo in the head? At least she doesn't have a mountain of toilet paper, Tyrell said. Trevor chortled nervously. Josh rolled his eyes, but kept his attention on her. You one of those crazy survivalists? Sure, I'm crazy, she said. You don't want to see my crazy come out, believe me. You guys, like, believe an EMP or something is going to destroy civilization, right? Or aliens? <laughs> Funny, you don't strike me as that type. What type is that? Lena said. She forced herself to remain calm, though she felt anything but. Crazy in the head. Tinfoil hat wearing freaks. The ones who emptied the stores of toilet paper and hand sanitizer last time. And they were wrong, weren't they? Turns out they were the fools. Lena didn't rise to the bait. Anger flared through her, but she controlled herself. She didn't say that the prepared ones weren't the ones who hoarded or emptied shelves. Also, she didn't give a flying fart what he thought. You do you, she said. That's what everyone says, right? Josh shot an amused glance back at his two cronies. She's got spunk. You have no idea. What's this? Josh leaned in, pushed aside a crate of emergency pouch meals, and dragged out the nine millimeter ammo box. Now this I can use, apocalypse or not. That's not yours. Josh grinned at Lena. Fine, fine, no problem, lady. No need to get all butt hurt. He opened the ammo box and ran his finger along the shiny rows of bullets. He whistled through his teeth. I'm going to take this. No, you aren't. You're going to give it to me, as a goodbye gift. His eyes darkened, glittering like stones underwater as he stared at her, a hungriness in his gaze that she recognized with a cold chill. Of course, I can think of a more appetizing goodbye present. Her heart clenched in her chest. It's time for you to leave. She didn't get defensive. She didn't engage in his mental games. She just wanted him gone. Now. 17. Lena Easton. Day 3. Josh leaned in close, leering, his skunky weed breath hot on her face. She could count the pores on his cheeks. He intended to intimidate her. Lena didn't cower. Still, the stress was making her shaky. Her body was cold all over. She wasn't a skilled fighter, didn't know karate, and had no superpowers. She was just a girl who'd taken self-defense classes, who went to the range to make sure she could hit what she aimed at. And she didn't entertain fools. Back off. He exhaled a sour breath into her face. Or what? It was so cliche, she laughed. Josh's eyes darkened with rage. The type of guy whose fragile ego couldn't handle female derision or rejection. His hand snaked out and seized her t-shirt. He jerked her toward him, off balance. If you think you're gonna... Bear? Lena yelled. An ear-shattering bark split the morning air. Bear lurched from the back seat landed with a scrabble of nails on asphalt, and hurtled to the rear of the SUV. Whoa! Tyrell took three jerky steps backward. He flung up his hands, still holding his phone. Trevor froze in place, startled. Still holding Lena's shirt, Josh gaped at the huge dog. Bear was no attack dog. He wanted to rescue everyone and everything, from baby ducklings to doddering old men. Every ounce of him was built to love. But they didn't know that. 
Bear, attack. In the second that Josh hesitated, Lena lunged, brought her knee up, and kneed him in the groin. Josh gave a pained, oof. She tore free of his grip. Shaky and weak, sheer adrenaline kept her on her feet. She shoved her hand into her pocket and jerked out the pilot's keys. Her fingers closed over the cylindrical object attached to the key ring. Josh half straightened, clutching his groin with one hand. He charged her. Lena aimed, depressed the trigger, and shot pepper spray directly into his face. With a scream, Josh fell backward, tripped, and landed hard on his butt. He dropped the box of ammo. Rounds rolled across the pavement. His eyes squeezed shut, fiery tears leaking out as the mucous membranes of his respiratory tract swelled, causing immense pain, possibly even temporary blindness. You stupid whore! Leave now, before I sick my dog on you for real. Trevor had had enough. He spun on his heels and strode across the parking lot, shoulders hunched, shaking his head. Tyrell quickly followed. Bear barked at Josh. A deep, rumbling bass that vibrated in her chest hurt her ears. His huge, furry body made him look like a pony with teeth. Across the parking lot in front of Building C, a car alarm went off. A door slammed and someone cursed. Shut that damn dog up! Lena glared down at Josh. Am I shutting up the dog? Or are we bringing in the neighbors? Or how about another squirt of tear gas? It worked so well the first time. Josh clambered unceremoniously to his feet, one hand clutching his injured nether regions, the other clawing at his streaming eyes. He shrieked curses and insults between moans of agony. Bear pressed against her thigh, growling. She nodded one hand in his thick fur and steadied herself, taking great satisfaction in Josh's hunched form as he slunk away. She'd made an enemy. If she were staying, that would be a problem. Good job, Bear. You did great. Her legs wobbled as she retrieved the box of ammo and the loose ammunition, then reached up and shut the lift gate. She locked the SUV. One more load, buddy. Then we're off, I promise. We can't leave without the most important thing. Bear followed her back into the apartment. She was weak and shaky all over. Sensing her distress, he kept close, nearly bowling her over as she entered the stairwell and took the metal stairs, gripping the railing for support. After locking the apartment door behind her, she crossed the tiny living room and leaned against the counter, gasping. She managed to slump onto the counter stool and checked her pump. Her number was 250, way too high. She bolused herself and waited impatiently for the shot of insulin to do its job. Her M&P 9 Shield Easy pistol lay on the counter. Though she had her concealed carry license, she'd left the gun inside her apartment. Utterly useless when she needed it. She wouldn't make that mistake again. Maybe Bear would defend her or maybe he'd try to lick the bad guys to death. She wasn't leaving it up to chance. Lena holstered the firearm. She liked the natural grip, the crisp trigger, and the easy-to-load eight-round magazine chambered in nine millimeter. It was simple to rack the slide, which was important when her blood sugar crashed or spiked, making her weak. She patted Bear's head. This baby sticks with me from here on out. Bear whuffed his agreement. With her blood sugar dialed in, she took a quick second to assess the apartment. The pantry and her closet, where she stored extra supplies, had been emptied out. Everything that didn't fit in the tan turd was stored in the roof rack cargo carrier. Lastly, Lena opened the fridge and pulled out the precious insulin vials. It suddenly seemed so little, paltry in the face of what was coming apprehension torqued through her. When you lived with a chronic illness, with a pancreas that didn't work, how prepared could you be? For a type 1 diabetic, it wasn't about eating healthy or counting carbs. Without insulin, she would die. And when it ran out, what then? 
she hated that she didn't know. Insulin was nearly impossible to manufacture on one's own, and it was dangerous to take once it had expired. Who knew how difficult it would be to procure insulin in a few months? Maybe FEMA would keep pharmacies stocked with essentials, but she wouldn't bet her life on it. Bear let out a wolf, his tail wagging. He nosed the fridge shelf like he was looking for one of his treats, which she'd already packed. We'll figure it out, buddy, she said. Her voice echoed in the too quiet apartment. We've got no choice. 18. Eli Pope. Day 3. Eli wiped sweat from his brow as he crested yet another hill, legs pumping as he rode the mountain bike along the weedy, overgrown bike trail. Even with the moleskin, his heels were blistered from hiking boots he hadn't worn in years. The ground fell away, and before him, Lake Superior stretched wide and glassy beyond the rocky beach. The view was spectacular. The great lake, pristine and wave-ruffled, the hills and distant cliffs jutting from the emerald water, the towering white pines, the sun-bleached rock. He and Jackson had spent hot summers out here in the wild, hiking, swimming, hunting, swigging stolen beer. They'd brought the girls, too, but sometimes it was just the two of them. It was an unspoken thing. This place was for them, for brothers. He closed his eyes and was transported back in time, Twelve years old, bare skin beaded with lake water, lying propped on a sun-baked slab of rock, on his elbows, next to his best friend, gulping warm beer. Their first drink? For both of them. Jackson had stolen it from his father's liquor cabinet. Jackson had spat his first sip out, startled at the sour bitterness. But Eli had taken to it from the beginning and never stopped with his culture torn away, with a childhood of trauma and despair. He had taken to addiction naturally. It was the only thing that numbed the pain. Eli shook the memory from his head. He dismounted the bike and wheeled it off the trail, making his way down the slope to the sparkling river that fed into the lake a half mile north. Occasional hikers took the trail less than a half mile from here, or they hiked up the river from the wooden pedestrian bridge a mile downriver. But rarely did a human being pass through this spot. It was a good spot, protected by the worst of the elements by the limestone bluff that rose thirty feet behind him, a flat spot between the rock face and a massive boulder the size of a car gave him further protection from the elements and prying eyes. The river provided both fish and fresh water. He had water purification tablets, and he could boil water with the fire, or his biolite camping stove using kindling. It would also charge phones. Not that he had one. A half mile northwest, Lake Superior stretched out for 350 miles, emerald green and clear as glass, or gray and storm-tossed, depending on her temperament. A narrow rocky cove provided privacy, as well as good fishing. He had the AK-47, plus a twenty-two rifle he'd retrieved from his buried cache. Deer, rabbits, coyotes, and wild turkey were plentiful. He wouldn't starve. Years ago, he had buried two caches a half mile from his father's house, just in case, but had only looted one. It was a simple five-gallon bucket sealed with a gamma lid that made it water and air tight, then wrapped in an industrial trash bag. In addition to the twenty-two, he'd stored boxes of nine millimeter, twenty-two, and seven six two by thirty-nine ammo, a change of clothes, bottled water and protein bars, a tarp and rope, chem lights, emergency space blankets, water purification tablets, and a first aid kit. He still fit in his clothes. The food was expired, but he ate a bar anyway. It tasted fine. After clearing the site of twigs, pine cones, and other debris, he erected the tent in the middle of the clearing. Then he created a second shelter parallel to the boulder, a lean-to fortification with a firing pit. 
He topped the shelter with a space blanket covered with branches and leaves to disguise the shelter. He placed his bivy sack inside. This was where he'd sleep. He stood back and examined his work. He could watch the tent in case someone attempted to sneak up on him. The lean-to shelter gave him a good killing field from cover and provided an avenue of escape if needed. The space blanket would go far to defeat infrared. The camouflage of branches and leaves made it look like part of the woods to anyone looking through a night vision scope. Next, he dug a Dakota fire hole with his shovel. Squatting, using his ferro rod and a fire starter he'd fashioned from cotton balls and petroleum jelly, he started a fire, adding small bits of twigs he'd collected for kindling. Gradually, he added thicker branches until the fire burned hot. He closed his eyes and thought of her. Not the dead girl who haunted him, but her sister, Lena Easton, the girl who visited both his dreams and his nightmares. Where was she now? What was she doing? Did she ever think of him? He hadn't seen her since that last night in the middle of the trial, when he realized the town was turning against her for defending him, the risk greater to her than to himself. He'd told her to leave to shut the door on him and never look back. He did not regret it, and yet he missed her every second of every day. Her absence created a hole in his chest he'd never be able to fill. He'd made mistakes, terrible ones. Lena Easton had never been one of them. Hunger gnawed at his belly. He planned to heat some beans, then fish Lake Superior for lunch. A great heaviness overtook him. Exhaustion pulled at his bones, but he couldn't rest yet. He needed to find out who had hated him enough to frame him for murder, and he wouldn't get those answers hiding out in the woods. But he knew who to talk to, who to ask. If anyone knew something, it would be James Sawyer. He had his finger on the pulse of this town. The distant rumble of an ATV broke the stillness. A cardinal exploded from a hemlock branch above his head, red feathers bursting into flight. Eli stilled, listening. In the distance, to the south, a twig cracked. Something was out there. Swiftly, Eli drew his VP-9 and retreated behind the boulder. Half crouched, he exited the campsite entered the tree line, and bladed his body next to the enormous trunk of a white pine, which offered both cover and concealment. He checked his pistol. A round was chambered. He held it low and waited, silent and listening, ears strained. Birds trilled in the underbrush. A squirrel darted along the branch of the cottonwood above his head. Deep in the woods to his right, something large ambled along a deer path. A fox, probably. Maybe a bobcat. Earlier, he'd seen the scat of deer and hare. A minute later came the rustle of leaves underfoot. A step, a long hesitation, and then another. His senses heightened, muscles tensing. It was a someone, not a something. Someone was creeping up on him. No hunter or soldier, but far quieter than most idiots stomping through the woods. He recalled how Jackson used to try to sneak up on him and pelt him with a pebble, an acorn, or a pine cone. It never worked. Eli always heard him. Always. Eli had been the one who snuck up behind Jackson and tossed the acorn at his head. It wasn't Jackson, though. Jackson was bigger, heavier, louder. This creature was small and stealthy. I know you're there, a young voice called out. Eli didn't move. Come out like a man, she ordered. He laughed. The sound startled him. It was the first time he'd laughed in a great many years. You first. He kept his breathing steady, his limbs loose and easy hidden behind the trunk, ready to spring into action. He eased to the right to a few degrees so he was still protected, but could see his adversary. A girl stepped out of the underbrush, appearing between the thickening shadows spreading across the pine-needled earth. 
She held a crossbow against her shoulder, a fiberglass bolt cocked and aimed at the tree he crouched behind. She stared straight at him. You do anything I don't like, and I'll fire this thing. He sucked in a breath. The effect she had on him was instant and profound. It was like being punched in the solar plexus. She wore hiking boots and oversized overalls over a long-sleeved purple shirt. Her raven black hair in a messy braid slung over her shoulder. Suspicious black eyes like two bits of coal glared from an elfin face, her chin narrow and pointed. Thin and wiry, she was strong, judging by how she handled that crossbow. Steady as a rock, no tremble in her hands. The girl was both Lily and not Lily. The spitting image of her dead mother, but smaller, darker, fiercer. I'll shoot you, she warned. He believed her. The crossbow's butt stock was nestled snug against her shoulder, her cheek pressed to the stock so that her dominant eye was in line with the sight. Her trigger hand held the grip, her index finger balanced on the trigger itself. He was protected behind the tree, but this girl knew what she was doing. You don't want to do that. I'll decide what I want, she shot back. Ten yards away she stood with her feet shoulder width apart, back straight, shoulders square to Eli's position. Don't frickin' move. How did you get here? Walked? The ATV. That was you. That's none of your damn beeswax. How did you find this place? Her lip curled. It's a free country. The irony didn't escape him. He'd used the exact same cliched phrase last night. This isn't exactly a public beach, she shrugged. Not many people know of this place. She stared at him, or what she could see of him. How'd you find it, he repeated. I just did. Jackson must have brought her here. Could have been Sawyer, but Sawyer would have no reason to bring this kid here. Possibly Lena. The thought made his chest go tight, but he swiftly dismissed the thought. Not Lena. She was long gone. Jackson was the kind one, the thoughtful one, the one who would check in on Lily's children, who would adopt them as a generous and benevolent uncle, taking care to show them the wild places where they'd shared so much as kids, as teens, as young adults. Where Lily had truly been herself as nowhere else. Of course it was Jackson. Shiloh scowled. I can be here, same as you. No rules against it, nothing you can do to stop me. You're the one with the bolt aimed at my chest, Shiloh. She went absolutely still, like a wild thing caught in the crosshairs, her eyes big as quarters. How do you know my name? Same as you know mine. She pondered that for a moment. Her gaze never left his, her index finger still on that trigger. You're Eli Pope, the broken heart killer. You murdered my mother. Something caught in his chest. Those words, spoken so cavalierly, so matter-of-factly, from the child whose world had been destroyed by that terrible act. You remember me. Seen your picture on enough news shows. The last time he'd seen her, she'd been a chubby, dark-haired five-year-old, a dervish of frenetic energy. The older one, the tow-headed boy, He'd been the sober, serious one. Even at six, he'd sat calmly at the kitchen table and colored while tiny Shiloh had scaled the cabinets, opened the freezer, and consumed four chocolate popsicles while Lily and Eli had coffee on the porch. My little wild thing, Lily had said with a laugh. He reached back in his memories. That had been two days before the murder. He'd come home to check on his father's deteriorating Alzheimer's for a week before departing on another undisclosed mission to Iraq. It had been years since Lena had broken up with him and moved down to Tampa. He was lonely. He had taken comfort in Lily, as Lily had taken comfort in him. It was always casual, at least on his part. 
Lily had a way of dominating every room she was in, of pulling you into her orbit, whether you'd intended to enter or not. It was a rare man who could deny himself Lily Easton's tumultuous and addictive affection when she chose to give it. Eli had never met the man who could have denied her. He said to Shiloh, I didn't kill your mother. Eli didn't know why he spoke the words. He didn't know this child anything. And yet, with her dark, wary eyes on him, sharp and penetrating and fearless, he could not look away. The girl sniffed. Easy enough to lie. Everybody lies. I'm not lying. Her eyes narrowed. You can't prove it. No, I can't. That's why I spent eight years in prison. Not everyone who goes to prison is guilty. Most of them, maybe. They had evidence, that beer bottle with your prints on it and my mom's blood. It was planted. Someone wanted me to go down for a crime I didn't commit. And I did. She grunted, noncommittal. He didn't blame her, not one bit. He was surprised she was still here, astounded that she hadn't squeezed the trigger and tried to kill him. He should disarm her. It was the smart play. Anyone who dared hold a weapon on him would have been mortally injured by this point. His fingers tightened on the grip of the pistol. But something held him back. He did not act. Not yet. 19. Eli Pope. Day 3. Eli found himself fascinated by Shiloh. She looked so much like Lily, but Lena was in her too. In the way she tilted her head to the side while she appraised him, the frank expression in her elfin face, those sharp, assessing eyes. Once upon a time, Lena had looked at him like that, like she could see straight through him, like she already knew his thoughts before he did. His mind flooded with memories too painful to bear. The scent of her hair, her smile, how her eyes crinkled when she laughed. His gut nodded. His past was lost to him, his future stolen. Shiloh took a single step into the clearing. If I killed you, I bet I'd get away with it. Maybe you would. Maybe I should do it. I think you'd regret it. I'm not scared to kill nobody. He had the unsettling sense that if you came at this girl with a knife, she'd come back at you with a cannon. Okay, he said. I believe you. I'd do it if I had to, if I needed to. Do you need to? She hesitated at that. A line appeared between her brows as she wrinkled her nose. Instead of answering, she changed the subject. My grandpa is dead. I heard that. You kill him? No. Why should I believe you? I'll tell you the same thing I told Deputy Cross. I was in a concrete cell that smells like piss and despair. She took that in. You talked to Jackson. He's looking for you. Shiloh took another careful step forward. Her boots crunched dead leaves. She kept the crossbow in place, kept her focus. Someone took my brother. Same person who killed your grandfather? Yeah, she hesitated. I think so. You weren't there? Nope. She said it too quickly. Probably a lie, though her expression didn't change, her eyes just as fierce. But I'm gonna find out who did it. Good luck to you. If it was you, I'll kill you. It wasn't me. Shiloh said nothing for a long moment. He could see the cogs turning inside her head, thoughts flitting behind her eyes. Her finger massaged the trigger. He considered drawing his knife and throwing it at her. He could knock that damn crossbow out of the way before she could react and squeeze the trigger. The point of the blade would pierce the soft tissue of her throat. She wouldn't have a chance. Again, he stayed his hand. He didn't want to harm her or embarrass her either. Maybe it was the Wendigo. She blinked. Doubt moved across her face, then vanished. I don't believe in that crap. But you know it. 
she nodded. In Ojibwe legend, the Wendigo was a malevolent, flesh-eating spirit that roamed the deep woods, hunting humans to consume them, body and soul. She had Ojibwe blood in her veins. It was in the slant of her face, her coal-black eyes, her tan skin. But more than that, it was in the way she moved, the sharpness of her gaze. Lily had told him that Shiloh's father was a security guard at Kuwaitan Casino in Sault Ste. Marie, a gambling man with no interest in children. He had always suspected that it was Gideon Crawford, whose mother was Ojibwe. But Lily had taken many lovers. A rich sailor who docked his sailboat in the harbor for a weekend, or a passing musician she'd visited in Ann Arbor. It was a flesh and blood monster, Shiloh said with conviction. No make believe thing. I agree. A turmoil of emotions warred across her knife thin face doubt and confusion, mistrust and uncertainty. But not fear. Whatever she was, she was not afraid much as she should be. She didn't speak for a moment. Her nose wrinkled, eyes narrowed, as she figured out her next move, probably deciding whether to shoot him or not before she moved on to the next item on her list. Shiloh took another step closer, balancing at the edge of the clearing, wary as a fox, small but dangerous, brave and fierce. The fire in her eyes, how bright she burned, he respected that. She took her eyes off his concealed position behind the white pine for the first time, let her gaze drift around the campsite, taking in the biolite stove, the solar kettle, the flames flickering from the hole in the ground. Her eyes darted back to him. You're gonna live out here. It wasn't a question. She was smart, quick on her feet, observant. Yes. Why? because I want to. That's not a reason. Because he'd been driven out of his father's home, out of his hometown. But that wasn't entirely true, was it? He'd already planned to leave. He'd always been at home in the woods. Where most soldiers endured seer training, survival, evasion, resistance, escape, he'd relished it. He felt a connection to the land that white people didn't feel, could never feel. His past had branded him, scarred him. Not just prison, but his years as a spec ops soldier. The fighting, the killing, the dead. Out here, life was simple. It was about survival, man and nature. Out here, he could forget who he was, who he'd become. All the endless open space, the lonely hills and stoic trees, the rocky bluffs and sun-dappled green the bottomless deep of Lake Superior. This was the antithesis of prison. This was freedom. He couldn't explain it, how it made him feel, how his pulse beat stronger, his soul lighter. He felt it, deep in his bones. It was in his blood. The silence brought peace. He needed this. For as long as it took, he needed it. He wouldn't let anyone take it away from him. Our people belonged to these lands for thousands of years. This is our home. The girl nodded like she understood. Gradually, she drifted closer, slowly circling him. He moved with her, keeping the tree between them. She gestured at him with her chin. Put the gun down. Lower that crossbow. She balked. Trust goes both ways. You first. Eli hesitated. With any other adversary, he would never even consider such a thought. And yet he obeyed. He moved out just enough that she could see him holster his pistol. He waited, tense, ready to draw it quickly if needed, ready to retreat to full cover behind the tree trunk. His act of surrender had the desired effect. The crossbow relaxed in her hands, the bolt drifting lower. Her index finger slid off the trigger. She took another step closer, wary and watchful, but curious. Her curiosity got the better of her. She lowered the crossbow as her gaze flicked to the fire. How come you made the fire in a hole like that? It's called a Dakota fire hole. 
It's designed to provide heat and a cooking source without revealing your location with too much smoke. How'd you make it? I'll show you, if you put down the crossbow. No way. He shrugged. Then I'm not coming out. She hesitated, vacillating between curiosity and wariness. You can keep it right next to you. It's there if you need it. I won't come near you. Finally, she made up her mind and placed the crossbow on the ground next to her feet. She crouched as she watched him, ready to flee or attack at a moment's notice. Eli moved out from the trees into the campsite. He knelt and stirred the coals at the bottom of the hole. With half his attention on her hands and the crossbow, he showed her how he'd dug the fire pit with an army-style folding shovel. He'd dug two holes in the ground, the first about a foot in diameter and a foot deep. The second was about six inches wide and dug at an angle with a tunnel that connected the two holes that served as a chimney. Eli had packed twigs and kindling into the bottom of the larger hole, then layered small logs on top. He showed her how he lit it with a ferro rod. The size of a pen, the fire steel didn't rely on fuel, could get wet, and could start a thousand fires before it ran out. Eli demonstrated, striking the rod with a hard striker, moving it swiftly across the ferro rod to produce sparks that caught the tinder and swelled into flickering flames. The fire burns from the top down and draws a steady draft of air from the smaller chimney hole, so it achieves near-complete combustion. The result is a strong, bright fire that burns efficiently, uses less firewood, produces little smoke, and conceals the flames from potential threats, especially at night. It provides warmth, and you can cook off it, too. He pointed to a grate of green sticks that he'd woven with fishing wire and could place across the top of the hole. It would hold a pot or frying pan. She listened, seemingly fascinated, her bottom lip protruding in focused concentration. How do you know how to do all this stuff? The army. Also, I'm Ojibwe. We learn how to live with the land instead of against it. You didn't live on the reservation. I have family who do, an aunt, my grandparents before they passed away. I spent a few summers there. She nodded, still staring in awe at the fire. You won't miss electricity? Cell phones and iPads? Xbox? The internet? No, I don't. People would be a lot happier without some of those things. I like flushing toilets. He snorted. Something flickered across her sharp features a hint of pleasure, of self-satisfaction, then disappeared, replaced by that hard, focused gaze, her finger on the crossbow trigger. He watched her, how still she was, coiled and tense with an urgent energy, like she might bound away at any moment. You want something to eat? She didn't answer, but watched him hungrily. I'm just going for my pack, no sudden moves. He reached for the rucksack he'd placed at the base of the cottonwood. Opening the front zipper, he pulled out one of the protein bars he'd collected from his cache. He held it out to her. Shiloh stared at it like it was a snake about to bite her. It's wrapped. It's not poisoned. She didn't move. It's chocolate. Her eyes darkened. He shrugged. Suit yourself. I don't need no charity. Not charity, it's in thanks for not skewering me like teriyaki chicken. She thought about that. He tossed it at her feet. Startled, she grabbed the crossbow and retreated three steps, almost tripping on a log. The crossbow lifted for half a second. Then she thought better of it and dropped it to her side. Ducking into a crouch, she snatched the bar and slipped it into her overalls pocket. A second later, she was on her feet again, backpedaling, the crossbow held low but ready. Shiloh scowled. Don't you dare follow me. I won't. I'm warning you. Wouldn't dream of it. You could if you wanted to. Someone must have told her. Or maybe it was one of the semi-salacious factoids included in the tell-alls and news specials. They'd described him as an inscrutable Native American 
murderer. Dealer in spirits, rain dances, and powwows. A supernatural tracker with bird feathers in his hair and war paint on his bronze-skinned face. She could have heard it from anywhere. Don't give me a reason to. She pursed her lips, considering, then nodded. Spinning on her heels, she turned abruptly and darted across the clearing, headed for the dark space between two spruce trees. The girl retreated into the woods on light feet. Even in hiking boots, she hardly made a sound. A crushed leaf here, a broken twig there. She was a natural. A little training, and she'd move almost invisibly, like he did. As he tended the fire and cooked his dinner, he couldn't get her out of his thoughts. This half-feral creature that appeared out of the forest. This girl with the haunted eyes. Hungry as a stray dog, fierce as a wolverine. That terrible night, she'd lost more than he had. Maybe that was it. She reminded him so much of them, of Lily and Lena, the only women he'd ever cared about. Shiloh should have hated him, but she didn't. She should have tried to kill him. She hadn't. He couldn't explain it, this strange light feeling in his chest, like he could breathe deeply for the first time. Eli wanted her to come back. He hoped that she would. 20. Jackson Cross. Day 3. That morning, Jackson and Devin met the medical examiner at the Munising Hospital morgue, which they used to store bodies under a contract with the county. The room was cold and sterile. When they arrived, Dr. Vertanen was bent over the corpse which lay on a gurney in the center of the room, a tray of medical instruments beside her. She straightened and looked them over without smiling. She wore gloves, sleeves, booties, and an apron. Goggles were perched on her head. She walked them through the autopsy she'd conducted so far. Amos Easton was 69 years old and weighed 190 pounds. Positive identification was established matching pre-mortem dental records. The manner of death was homicide. The cause of death is exsanguination due to external hemorrhage. The tire iron was indeed the murder weapon. The lab had matched Easton's DNA. Dr. Vertanen pointed to the cranial area. The skull was so deformed that Jackson had difficulty imagining a human face had ever existed. See these fractures here? The blows fractured the maxilla, the upper jawbone, here and here, as well as a left orbital rim fracture. The perp had swung at the victim's head five times. The first two blows came from an upward slanting angle that suggested the assailant was shorter than Easton's 6'3 frame and right-handed. Bile churned in his stomach, but he couldn't look away. The sterile smell of antiseptic stung his nostrils. Because the corpse was found and refrigerated within 24 hours, at least the decomposition stench was minimal. How much force would be required to land blows like this? Jackson asked. A lot. A grown man? A teenage boy? Dr. Vertana nodded, thoughtful. Could be a teenage boy. How about a teenage girl? Devin asked. Jackson shot her a look. Devin shrugged. No reason to be sexist. It's within the realm of possibility, the Emmy said. But unlikely. Takes a lot of hatred to smash in someone's head until they're hardly recognizable as human, Devin said dryly. Dr. Vertanen pointed to an evidence envelope on the counter. I've collected fingernail scrapings clippings, and removed debris from the victim's hair. Thank you. Jackson took the envelope, checked that it was sealed, then signed the chain of custody log on the back. Was the victim under the influence when he died? Devin asked. Don't expect the toxicology report any time soon, Dr. Vertanen said. As you know, it takes months when things are normal. With these strange power outages, who knows? The system's been down since Monday night. 
I won't be able to release the final autopsy until I have the tox report in hand. Dr. Vertanen gestured at the striker saw sitting on the counter next to the sink. A pair of pruning loppers for cutting ribs lay next to it. I'm about to open up the cranial cap. Time to put on safety goggles and full PPE gear. The rest of the autopsy took three hours. The medical examiner used a foot pedal to control the start and stop of her audio recorder. As she worked her way through the autopsy, she spoke aloud, mentioning everything she did, including specific measurements of internal organs. Devin took photos so they didn't have to wait for them from the M.E., but they didn't learn anything new that was relevant to the case. After the autopsy, they drove to the sheriff's office, logged in the evidence, then headed to the Dog Patch restaurant across the street from the Munising precinct. They ordered the U.P.'s famous pasties, beef and root veggies folded into a pastry shell and baked until juicy and tender. The pasty was pronounced with a soft A, like pass, and had been invented as portable meals for Cornish miners in the mid-19th century. Devon looked down at her food for a moment, as if debating whether she still had an appetite. Then she shrugged, picked up her pasty, and shoved a huge bite in her mouth. She chewed loudly. Mmm. Jackson didn't touch his plate. Much as he loved pasties, his stomach churned. He couldn't get Easton's mashed-in face out of his head. He'd known the man for his entire life, disliked him for that long, but no one deserved to die like that. You're a sensitive soul, aren't you? Devin asked as she swallowed another mouthful. I knew him. I know everyone here. Devin shot him a sympathetic glance. He hated that look. Nothing much worse than pity. She cleared her throat. When I was a beat cop in Detroit, I got the domestic calls, the battered women, beaten halfway to Sunday, screaming for help. But you know what? They always went back the next day like a dog to its vomit. A memory from long ago flitted into his mind. He pushed it away. It's usually more complicated than that. You get immune to it after a while. You don't have a choice. She took another bite, looked out the window at the marina, the placid bay. Her voice dropped. The kids, though. He saw it then, a shadow flickering behind her eyes, that haunted look. Things had been hard for her. He hadn't asked why she'd left Detroit and come all the way up here, to the middle of nowhere. There was something closed in her expression. She was tough, and she needed him to believe that she was tough. Vulnerability could be seen as weakness, especially for a female officer. She'd tell him when she was good and ready. I know what you mean, he said, about the kids. He'd long suspected that Easton had occasionally smacked his girls around when he was drunk. They had never admitted it, but there had been bruises, that darkness in their eyes. He'd wondered about Cody and Shiloh, too, but he'd never made the call. Maybe he should have. Jackson pushed around his potatoes. They'd canvassed neighborhoods, checked with the local businesses, and put out bolos. There was no sign of her or Cody. He'd barely slept last night, tossing and turning, imagining her somewhere out in the Hiawatha National Forest, cold and alone and scared. What's next? Devin asked, after swallowing an enormous bite of the handheld meat pie. She licked her lips. I could have another one right now. These are so, so good. The best part of the UP. The school, he said. We need to track down Cody's whereabouts, who his friends are, where he might hole up if he got himself into trouble. We can ask about Shiloh, too, but be careful. We don't want to let any potential suspects know that she's a witness. The perp might not have seen her. Sounds like you don't think they're together. I don't think anything yet. I go where the evidence takes me. Devin smirked. Said every TV detective hack ever. Mock me, but it's true. He pushed back his plate. Even the sight of food made him sick. Devin looked at her phone with a forlorn expression. 
The last three days of rolling power outages had made her grumpy. She flashed him the latest feed on her Instagram. Look, service again. The world is restored. She scrolled through photo after photo of the auroras. Jackson glanced at a few of the comments. Hashtag nature's 4th of July. Hashtag I'd rather have a hot shower. Look at this one. It was a striking photo of Lake Superior, probably taken from Grand Island. The undulating waves of the aurora reflected off the water in a near-perfect double image. The hashtag read, Hashtag, the world ends not with a bang, but with a beautiful whimper. The blood drained from his face. He read the words, reread them, felt them echo somewhere deep in his soul. It seemed like half the news agencies were reporting on the blackouts, long lines at gas stations, and the potential damage to low-Earth satellites. The other half made jokes about telegrams catching on fire. He hadn't had time to check his supplies in the basement or even visit a grocery store. He wanted to make a trip to Marquette just to be safe. The largest town in the UP, Marquette boasted a Target and Walmart and a couple of camping stores. There was too much to do. A homicide to solve and missing kids to find. He had a habit of putting aside his own needs, working himself to the bone to solve a case. But the cases never ended. There was always someone who needed saving. He pushed his chair back and stood, waving down the waitress for the check, which he and Devin split. Devin followed his lead. Back to work we go. They walked a block in the cool May sunshine to where they'd parked the patrol truck across from the marina. Jackson looked across the bay toward Grand Island, the lush green island and recreational area located a half mile north of the harbor. The harbor itself was smooth, the water a rich emerald green. The sky was a rich blue, with no hint of the aurora that would be back in force again tonight. Devin opened the driver's side door. Shall I drive? Until you've earned your stripes, I drive. She smirked at him, but moved out of the way. After you, boss. 21. Jackson Cross, Day 3. The Munising Middle High School shared a campus and was conveniently located right on the bay off M28. There were few cars in the parking lot, a couple of sedans, a rusted red Toyota Tacoma, a metallic blue F-150, and a dirt-crusted white Jeep Wrangler in clear need of a wash. I bet they got the day off of school, Devin said enviously. Jerks. Jackson's lip twitched as he pulled into the familiar parking lot. So many memories here. Some good, some awful. An image of his older brother Garrett flitted through his mind. Garrett had been a quarterback and golden boy, but he'd spiraled into drugs and addiction, bad choices, and then worse ones. After an arrest for dealing his sophomore year of college at MSU, he'd been kicked off the football team, expelled from school, and returned home in shame. A week after a particularly vicious fight with their father, Garrett had left one summer day and never returned. Two months later, he'd sent a postcard from Mackinac Island. Then a month later, from Saginaw Bay on Lake Huron, a fisherman's paradise. He'd gotten a job. He was happy. Leave him alone. And then nothing. Not a birthday phone call, not a visit, not a Christmas card. Deep down, Jackson couldn't blame him. They hadn't been close and families could be difficult, especially his. While Garrett had been the black sheep, Jackson had felt pulled toward the other extreme. He had played the peacemaker, as if one wrong move might send his family spiraling into disaster. He followed the rules, believed in the rules. The rules held everything together, even if by only the thinnest filament. You planning to sit in there all day? Devin asked. She was already out of the truck. Old memories. Sorry. You went here, didn't you? Not many people live in the same place from cradle to the grave, you know. 
I'm not dead yet. There's still time. She rolled her eyes. Right. Jackson climbed out of the truck, shut the door, and pocketed the keys. He felt heavy. The bitter memories weighed him down. They weren't the worst ones. He thought of Lily, how her effervescent laugh had made him smile, no matter what happened at home. Or how Eli's wry grin reminded him that his friends had his back. He missed that simplicity. How black and white things had been, good and bad, right and wrong. Before the betrayals, before the hurt and the jealousies, before it all fell apart around them. Jackson Cross, it's good to see you. A tall, broad-shouldered man approached them before they reached the front doors. He was dressed in pressed khaki slacks and a black button-up dress shirt. Fit and trim, he was in his late forties, with salt and pepper hair, a kind face, and firm handshake. David Kepford had been the principal for ten years. He was a fixture in the community. A downstater from Grand Rapids, he wasn't a true youper. Some people cared about that sort of thing here. How's the fly fishing, he asked. Jackson smiled grimly. Never enough time. The job has a tendency to come first, second, and last. Don't I know it? We'd like to talk to you about the Easton kids, Devin said. David's expression turned sympathetic. In a small town, news traveled quickly. It's a tragedy, what those kids have been through. I understand that they're missing. Any information you can give us in this regard would be greatly appreciated, Devin said. As you can imagine, we had to cancel school for the week. No power, and we don't have a generator. David gave a rueful shrug. Budget cuts. Anyway, most of the teachers are at home, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. It's a beautiful day. Why don't we walk and talk? Jackson and Devin fell into step on either side of the principal. David Kepford carried himself like a soldier, back straight, shoulders square, his stride long and confident. Jackson recalled something about a military stint in Afghanistan years ago. Devin took out her notebook and flipped it open. How was Cody's behavior in the last few days? Anything unusual leading up to the homicide? Cody wasn't at school on Monday, but that's not unusual for him. I do recall seeing Shiloh standing alone by the bike racks after school. What can you tell us about him? Devin asked. Cody is smart, but he doesn't apply himself. He's quiet, serious. He's always sketching in a notebook. Truancy is a real problem. I checked. He missed 26 days over the last school year. He ever talk about what things are like at home? Jackson asked. Not that I can recall. How about things you or other teachers observed? Jackson asked. Cuts or bruises. Unusual behavior. Those kids always have bruises. Shiloh climbs trees falls off boulders, running around those 200 acres like she owns it. Cody, not really. He's pale, doesn't get enough sun. But there's never been anything obvious, nothing actionable. Jackson nodded. Even hammered, Easton had still been smart. If he had hurt his grandchildren, he wouldn't leave obvious bruises. It's more a feeling that haunted look they both have. But then, they've experienced trauma from the brutal loss of their mother. Maybe it's that. Maybe, Jackson echoed. Any friends we can talk to? Devin asked. Cody is a loner. Sits by himself, eats by himself. Never participates in sports or after-school programs. Except Lego robotics. He did get into that this year. I don't think anyone really knows him, other than Shiloh. They reached the field behind the school. David halted before a fresh white line. Across the field, a figure bent over the grass with a can of spray paint. Two soccer goals stood on either end. The grass was too high, like it needed a haircut. The man straightened and waved at them. He wore oversized denim overalls and scuffed brown work boots. 
white paint splattered his hairy forearms. Who's that? Devon asked. Calvin Fitch, the janitor. He does whatever odd jobs we need done around here. We'd like to talk to him, Devon asked. The principal waved the janitor over. Jackson and Devon waited. The sun shone bright overhead. A raft of white clouds drifted above the trees. The temperature was a pleasant 65 degrees, no wind, but rain was in the forecast. And another solar storm. When Fitch reached them, they politely excused themselves to speak to him privately. Whenever possible, they interviewed potential witnesses alone. What can I do you for? Fitch still carried the can of spray paint. He was overweight, with slouching shoulders and lanky, dun-colored hair. We'd like to ask you about Cody and Shiloh Easton, Jackson said. Who? Fitch's eyes clouded, then cleared. Oh, yeah, I know them. Don't talk to the girl much. I've seen the boy around after school sometimes. Where, exactly? Devin asked. He stared at them, his eyes squinty in a wide, plain face. Out near the field? Meeting with other kids? Meeting them, like for what? Devin asked. Fitch gave an exaggerated shrug. Just telling you what I see. They talk like I'm not around, like they don't see me. But I hear things. Can you give us specifics? Jackson asked. If they want something, for a party, you know, they say to talk to Cody. Something like what? Devin prodded. You know, pills, uppers, downers, that sort of thing. Drugs, Jackson said flatly. He pushed down a wave of anger. Kids stealing drugs in middle school? What the hell? Drugs in Munising, usually traced back to one place. James Sawyer. Fitch shrugged again. His expression was dull, his words slow. I don't know. I do my work, keep my head down but that's what I heard. Devin asked him a few more questions, but Calvin Fitch didn't have anything further to add. Jackson thanked him, and he shuffled back to the field, shaking the can of spray paint. They walked back to the principal, who was waiting for them. They didn't say anything about the drugs. For now. Has Cody ever been violent? Devin asked. Got into fights? The principal ran a hand through his hair. Yeah, there was an incident. It happened after school a few months ago, during the robotics club. Walter Boone is here, in the coach's office. He was there. Jackson and Devin exchanged a glance but didn't say anything. Boone had discovered the body. Let's talk to him, Jackson said. The principal led them inside the building, through darkened hallways lined with lockers, to a small office off the gymnasium. He remained in the gym. Boone sat behind a metal desk, typing on a laptop. Behind him, an opened window let in light and fresh air. Bookcases were decorated with photos of Lego projects and beaming students. A few third-place ribbons were tacked to the wall. A pair of binoculars hung on a hook by the door. You must be here about the murder, he said in a mild voice. We are. Devin glanced down at her notebook. We understand you found the victim. Not something you ever expect to see, especially not up here. It's a terrible thing, a horrible thing. Truthfully, I've had nightmares. Have you arrested anyone yet? We're investigating several angles, Jackson said. He shut the laptop and folded his hands on the desk. In his early 40s, he had a bland, amiable face. I'm here to help in any way I can. How are the kids? I've been thinking about Cody. That poor kid. What can you tell us about him? Devin asked. We understand he had a fight with another student? Boone leaned forward. Cody has a temper, it's true. It doesn't come out often, but when he's pushed, it's rather frightening how angry he gets. And how quickly. 
Can you tell us what happened? Jackson asked. Chad Wellington was picking on Cody, stealing his notebook, ripping up his drawings, calling him a pussy, that sort of thing. I know we're supposed to reserve judgment, but that kid is a real prick. Devin jotted down notes. Last month, this kid starts going after his sister as well, saying she smelled, that her clothes were dirty, her hair, that she was dirty. Wolf girl, I think Chad called her. I bet Shiloh took the term wolf girl as a compliment, Jackson said. I don't really know her. Did it bother Cody? Devin prompted. It made him mad as hell, Boone said. They had a few verbal altercations. Chad pushed him once. Then one day, after school, I had the students in the gym, working on one of the robotics challenges for an upcoming competition. Chad excused himself to go to the bathroom. Cody followed him. He had a piece of metal in his backpack, probably from the salvage yard. He took it to Chad's knee. Chad played soccer. Not anymore. He might always walk with a limp. Jackson nodded, remembering. That was Moreno's case. Cody was a suspect, but there was no definitive ID, no evidence, and the victim wouldn't talk. Chad refused to name Cody, he said. He wouldn't even tell his parents who did it. But I know it was him. Devin wrote in her notebook, her braids spilling over her shoulder. Did he ever say anything about his grandfather? Did they get along? Any fights? He doesn't like his grandfather, I can tell. He doesn't like to be home very much. He hates working in the salvage yard. I think that's why he joined the robotics club. <laughs> Not because he likes being here, but he hates being there more. Boone shrugged. He goes out on his boat on school nights, so he comes to the club tired a lot. What boat? Jackson asked. Cody didn't have a boat. He calls it the Little Neptune. That's all I know. The man pursed his lips. I don't think he did this, if that's what you're hinting at. Devin kept her expression neutral. We're just asking questions. No one wants to pin this on a 14-year-old kid, Jackson said. Least of all us. I sure hope not. No one in this community wants to think there's a killer among us. I hope you solve this case quickly. Boone rose and stuck out his hand. His palm was soft when Jackson shook it. Anything else I can do to help, just let me know. Enjoy the northern lights tonight. I hear they're going to be quite spectacular. Devin thanked the principal. Two minutes later, they were out in the sunshine, headed for the patrol truck. Devin chewed on her thumbnail and gave Jackson a sidelong glance. Spit it out, Jackson said. I know you have something to say. I know you don't want it to be, Cody, Devin said, her voice soft. But the evidence is pointing in his direction. He is strong enough to wield that crowbar. He has a history of violence. He didn't get along with his grandfather. And if he was dealing drugs for James Sawyer... Jackson sighed, a tightness in his chest like a clenched fist. He didn't want it to be Cody. He truly didn't. Devin said, we have to follow the evidence, no matter where it takes us. Some TV detective hack told me that not so long ago. Jackson said, I know. 22. Shiloh Easton. Day four. There were strangers at Shiloh's house. Shiloh had forgotten cash. The SpaghettiOs and strawberry Pop-Tarts she'd packed wouldn't last forever. And she was down to her last jerry can of gasoline for the four-wheeler. That was a problem. Her grandfather kept a stash of silver junk coins and a stack of cash in a shoebox underneath a loose floorboard in front of his dresser. He hadn't known that she'd seen him, creeping down the hallway to watch him count his coins, the way they glinted in the light of the Coleman lantern. She just needed a way to get it. She had holed up in a cave between Christmas and Munising, 
a couple miles from the shores of Superior and three miles as the crow flew from Eli's campsite. It was a cave she'd discovered years ago with Cody. They'd set up a fort when they were kids. The walls gave her a sense of security and protection. Plus, it kept the rain out. The lack of a water source was a major pain. But an ATV trail ran a quarter of a mile behind the cave and connected to all the major arteries that would take her where she needed to go. It was easy to get in and out. A good place to hide. The Aurora had returned last night, even stronger than before. It felt like living on an alien planet. It was so bright at night that she didn't need a flashlight, even in the dark. Everything bathed in eerie shades of rust orange and blood red. Where the northern lights usually appeared for a few minutes to a few hours, these had lasted all night. They were beautiful and terrible at the same time. Shiloh stood on the ridge of the western edge of her grandfather's property. The white farmhouse perched on the hill a hundred yards to her right. Two hundred yards down the slope to the east lay the salvage yard. Just in case, she'd approached via the ATV trail her grandfather had blazed two decades ago, rather than the main driveway. She'd parked it a hundred yards back, off the trail, behind a screen of jack pines. It was a good thing, too. She watched the cops, deputies, and technicians in papery uniforms walk around, snapping pictures, dusting for prints, and collecting evidence in little envelopes. Yellow crime scene tape circled a section of the salvage yard. An uneasy feeling seeped into the pit of her stomach. No way would she get inside the house now. Not tonight. Maybe not tomorrow, either. As she watched, a figure broke away from the group. The figure ducked outside the crime scene tape and shaded his eyes as he scanned the property. He turned in a slow circle, studying the house on the hill, the woods, the slope, and the crest of the ridgeline where Shiloh stood. Head up, shoulders hunched against the wind, he headed toward her. Shiloh shrank back. She took cover behind two beech trees. It didn't matter. Somehow, he'd already seen her. The figure drew closer. He crossed the weedy parking lot and jogged between the law enforcement vehicles. She knew that confident gait, the windswept hair, the five o'clock beard scuffing the square jaw. A part of her wanted to run. But she didn't. Not yet. She braced herself, every muscle taut, ready to bolt like a fawn. Jackson Cross halted at the bottom of the steep incline. Thorny underbrush tangled with wild raspberry, and thimbleberry brambles climbed the side of the hill. She was forty feet above him. If he came after her, she could run. As if he could sense her thoughts, he called out, Don't run. Her feet flexed in her sneakers. Her crossbow was lashed to the four-wheeler, but she had her knife at her hip. She wasn't scared. Shiloh, please, I need to talk to you. Jackson raised both hands in the air, palms out, like a sign of surrender. I won't chase you. I know I can't catch you. She snorted. At least he knew it. He paused, as if thinking through his angles, his options. Are you hungry? I've got a Snickers bar in the truck. Her mouth watered, her stomach growled. She wasn't stupid. She knew exactly what he was doing. Snickers were her favorite. Since she could remember, Jackson had been a fixture in her life. He'd show up at home or school, always with candy. He'd ask her questions about school, about her grandfather's drinking, whether she was studying hard and doing her chores. On Christmas, and birthdays, he brought her books, Anne of Green Gables, and To Kill a Mockingbird, and other ones, travel books on Indonesia, Portugal, and Crete, the topographical map of Munising. Shiloh raised her middle finger and flicked him off. 
Jackson shielded his eyes and smiled. He was like that. Didn't matter what she said or did, how rude she was. He kept coming back. She had no idea why he cared. He did stuff for Cody, too. Buying him fishing gear, taking them both fly fishing. But it was Shiloh he worried about. Once when her grandfather was drunk, he'd told her that Jackson had been in love with her mother and that he hadn't known how to fall out of love all these years later. Her memories were snippets, dappled sunshine and a laughing voice, being carried through a storm, rain on her face, a soft song and warm hands cradling her as she drifted off to sleep, running through the woods, chasing a fluttering dress and dark, streaming hair. She'd just turned five when her mother had been murdered in the next room, when Eli Pope was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. She didn't remember much from that day. She'd fallen into another hole in time, like with her grandfather. She remembered a limp body, dark hair spread across the pillow, blood on her mother's face that she'd tried to wipe away. Sometimes a shadowy shape at the corners of her vision. Maybe she'd remembered once, but she didn't anymore. Shiloh, Jackson said again, louder. She blinked, returning to the present. Let's sit down and have a conversation. With Twizzlers. Hot chocolate. Chocolate sprinkled donuts from Miner's Pasties and Ice Cream. Damn him. He knew she had a wicked sweet tooth. Her gaze flicked to the officers down at the junkyard. They weren't paying attention to Jackson or to her. Shiloh folded her arms over her chest and shook her head. She had a mission, and she didn't trust Jackson as far as she could throw him. You're going to send me to social services. I won't. I don't believe you. Jackson half turned and glanced behind him. He ran a hand through his hair, then scrubbed his jaw. He turned back around. There's a lot going on right now. Maybe you don't know about the power outages. The cell towers are down again. It's got people antsy, worked up. I know about the Aurora. We don't know what's going to happen. It could get worse. I'm fine. He stared up at her, squinting. His jaw worked like he was trying to spit something out, but it kept getting stuck in his teeth. There's also a convict that was released from prison. He's, I know about Eli Pope. Jackson pursed his lips. He's dangerous and violent, Shiloh, especially to you. Stay far, far away from him. She glared at him. If you're trying to scare me, it's not working. She wasn't sure what to make of Eli Pope. Sure, he was dangerous. She sensed that right off. He intrigued her. He knew stuff that she wanted to know, survival stuff, and things about her mother, her grandfather, her own past. Stay far away from him, Shiloh. I mean it. You don't get to tell me what to do. Look, I don't like the thought of you out here. Not like this, not now. It's not safe. Not my problem. Jackson sighed. His shoulders bowed like he carried an incredible burden. I have to do my job. I'm sorry, but I do. You're a minor. You're alone out here, with no parents, no guardian. I can take care of myself. I've never doubted that, but that doesn't change the law. I have to bring you in, Shiloh. You and Cody both. Shiloh knew plenty about social services. How they dragged certain kids away, never to be seen again. Or maybe they did return, but they were completely different people. No thanks. No way. Shiloh, please. He was begging now. He looked scared, desperate. Fear started to creep in. 
Adults weren't supposed to look scared. They weren't supposed to be desperate. Apprehension flared through her, every nerve on edge. I know what happened with your grandfather. I know he was killed, and that you were there. The numb darkness descended. She was back there, crouched in the passenger footwell of the half-crushed car. Springs from the torn seat poking her spine, shards of glass in her hair, snagged in her shirt, stuck to her skin. And then, nothing. Her memories were blank, wiped clean. Only the thudding fear, the terror in the back of her throat, twisting her guts to water. Algiers, Algeria, Luanda, Angola, Porto Novo, Benin. Trembling, she mouthed the comforting words, the familiar litany, the only thing that could bring her back from the edge, that could force the panic to recede like a red tide. Gaborone, Botswana, Wagadugu, Burkina Faso. Cody is missing, Jackson said. She willed herself to focus on the lists in her head until her breathing steadied and the panic receded. She needed to focus on Cody. Finding Cody. He ran away, like you did, Jackson said. Is he with you? Do you know where he is? Cody had not run away. Her brother was lost, taken, stolen, buried down deep in a hole and calling for her. We can find him, Shiloh. We can help him. The cops could do more than she could. Find important stuff on computers, bash in doors and arrest people. Rescue her brother from the monster who'd spirited him away. The temptation needled her. How easy it would be to give in, to give up, to let someone else do this monumental, impossible, terrifying thing. Cody might be in trouble. She saw it again in her mind's eye. Cody buried alive, drowning in dirt. Her breath caught in her throat. Jackson was one of the good guys. She'd never feared him, a single moment of her life. What if she could trust him? What if he could help her and Cody? I can't do any of that if you don't come down here and talk to me. If you don't tell me where he is. Indecision clutched her. Doubt and mistrust warred with hope and faith. There are people looking for him. Jackson waved his arm to take in the suits behind him, as if he weren't one of them. They're searching for him right now. They have the resources to find him, Shiloh. It's better if he comes to us willingly. Shiloh stiffened. You think he did this? If you know he didn't, you need to tell us, Shiloh. We have to go on the evidence. You're a witness. You can tell us what happened. If that clears your brother, then that's how you can help him. Her tongue stuck to the roof of her mouth. It was difficult to swallow. He didn't do anything. Shiloh, no! She shook her head, emphatic. Anger bubbled up fast and furious. Don't tell me what to do, Jackson Cross. You aren't my father. You've got no claim on me. He looked pained. I'm trying to help you. You and Cody both. We don't need your help. Leave Cody alone. It'll be okay, Jackson said, as if he were trying to convince himself as much as her. It's going to be okay. Another lie. Her heart juddered against her ribs. She'd known he would betray her. He was an adult, like all the rest, an imposter. He pretended to care, but none of them did. Come down, Shiloh, please. I know you're cold and hungry. I'll make sure you're safe. I promise. Bitterness sprouted deep in her belly. Wetness stung her eyes. She blinked it back, fiercely. 
They weren't trying to help Cody. They were going to lock him up. They'd lock her up, too, if she gave them the chance. You're a liar. Shiloh, no. Let me explain. Shiloh took a step back. She pushed through scraggly brambles until she stood on the trail, frustrated, discouraged, and angry. Jackson started up the side of the hill. He was coming after her. Go to hell, Jackson Cross. And she turned and was gone. 23. Lena Easton. Day 4. Lena tapped the brakes. Cars, trucks, and semis crowded the highway ahead of her. Chewing her bottom lip, she glanced at the gas gauge. Still half a tank. In the back seat, Bear raised his head and whined. She sighed. You have to pee, don't you? Apprehension flickered through her. She wanted to drive without stopping. Every stop carried risk and increased danger. Every hour, every day that passed brought them closer to anarchy. On the radio, newscasters discussed damaged cell towers and overloaded networks. Sprint, Verizon, and T-Mobile carriers put out statements that technicians had been dispatched across the country to repair the damage. They did not mention how long the repairs would take. This afternoon, her GPS had stopped working altogether. Good thing she had the road atlas. Taking the highways was a calculated risk. In a crisis, the best bet was to avoid other people. But using back roads meant more miles, more time, more stops, more gas. She absolutely could not afford to run out of fuel. They'd taken I-75 through Ocala and Gainesville, then across the border into Georgia. In two days, they'd gone almost 500 miles, from Tampa to just outside of Atlanta. Traffic had slowed them down. Today, there were far more vehicles on the road than yesterday. Many vehicles towed trailers. Plenty of RVs were on the road. Most cars were stuffed with boxes, crates, and suitcases, much like her own. A lot of people were paying attention, packing up and heading out of the cities into rural areas. Last night, she'd driven the last hundred miles with the sky like a red ocean, the aurora undulating waves. The way the lights swayed across the velvet black heavens reminded her of jellyfish drifting in the deep. She'd never seen anything like it. Even Bear had awakened for the show, leaning his head out the opened window, tongue lolling, grinning like a hairy brown fiend. It's pretty, but it's dangerous, buddy. Bear chuffed in response. How dangerous? It's going to be bad, that's all I know. She'd contemplated utilizing some of her cash to spring for a hotel room, but she couldn't justify spending two to three hundred bucks simply to sleep. No way was she leaving Bear alone in the tan turd, or leaving her supplies unattended. Instead, she'd found a truck stop outside of Marietta and parked between two semis. The place was packed. She'd checked three different truck stops before she found an open spot. She'd slept with her M&P pistol on the center console beside her, fully loaded with a round in the chamber. If something happened in the middle of the night, she'd be damned if she wasn't ready to defend herself with lethal force. Bear was protective, but he wasn't the optimal guard dog. He wanted to lick and love on almost everyone. But he was a good warning system. He'd bark if anyone got anywhere near the SUV, whether it be human or squirrel. As she passed billboards for carpet stores in Dalton, green hills rose all around them. She listened to the radio as scientists discussed the stunning auroras at tropical latitudes over Cuba, Hawaii, Jamaica, the Bahamas, as far south as Portugal. Millions of people in dozens of countries had canceled work and school to throw lavish midnight parties, dancing in the streets, setting up tents and lawn chairs to watch the sky. She rolled her eyes and switched channels. How could so many people not realize what was coming? The information was out there, if they were willing to listen. 
The FAA has grounded all planes, leaving millions of travelers stranded leading up to Memorial Day weekend. The FAA released a statement that it was necessary to cancel flights due to damage to low Earth satellites. Stay tuned for further updates. She switched the station again. The primary threat of a CME and the resulting geomagnetic storms is to electrical power transmission grids, oil and gas pipelines, undersea cables, telephone networks, railways, satellites, etc. Small-scale electronics won't be affected, but we won't be able to access any of the systems we depend on. For example, almost every system from communications to banking to aviation is dependent upon GPS data. As they approached the Tennessee border, traffic increased again. Bear woofed unhappily, tail thumping the window, the back of her seat, the back of her head. Oof! She reached back with one hand and swatted his fluffy butt. I know, I know, bathroom break. Just give me a second. A wave of dizziness washed over her. One eye on the road, she checked the screen on her pump. Her blood sugar was getting low at 80. Time to eat. With one hand, she rummaged in her bag, pulled out an apple juice box and granola bar, tore off the wrapper with her teeth, and ate while driving. A blue rest stop sign appeared ahead of them. Bear thumped the back of her seat with his tail. He stuck his head between the seats and panted in her ear hot doggy breath on her face. He needed a break. So did she. Her thighs burned, her butt was sore, her head pounded. They still had a thousand miles to go. I know, we're stopping, I promise. Her muscles tensed as she pulled off the highway and navigated the parking lot. The place was packed. Every parking slot was taken. Several dozen vehicles had driven over the curb and parked in the grass. Lena followed suit, snagging the last spot beside a picnic table. She holstered her pistol before exiting and opening the door for Bear. He bounded out with a relieved woof and promptly began peeing on the rear wheel. Lena stepped back and scanned the parking lot. She could feel eyes on her. Families were crammed at picnic tables and spread out on the grass. Several children were crying. People looked frazzled and stressed. She got food and water for Bear, then checked the mini-fridge, still good and cold. The alarm beeped on her phone. Lena needed to calibrate her pump and sensor every 12 hours. That meant pricking her finger, using a test strip, and inserting it into her glucometer to read her blood sugar, then loading that number into the pump. Every seven days she needed to change her infusion set and sensor, but... She hoped to get to the UP by then. Quickly, Lena calibrated the pump while keeping one eye on the parking lot, her ears straining for unusual sounds. Tension drummed through her. She needed to use the restroom, but she was loath to leave her supplies. The refrigerated vials inside that ugly SUV were her life, her salvation. Stand guard, Bear. Embarrassing as it was, weird as she felt, she squatted right there in the parking lot next to the tan turd and did her business. Bear rounded the side of the SUV and stared at her, head cocked, ears pricked. She glared at him. Really? You're supposed to be keeping an eye out. He plopped on his haunches and gave her a goofy grin. That's it. You're fired. After using wet wipes to clean up, she tried calling Jackson again. Was he paying attention to the warnings? She knew how he was. When he was on a case, it consumed him. He would believe her. She knew he would. Sometimes the phone rang. Sometimes it didn't. Texts didn't go through. She'd managed to connect once for 20 seconds. Enough time to tell him she was coming, but not to tell him to get ready. With a sigh, she pocketed her phone and scanned the horizon. No sign of the aurora though dark clouds bristled on the horizon to the south. Electrons sizzled in the air, the wind picking up, whipping strands of chestnut hair into her face. A storm was coming. It was headed straight toward them. 24. Jackson Cross, Day 4. 
What do you have? Jackson asked. Dumb phones aren't working. Devin set the phone on the table and squeezed into the booth. Again? Everything scrambled because of the solar storms, Jackson said. Devin chewed on her thumbnail. I thought that'd be done by now. Every day, they're like, surprise, we've got another one. Gotcha. It's not funny anymore. The universe has an ironic sense of humor. Or a perverse sense of punishment. I feel like the ant under the magnifying glass being tortured by the gods. I just want to check my Insta ten million times a day. Is that too much to ask? They were grabbing lunch at the Falling Rock Cafe on Munising Avenue before heading back out. Devin had ordered another beef and potato pasty. She couldn't get enough of them. Jackson dug into his broiled white fish, the best-tasting freshwater fish, reeled in from the deep waters of Lake Superior. Though the town didn't have power, the restaurant was running on a generator. Devin had spent the morning with the crime scene techs, while Jackson had hooked up with the park service to search for Cody Easton's missing boat. They'd found nothing. Neither had the Coast Guard. If the fishing boat had become unmoored, or intentionally released, it could be in any of a hundred coves or inlets along the coast. After lunch, they planned to head back to the crime scene and hike to the coast from Easton's property. Outside, the sky was turning an ugly shade of gray. They needed to hurry. The case file was opened on the table between them. Devin pointed to a crime scene photo of the print with blood transfer that they'd found near the back fence. The DNA came back. It's the victim's blood. We found a shoebox for a pair of size 9 Nike Air Force One sneakers in Cody's closet. Marina tracked down another pair at a shoe store in Grand Marais. The treads matched the plaster cast of the footprint. That's a popular shoe. Could have been someone else. It's most likely Cody, boss. You know that. It still doesn't mean he's the perpetrator. Keep going. Most of the prints were a size 11 in men's. Cody is a size 9. Amos has sneakers that are a size 11, boots that are 11 and a half. The smaller prints, size 4 in women's, match the shoes in Shiloh's closet. A couple of prints match Walter Boone, but he discovered the victim, so that's to be expected. We have dozens of partials we haven't been able to match. Customers came into the salvage yard all the time. Jackson leaned forward and rubbed the stubble on his jaw. And the murder weapon? Easton's prints are on it. Cody's prints aren't in the system, but the text lifted a print off his Chromebook's fingerprint reader. Cody is also a match. Jackson shook his head. It was far from a smoking gun. Cody worked in the salvage yard with Amos. He could have picked it up a dozen times for a legitimate purpose. Devin looked dubious. What else? There is a partial print on the tire iron that doesn't match any hits in the system. Hastings is tracking down the list of customers over the last 30 days, focusing on the five folks who visited within 72 hours of the crime. We'll see if we get lucky. We need more than luck. Devon finished her pasty and used a crust of bread to sop up the last of the juices. A line appeared between her brows. She was focused, considering the options, the angles. Jackson knew what she was thinking. Say it. Here's what I have. She ticked off the evidence on her fingers. No signs of a suspect entering or exiting the property. Cody's fingerprint on the murder weapon. Cody's likely footprint with blood transfer that places him at the scene near the victim. Cody's established propensity for violence. He has the means and opportunity and the motive. Say he's had enough of his grandfather's drinking and snaps. Or maybe Easton goes after Shiloh and Cody defends her like he defended her from that bully at school. Cody kills his grandfather, then panics and flees. Shiloh witnesses the horrific cycle of family violence repeat itself, 
gets scared, and runs away. It was the obvious answer. It felt like the air had been sucked out of the room. It doesn't feel right. Maybe you're too close to it. It was possible. Maybe more than possible. Still, he didn't want to believe it. Jackson clenched his jaw. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched. There's a lot of directions this case could go yet. Occam's razor seems relevant here, boss. When you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. Exactly, she paused. Underwood seems like he's under a lot of pressure to close this case fast. I know that. He felt the pressure, like a thousand bricks slowly crushing his chest. There was never enough time. He'd hardly been home in four days. He had yet to investigate Ruby Carpenter's missing persons case. Her mother had stopped in at the sheriff's office this morning, begging for an update. Though Sheriff Underwood had told him to drop it, he wouldn't. He'd have to investigate on his own time. He'd called her friends and discovered nothing. He'd also talked with Shiloh and Cody's classmates and come up empty. Devin shook her head. How hard can it be to find one teenage kid? Two teenage kids, he said. Don't forget Shiloh. She was still in the wind. He'd tried to follow her yesterday, but she was too fast. She knew the woods far better than he did. There were a million places to hide. Hiawatha National Forest alone accounted for 879,000 acres of rolling hills, dense forests, and wetlands. It contained hundreds of miles of ATV, snowmobiling, and hiking trails. When the waitress came by, Devin ordered a mocha latte to go, extra chocolate syrup. Jackson asked for black. We're about out of syrup, hon, the waitress said. We're running low on a lot of things. Tomorrow we'll be operating on a reduced menu. No more coffee. Devin stared at her. What do you mean, no more coffee? The waitress shrugged. We haven't received a delivery since this thing started. Jackson's phone rang as the waitress took their cash payment. It was hasting. Local calls went through occasionally. Long distance calls were the issue. Still, it failed twice before he finally got a hold of Hastings. The connection was staticky. Jackson gripped the phone. Spit it out before we lose service. The warrant came through. Sprint delivered the goods. We still haven't found Easton's phone, which means it's either been destroyed or the battery died. Last time it pinged a cell tower, it was in Alger County. Sprint was able to bring up the call log. Normally we'd get the text messages too, but they're having server issues and don't have it yet. Big surprise. And a buzzing silence, then static. Hello? I'm here, I'm here. Hastings' voice came through tinny, half fading, but clear enough for Jackson to make out his words. You're never gonna guess who's on that log and no less than five times in the last ten days alone. Hasting, for the love of all that's holy, spit it out. Hasting paused for dramatic effect. James Sawyer. 25. Jackson Cross, Day 4. Devin lowered her binoculars and pointed. What's that? Jackson joined her along the lip of the bluff. In the distance, storm clouds gathered. Lake Superior whipped herself into a frenzy, the waves crashing against the cliffs. A dense fog had rolled in as they'd hiked the two-mile trail from Easton Salvage Yard to the edge of his property along the coast. He had no idea why Sawyer had called Easton, but they were going to find out. Hasting and Nash were looking for Sawyer, but Jackson knew he wouldn't speak to them. He was slippery as an eel. Everywhere at once, his fingers in every pie. Jackson would have to do it himself. It was a task he dreaded. 
Devin grabbed the sleeve of his jacket and pointed. There! Jackson followed her gaze. Great boulders littered the base of the cliffs. To the left was a sheltered cove with a narrow sliver of sandy beach. A dock jutted into the water. A weathered shed stood anchored to flat rock near the cliffs, likely used to store ropes, fuel, tackle, and other boating paraphernalia. There's no record of a dock here, Devin said. No permit ever pulled. I checked the county records this morning. Amos probably built it himself and ignored regulations and permits. No surprise there. Devin edged closer to the drop-off, trying to get a better look at the dock, but she was too close. Be careful, Jackson called. Small pebbles gave way beneath her feet and tumbled over the edge of the cliff. Devin took a rapid step back from the ledge. Her brown skin went ashen. It's steep here. That's why you stay away from the edge. Yeah, yeah, I got it. She raised the binoculars again, then pointed. I think there's a path down to the beach over there. They gave the edge a wide berth as they headed east until the narrow path revealed itself. It was a rocky, steep descent. It took a good five minutes to pick their way down to the dock itself. It's in good shape, Jackson said. Used recently, too. He studied the smooth, straight boards, the lack of algae buildup on the wood or the rope pilings. I see something. Down at the waterline, among the rocks. Jackson looked where Devin pointed. Past the dock fifty yards, a litter of boulders crowded the base of a jagged cliff. One of the boulders was smoother, brighter than the others. He stared harder, squinting. The boulder moved, bobbing with the waves. It's a fishing boat, Jackson said, flipped upside down. The storm drew closer, the sky darkening the heavens about to open up and drench them. Cautiously, they picked their way along the sandy beach, climbing over water-slick boulders, mindful of the swirling eddies and deeper pools between the rocks. The wind threatened to pull them off the rocks into the wild surf. As they approached, Jackson recognized the name painted onto the side, Little Neptune. They'd found Cody Easton's boat. Jackson's phone rang. They'd hiked back to the salvage yard in pouring rain. He pulled it out of his pocket, relieved. Every time cell service went out, he wondered if it would return. Six new messages blinked back at him. Four from his mother, one from his sister. A voicemail from Hastings, but it was just static. And four missed calls from Lena. Anxiety hummed through him. He'd been worried for days. 1,600 miles was a long journey. Still, she should be here by now. He gestured for Devin to go on ahead to the patrol truck. He ducked into the corrugated metal shed, which smelled like gasoline and cut grass. Rain dripped down his face. His hair was plastered to his scalp. He pressed the call button. She picked up on the fourth ring. Jackson! Lena! You okay? Shiloh! Lena's voice came through tinny and distant. She sounded stressed. Is she safe? And Cody? We're still looking. We could use your help. I've had some troubles. Bear and I are okay. I should be there tomorrow, but need to tell you. The phone spat static. Lena? Can you hear me? Lena? Jackson, have you seen the news? About the sun? The solar storms? Yes, I have some supplies. We're set for a while. That's not good enough. It's going to get worse. A lot worse. His gut clenched. Lena was smart. He'd always trusted her judgment. He'd been so consumed by this case, he hadn't paid attention like he should have. There was a scientist on TV. I believe him, Jackson. A big one is coming, bigger than this planet has ever seen. He said it's going to change everything. It's coming. In a day, maybe two. We need to get ready. Rain drummed the metal roof. Outside, leaves swirled in gusts between the rows of desiccated vehicles. 
the crime scene tape flapped wildly, bright yellow against gray sky and mud-brown earth. The aurora had returned, flickering faintest red behind the clouds, beautiful yet ominous. His stomach filled with razor blades. Get here, as soon as you can, Lena. Jackson, it's the beginning of the end. The phone went dead. 26. Eli Pope, Day 4 It was a rough afternoon on Lake Superior. The wind buffeted Eli. Electrons sizzled the air. A wall of angry, dark clouds roiled across the western horizon, headed their way. Two men met Eli at the dock. One wore a heavy woolen shirt and a close-fitting fisherman's cap. The other was tall and rake-thin, with scarred knuckles and a lazy eye. Hard men. Criminals. I'm looking for Sawyer, Eli said. Sawyer's busy. Tell him it's Eli. Eli Pope. The shorter, fatter man glared at him, unmoved. His tiny eyes were piggish in his fleshy, wind-burned face. His nose was crooked. He looked like the type of man who started bar brawls and finished them. Tell him, the one with the lazy eye said. Go. The short one huffed but obeyed, stomping down the deck toward several boats in their slips. He gesticulated at another man busy unloading crates from a nearby speedboat. Eli waited on the dock. The fat man kept an eye on him like he might steal a crate of fishing tackle out from beneath his nose. The tattoo scrawled up the side of his thick neck was a Russian symbol he recognized but couldn't quite place. Among several other business ventures, clean and otherwise, James Sawyer owned sport fishing charters, which hugged the west side of the bay, sandwiched between an outfit offering glass-bottomed boat shipwreck tours and pictured rocks kayaking tours. A sleek white yacht bobbed at the far end of the dock. Risky business was scrawled in gold script on the rear. A black and white skull and crossbones flag hung from the gaff. Sawyer was nothing, if not ironic. A man disembarked the yacht, leapt over the side, and landed easily on his feet. He strode down the dock, the wind whipping unruly, dirty blonde hair into his eyes. His gaze settled on Eli. For a long moment, they stared at each other. Then his weathered face broke into a smile. Well, if it isn't Eli freaking Pope. Eli dipped his chin. Sawyer. James Sawyer was tall and lean and muscular, with a three-day beard, high, sharp cheekbones, and crafty eyes set wide, like a shark's. Depending on the light, they were blue or gray, but there was no depth behind them, no emotion, just a flat watchfulness, an alertness, like a wild animal always looking for the trap or his next meal. The prodigal son returns, Sawyer said. Something like that. You've got balls of steel, I'll give you that. Eli's lips twitched. That ever in question? Not for a second. Sawyer gestured at the sleek yacht behind him. Come take a ride with me. In this weather? Sawyer met his gaze and did not look away. His eyes were neither friendly nor unfriendly, just watchful. You scared? Never. Didn't think so. Sawyer glanced behind Eli as a third man approached. Eli felt incredibly uncomfortable. Four of Sawyer's protection team surrounded him. They were armed and looked tough. Professionals, former military. Sawyer glanced at one of his lieutenants. All clear? The man nodded. Sawyer gave Eli an apologetic smile. I have two counter-surveillance teams at each end of the dock, watching the area. If you came here wearing a wire, the cops would be nearby. He just told me, no one is covering you or surveilling us. You came here alone. I could have told you that, Sawyer grinned. I'm sure you would have. He pointed at an antenna array and dish on his yacht. 
I even have a drone detection system. The DEA can be, shall we say, intrusive. Like I said, I'm alone. They'll just need to search you. You understand. Eli bristled, but allowed Sawyer's mercenaries to frisk him. The one with the fisherman's cap passed an RF meter, radio frequency detector, over Eli's body. Boss? Lazy Eye pointed at Eli's pistol, his knife. We'll take good care of them, Sawyer said. Trust me. Eli didn't trust Sawyer as far as he could throw him. But they'd always had an understanding, a certain rapport, and Eli wanted answers. After Eli had removed his weapons and handed them over to one of the mercenaries, Sawyer motioned for Eli to climb aboard. Without a word, two armed men who'd been aboard disembarked, leaving Sawyer and Eli alone on the yacht. With expert precision, Sawyer maneuvered the boat from its slip and out into the choppy bay. Eli glanced back at the dock, where six burly men stood watching. He observed the telltale bulge of weapons beneath their jackets. They did not appear pleased that Sawyer was leaving them behind. A few of my men are former Russian GRU special forces. You can never be too careful these days. I can tell. Isn't she a beauty? Sawyer returned his attention to his boat. Fifty feet of pure power, state-of-the-art, hydraulic progressive track thrusters, warping winches so I can easily muscle in a spring line against wind and currents, teak floor, and solid wood cockpit. Sure, Eli said, though he didn't care. At the cockpit, Sawyer looked like a king surveying his domain. He was lanky and loose-jointed his movements seeming lazy and unhurried. But there was intent behind everything he did. Of that, Eli had no doubt. Some things never changed. Anyone else? I'd tell him to go fly a kite. I'm incredibly busy. These solar storms have opened a host of exciting business possibilities. Not you, though, Eli. I always have time for old friends. The words held hidden meanings, secret barbs. Though Sawyer had hung out with them from middle school through high school and beyond, often joining up for kayaking, cliff jumping, drunken bonfires on the beach, he had never belonged to their inner group. That intimacy, the specialness they'd shared, had been reserved for the four of them, Eli and Jackson, Lily and Lena. Eli suspected that Sawyer had resented his outsider status. Still, Sawyer had brought the crazy to the party, the booze, the weed, the harder stuff. Sawyer always had access and shared, liberally, for a price. By his sophomore year of high school, he was the prime dealer of anything illicit for the under-25 crowd. Whatever you needed, if Sawyer didn't have it, he could get it. Their senior year of high school, Sawyer's father had been arrested for narcotics trafficking. He had been the link between two criminal organizations, a gang out of Detroit and an organized crime baron in Quebec. For more than a decade, Sawyer Sr. had trafficked illicit substances between Sault Ste. Marie, Canada and Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, using mules to cross the bridge into Canada multiple times a week. Sawyer's father was still imprisoned in the Alger Correctional Facility prison, serving the remainder of a 25 years to life term. Rumor had it that Sawyer had taken over his father's business, with the goal of transforming himself into a kingpin of the Upper Peninsula's criminal underworld. Eli had heard that Sawyer ran a syndicate of criminals from Mackinac Island up to Whitefish Bay and west, at least as far as Copper Harbor, the northernmost point in Michigan. Sawyer was smart. No law enforcement agency had ever been able to pin a thing on him, not even a traffic ticket. Eli admired him for that, if little else. They motored out of the cove into open water. Six-foot waves slapped the hull. The sky and lake blended together, 
gray as slate, and just as unforgiving. How was your stint in the slammer? I heard it was rough for you. I survived. Luckier than some, unluckier than others. Luck had nothing to do with it. I did what I could to help you in there. Eli had run across a few of Sawyer's foot soldiers in prison. Sawyer Sr. still had sway. His son held more. They had reached out to him. He'd rebuffed them. He wasn't a joiner. After that, they hadn't bothered him. Still, he didn't doubt Sawyer's word. If one of his people had gotten wind of an assassination attempt, they could have put a lid on it before anyone laid a hand on Eli. Not even Sawyer could touch Darius Sykes, though. Sykes was a monster of a different breed. Never let it be said that James Sawyer isn't loyal to his friends. Eli snorted. <laughs> you have a misguided sense of loyalty. Kept you alive, didn't I? Memories threatened to choke him. Shadows moving along concrete walls. The glint of a razor blade. The gleam of teeth before they bit. Hard men who enjoyed hurting. He thought of Sykes. The monster's promise to hunt him down and slaughter anyone Eli had ever loved. I kept myself alive. What are you doing here, Eli? Seeing an old friend? Sawyer gave a hard smile. We both know that's BS. Sounds like something Jackson would say, not you. I didn't take you for a blowhard. But people change, I suppose. I'm here for information. Information, I have. He shot a sideways glance at Eli, dispassionate, assessing. Eli had the sense that Sawyer didn't care whether he'd killed Lily or not, whether he was the broken heart killer or innocent. It was a disconcerting feeling. He'd been judged and found wanting by everyone else. Sawyer didn't have a conscience. Sawyer raised his voice over the thrashing wind. You interested in a job? I could use a man with your particular skill sets. Eli didn't answer. He waited for Sawyer to elaborate. After a beat, Sawyer said, I'm speaking of your tactical abilities, of course. Of course, Eli said stiffly. I'm not looking for a career change. A man needs money, no matter who he is. I'm fine. He wasn't, but he wasn't about to become indebted to someone like Sawyer. Eli waited. This was feeling more and more like a mistake. His lungs constricted. There were no walls here, no manacles, no locks. But he felt trapped. There was no escape on Lake Superior. No land within sight, only the gray bucking waves. Sawyer smiled at him as if he knew exactly what he was thinking and enjoyed it. It was a shark's smile, cold and calculating. A second later, Sawyer's shoulders relaxed and he slapped Eli on the back. I heard you were camped out in the woods. I like the woods. <laughs> well, damn, so do I. But I don't care to sleep out in the cold with spiders crawling all over me and mosquitoes eating me alive. Not unless it's for a good reason. Sawyer side-eyed him and flashed him a vacant grin. Of course, you are a jibway. You have that wildness in your veins, I guess. Eli stiffened. The boat rocked beneath him, but he kept his balance, muscles tensed, Senses alert for the slightest movement from Sawyer. Sawyer's men had stripped him of weapons, but he didn't need a gun to do damage. An elbow to the throat, a fist to the kidneys to incapacitate him, a swift kick behind the knees and a push to send him over the side of risky business, tumbling into the depths of a lake so deep and cold it might as well be the ocean. It's a shame, is all I'm saying. Man of your talents, being wasted. When Eli didn't say anything, Sawyer continued. Opportunity exists in chaos. You know this better than anyone, I'd bet. 
It's like a fight. The man who throws the first punch wins. Usually. Yes, usually. Sawyer didn't speak for a minute. He seemed to be listening to the roar of the wind with his entire body. He had likely memorized the shape of every bluff, every cove and bay and shoal. He was a man of the Great Lake, born to live on the water, as thirsty for the waves as Eli was for the woods and streams and dirt beneath his fingernails. Eli admired that about him. Always had. There's a short window of opportunity here. I'm going to seize it, Eli. I have plans. You say the word, and you're welcome on board, my right-hand man. You and me, together. We could do something big, real big, larger than you can even imagine. Eli said nothing. He wasn't interested, never would be. Storm's coming, Sawyer said absently. Lesser men would get off the water, seek safe harbor. I say, drive into the storm, face it, conquer it, become it. If it doesn't kill you first, nothing can kill me. I'm the cockroach that survives the apocalypse. If you're smart, you can be too. Eli shook his head. It's coming, you know, the apocalypse. It's real this time. With a little advice, you could set yourself up well. I'm not here for your advice, Sawyer. Sawyer shot him a look, his expression still placid, the slightest annoyance flaring in his eyes. Then, pray tell, why are you here? Sawyer maintained eyes and ears everywhere. He would know almost everything that went on in the town he called home, illegal or otherwise. He was the type of man you wanted on your side. He was plenty dangerous otherwise. An asset, when he was with you, as long as he could be controlled, as long as he obeyed orders. Eli had known plenty of men like him in the army, the rogues, the cowboys, the criminals. They tended to get weeded out quickly. Sawyer, however, was a survivor. Eli said, I want to know who framed me. 27. Eli Pope. Day 4. A thick wall of fog rolled in. The shoreline had disappeared. It felt like the entire world had disappeared with it. That the land they would return to, if they returned, would be far different than the one they'd left. Sawyer didn't give any indication that he was surprised, or taken aback. His expression didn't change. He said nothing for several minutes. Eli recalled him as a teenager, perpetually scheming and manipulating, that disheveled hair and disarming smile, entrancing a bevy of adoring girls and duping the authorities. Sawyer wore emotions like masks he could put on and discard at will. It was seldom that he revealed a true feeling. Even when he did, it was for a reason. To lure in an ally, to lower an enemy's defenses. Everything was a calculation with him. Always had been. The yacht sailed into the wind. Huge waves broke against the hull again and again. Cold spray hit Eli's face, his torso, and limbs. He blinked the water from his eyes but didn't look away. To do so would be seen as a weakness, he was certain. I'll throw you a freebie. This once, for old time's sake. Eli wasn't sure if he was supposed to grovel, to wax eloquent with gratitude. He didn't play games. He said nothing. I don't normally do pro bono. It's poor business, you understand. I know the drill. For several minutes, the roar of the wind and waves were the only sounds. Thin lines of foam whipped the water white and frothing. Sawyer expertly maneuvered the boat around a finger of rock thrust above the surface of the water. He was controlled, alert, exact. 
There was something shrewd and cunning in Sawyer's windswept face. Whatever Sawyer claimed, this wouldn't be free. The price would be steep. Eli had known that going in. When the time came, he'd pay it, or eliminate the debt another way. There were always options for a man like Eli. He hardly felt the cold burn of the wind. Impatience snarled in his chest. Anticipation mingled with trepidation. He was both desperate to know and dreaded the truth. What it would mean, the implications, the fallout. I need to know who planted the beer bottle. I need to know who framed me. You sure you want to know? There's no going back from that. Once you've leapt from the cliff, the only direction is down. Eli didn't hesitate. Yes. Sawyer nodded to himself. Who were you with that night? I went to the Northwoods bar. Had a couple of beers with Gideon Crawford. Tim was bartending. He closed his eyes, remembering. Cyrus Lee sat at the bar with some buddies. Sheriff Underwood was there, moaning about the lion's loss. What did you do after the bar? Went to see Lily. It had been a short visit, there and gone by 11 p.m. A single mother with two young children, Lily had still lived at home. Amos was usually out of the house, gambling and drinking. That night, he hadn't returned until dawn. Eli had slept with Lily, but didn't love her. There was too much darkness inside him. He had loved Lena, but he had never been able to keep her. She was too pure, too good, especially for him. He'd ruined the best thing he would ever have. Beneath Lily's beauty, there was a sliver of darkness that matched his own. They had both been damaged. Lily had wanted him, despite, or maybe because of, her sister. And he had not turned her away. They had deserved each other. Eli had plenty to be ashamed of. Guilt was an intimate friend. Mistakes and bad decisions littered his past. But he had not killed her. Of that, he was innocent. And before the bar? Sawyer asked. I went to Jackson's. We watched the game. He'd thought it through a thousand times in his cell. Every time, he'd come up empty. Tim Brooks and Gideon Crawford would have had access to his used beer bottles. Cyrus Lee, too. But what reason would they have to frame him? Sheriff Underwood had always despised him. Good old-fashioned racism. Or maybe he'd just wanted to close the case fast, and Eli was the simplest target. Then there was Amos Easton, who had hated Eli since the day, 15 years ago, when Eli had seen the bruise on Lena's face. Eli had confronted Amos, threatened to kill him if he laid a hand on Lena or Lily ever again. Jackson's, huh? It wasn't him. Are you sure? Again, no reaction in Sawyer's expression, just that shark's smile that played around his lips. Who got the press, the praise, the promotion to undersheriff? Jackson, he never wanted that stuff. Sawyer shot him a pitying glance. Nausea churned deep in his belly. It wasn't seasickness. He never wanted that stuff. He didn't care about the press. You're certain? Yes. There were anomalies in your case. There were rumors of an unreliable witness. The judge wouldn't give them a warrant. He gave a careless shrug, then hunched his shoulders against the biting wind. The dark clouds opened up, and rain poured down, heavy droplets pelting the yacht. They'd decided early on that it was you, once you were in their crosshairs. Sawyer raised a hand to the side of his head, made a gun of his finger, and mimed, pressing the trigger. They were going to nail you, no matter what they had to do. That doesn't mean it was him. It was Eli. It was Jackson. 
How do you know? How can you know for certain? Because I've had a particular officer of the law on my payroll for five years. He gets regular payments, which he needs to feed his healthy addiction to eight balls of blow and hookers, both of which I supply him. I have the film. He'd go to prison. I own him. One night, I got him particularly hammered. He told me everything. The blood drained from Eli's head. A great rushing filled his ears. That was not the wind. His legs went weak. No. The officer that stopped Eli did so on Jackson's instructions. He found the evidence Jackson had planted for him to find. His tongue was thick in his mouth. He couldn't get enough oxygen. What cop? Sawyer gave a sharp bark of laughter. <laughs> my informants are my own. Eli stared across the lake, unblinking, a haunting landscape of mist and dark water. Never had he been so starkly reminded of his own mortality. How brutal and fickle Mother Nature could be. The Aurora will be back again tonight. Sawyer said, nonchalant. She'll do her worst with a Mona Lisa smile, just like this girl does. He gestured at the lake with his own enigmatic smile. Eli couldn't focus on the maze of his words. He was reeling from Sawyer's revelation, rolling the words in his mind like agate stones polished by the rushing surf. He could not find defects in the logic. Neither could he make an argument against the sickening twist in his gut that confirmed the truth of Sawyer's words. Maybe Sawyer was lying, but he didn't think so. Sawyer watched him with dark eyes. The question now is, what will you do with that information? Eli didn't respond. He couldn't. I wonder, Sawyer said slyly, I wonder what you will do. Take me back to shore. What chaos will you wreak, Eli Pope? Eli met his sharp gaze with his own. I said, take me back. Sawyer threw back his head and laughed. Eli could barely hear it over the wind. Mist glued Sawyer's dirty blonde hair to his forehead in sculpted curls. He looked like a creature of the sea, a captain bravely manning the SS Edmund Fitzgerald freighter before it sank in the storm-tossed waters in 1975. A modern-day Ulysses determined to avoid the siren's song. Sawyer, Eli said. No need to worry, Sawyer said. I will always get you back safe and sound. Haven't I just offered you a massive favor? There's a price. He barely heard his own words over the rushing inside his skull. There's always a price with you. Sawyer's smile reached his eyes for the first time. Sunlight playing on dark water, obscuring the monster of the deep sliding beneath the placid surface. There's a prize for everything, my old friend. Most people just don't realize that they're paying it until it's too late. All of life is a transaction. When you know that going in, you're going to come out with the better end of the deal. I make no deals, Sawyer said. Sometimes you don't have a choice. He worked the throttle and turned the yacht in a slow arc. Waves sloshed the hull. The rain slapped down as they motored back toward shore. The fog obscured everything. Eli could see no land, no safe harbor. The brutal cold of Lake Superior would drown a man within sight of shore as mercilessly as it would out in the middle of open water. Submerged logs, dangerous rocks below the surface, 
sudden gales that drove hapless ships into unforgiving outcroppings. Over 350 shipwrecks littered the cold, dark bottom of the lake. At least half remain undiscovered to this day. A thousand generations had lived and died on this lake. How many more? How many lives would sink, simply vanishing, never to be seen again, never to be found? How many had been thrown overboard, bodies intentionally dumped? Possibly by the man standing next to him. They say over 10,000 people have lost their lives to this lake, Sawyer said as if he'd read Eli's mind. Eerie to think about, isn't it? Some of those bodies still down there, right beneath us. Lake Superior never gives up her dead. <laughs> no, Sawyer said. She doesn't. She keeps her secrets. Finally, the rugged shoreline appeared out of the dense fog. Mere outlines in the murkiness. The bright beam of a lighthouse shone like a tiny star in a universe of gray, the beacon leading them to safety. So do I, Eli said, so quietly that the storm took his words and whipped them away. So do I. 28. Jackson Cross. Day 5. Saturday morning dawned, bright and sunny. The northern lights had lit up the sky the night before, putting on a spectacular show. Inside, the lights had flickered, power surging, before it went out and did not come back on. Jackson's family was sitting at the dining room table when he came home from running errands around 10 a.m., his father, Horatio, fiddled with a radio set on the table next to a platter of bacon, eggs, and pancakes. Jackson's mother, Dolores, bustled around the massive kitchen in heels, serving everyone but herself. Once they'd had a maid and an in-home chef, those days were gone, though his parents both cared about keeping up appearances. The table was set with a meal fit for a king. Mounded platters of sizzling bacon, scrambled eggs, and fluffy pancakes. Large glasses of orange juice. Homemade cinnamon rolls. No one was even eating. Jackson felt sick. I thought we talked about this. We should ration our food. The power is going to be out for a long time. His sister Astrid snorted. <laughs> the power company has their people working on it now. They're saying a couple of days, as soon as the damn auroras end. They're wrong. It's just a power outage, Astrid drawled. Her eyes were half-lidded, like she'd already taken more than her share of Valium. She was on a multitude of prescriptions. We've weathered them fine before. Astrid was almost six feet tall when she stood. She was broad-shouldered, sturdy, and beautiful. Their family's Scandinavian descent was apparent in her ice-blue eyes and silky blonde hair that framed striking Nordic features. Astrid had never been able to maintain a regular job. With their family's considerable wealth, she hadn't needed to. She was not confined to a wheelchair, but used one due to the chronic pain in her legs from the drunk driving accident that had shattered them 15 years before. Dolores bent over backward to see that her every need and want was met. They all did. There's food at the grocery store, Dolores said. I don't understand, honey. We're fine. Everything's fine. When is the last time you went to the grocery store, mother? Jackson asked with a calmness he didn't feel. On Monday, before the auroras started. What's your point, Jackson? Astrid asked. The local grocery stores are empty. I checked this morning. Dolores paused over the frying pan and blinked at him. She had no answer. She'd never considered the possibility. In her late fifties, she was slender as a whippet, and wore a white pants suit, her silver streaked hair swept back in a French twist. Astrid gave him a patronizing smile. 
I'm sure things will be restocked by tomorrow. Not this time. After his phone call with Lena, he'd listened to several radio station broadcasts. While some still downplayed the disaster, a few were taking it seriously. Lena was right. If the geomagnetic storms worsened, the power might not come back on for a decade. Society, as they knew it, would collapse. Horatio sighed. Not this prepping stuff again. If not now, when? He snapped. When we're all starving, with nothing to eat? His mother shrank back, a look of consternation on her face. Jackson, Horatio said sharply. I apologize, mother. But the fact remains. And why are all the lights on? We should save the generator only to run the essentials. Astrid waved her hand to encompass the expansive dining room, the massive house. These are the essentials. Flustered, Dolores touched the pearls at her throat. She wore them without fail, even on days she didn't leave the house. Her face went pale. Surely you're joking, Jackson. I'm not. I can't live like that. We can't live like that. Lena's words echoed in his mind. We need to get ready. Astrid guffawed. Get ready for what? Armageddon? Please. You're not listening. That's enough, Horatio barked. You're scaring your mother, Jackson. His father spoke with a booming finality. He took a sip of coffee and set the mug next to his half-eaten plate of eggs and bacon. Enough. Jackson was at a loss for words. She didn't get it. They didn't get it. No, they refused to understand because they didn't want to. An engine rumbled outside. Astrid's boyfriend pulled into the driveway in his red Ford Mustang. Cyrus Lee entered the house without knocking, as if he belonged there. Dolores greeted him with a kiss to the cheek. She scurried around the oversized kitchen, getting him a plate he was perfectly capable of getting himself. Thank you, ma'am, he said with exaggerated graciousness. He sat next to Astrid's wheelchair and shot Jackson an appraising glance. Cyrus was an unwelcome fixture in the Cross household, at least to Jackson. Where Astrid was an intimidating presence even in her wheelchair, Cyrus was thin, wiry, and bristled with dark energy. He had a narrow, ferrety face. He came from money and good breeding. His great-grandfather had been the owner of a prosperous copper mine in Keweenaw County. For work, he did some sort of Wall Street day trading from his couch. Cyrus had dated Astrid for years. They'd never married. In all that time, Jackson had never grown to like him. He was entitled, arrogant, and damn creepy. Jackson figured his parents were simply grateful that someone wanted their disabled daughter. They only cared that his pedigree was respectable. Dolores retrieved a second cup of coffee for Astrid. Sit down, Jackson. Eat with us. He'd lost his appetite. Guilt and resentment needled him. This was his family, for better or worse. Jaw clenched. He moved around the house, flicking off light switches. His family watched him like he was an alien creature they didn't understand. Morning light streamed through the oversized bay windows. Outside, past the double-level deck, the lake reflected the pristine blue of the sky, clouds like billowy cotton. He strode through the gleaming kitchen and made for the basement stairs. Where are you going? Astrid asked. To check our stores, make some notes, see where the holes are, and shore them up while we still can. Good luck with that. There was a false, syrupy sweetness in her voice that grated on his nerves. He ignored her. He had a list in his head. It was growing by the second. More propane for the generator, batteries, anything solar powered, more ammo, additional first aid supplies. Would they need to grow their own food? 
He was terrible at that sort of thing, but Dolores loved gardening. Instead of roses and lilies, they needed heirloom seeds and materials to build a greenhouse. Jackson's parents assumed money and influence could buy their way out of any problem. Not this problem, and not this time. He doubted they knew how to deny themselves anything. They continued to consume everything around them like they'd done their whole lives, as their ancestors had done for generations. Their barren grandparents and great-grandparents had exploited the land and water, stripping the earth of precious metals, cutting the great timber without a thought to conservation, to what might be left after they'd ravaged it. They had never stopped to consider the sources of their consumption, or that the resources they squandered could be used up. As he descended the stairs, he took the flashlight from his belt and flicked it on. He lived in the finished basement. The storage room was located to the right of the downstairs bathroom, inside the home gym. The last time he'd checked their stores a few weeks ago, he'd built up six months of food, toiletries, and first aid for the four of them. He didn't consider himself a prepper, but when you lived in a hostile land like the UP, you needed to be ready for anything. Inside the storage room, it was windowless and dark. He swept the flashlight beam over the wooden shelves he'd built several summers ago and froze. He blinked, looked again. Every shelf was completely barren. The five-gallon buckets of beans and rice were gone. The plastic containers of MRE were gone. The boxes of canned goods, of vegetables and fruits and tuna. It was all gone. 29. Jackson Cross. Day 5. Jackson's hands shook. The flashlight wavered. He stared, stricken. What the hell had happened? The months of buying extras. The time spent organizing the supplies by date, rotating food in and out. All wasted. Disbelief, frustration, and anger warred within him. All this time, he'd felt okay, confident he had this stash. He'd had time to figure things out. Except now he didn't. They had no backup, no reserves, no safety net. Jackson backed out of the storage room without bothering to close the door. Numbly, he moved to the stairs. Frenetic thoughts ricocheted inside his head. He couldn't focus, couldn't think. A growing sense of alarm built inside him. He was balanced upon the lip of a cliff, far too close to the edge, vertigo about to push him over. Astrid rolled her wheelchair to the top of the stairs. Something wrong, brother? Jackson stood at the base of the stairs and stared up at her. What the hell did you do? Astrid loomed above him. Cyrus stood behind her, a silent, hovering shadow. In the shadowy light, his eyes were bottomless. Jackson's hands balled into fists at his sides. Anger roiled through him, sharp and bitter. He struggled to control it, to control himself. What did you do? Whatever do you mean? She asked. He hated it when she spoke like that. Derogatory, insulting, but with a cloying, saccharine sweetness. Smiling at him, her hands caressed the wheels of her chair, as if simultaneously taunting him and reminding him of her helplessness. That was the problem. No one could get offended. No one could get upset. Astrid was forever the maimed, crippled girl, a permanent victim. No matter what she did, how she treated people, her small cruelties. Where the hell is everything, he demanded. Her pretty smile widened. You know I have a heart for charity. I donated all those boxes to people who really needed it. The harbor was so grateful to receive all the supplies. It will do some real good. How? He choked out. When? On Monday, actually. They brought a truck. 
Cyrus helped lug everything upstairs. He was so helpful. You work all the time anyway. I knew you wouldn't notice, and you didn't. He vibrated with restrained rage. How could she? How could she invade his private spaces, steal what didn't belong to her? But he knew how, and he knew she'd enjoyed every second of it. Her blue eyes glinted. You don't need to be so selfish. You're the one always talking about helping others. And all along, you had this stash you were hoarding all to yourself. That was for us, for all of us, to hold us over in case of a disaster or, or what, Jackson? Nothing, nothing is happening. We're fine. We're not fine. That's what you don't get. Then you'll figure it out, won't you? You always do. He climbed the stairs with legs like cement. The anger drained out of him, replaced with a dull emptiness. He felt like a stranger in his own house. He reached the top step. Move. His sister gave him an even appraising stare. A tiny sneer appeared at the corners of her mouth. Mind your manners. Please. Very slowly she wheeled her chair back, allowing him passage. Her eyes dared him to challenge her, to fight, to yell, to lose his cool. Cyrus said nothing. He didn't need to. He stood behind Astrid and smirked. Jackson resisted the temptation to punch him in his smug face. He would deserve it, too. Jackson knew this familiar song and dance. His parents would rush to her defense. His mother would cry. His father would yell. They would do their best to make him feel small, to put him back in the comfortable box where they kept him. It's what they did. Jackson will take care of us, Dolores said. She sat at the table and with a full plate, but she hadn't taken a bite. Won't you, Jackson? I'll fix it, he said heavily. I'll figure it out. Dolores rose and circled the long dining table. She approached him and placed her dry, thin hands on his face. She drew him close and kissed his cheek. Her breath smelled of vodka. Love tugged at him. Love and obligation. He had never known one without the other. Once he'd dreamed of leaving and never coming back, escaping the way that Lena had, the way his brother had. With his brother's abdication, then his sister's accident, he was the only sibling left to care for this crumbling dynasty. He touched his mother's silvery hair. She leaned into him her bones thin and fragile as a bird. What would we do without you? She murmured into his chest. He knew he would keep doing what he always had. He would swallow his anger and find a way to take care of them, to keep them safe, whether they deserved it or not. It was his responsibility. Jackson kissed the top of his mother's head and gently extricated himself from her grasp. Where are you going? Cyrus asked as Jackson headed for the front door. It was the first time he'd spoken to Jackson that morning. Jackson took his keys off the hook and pocketed them. I'm going to Marquette for supplies. I have to replace our stores that Astrid gave away. If it's not too late already. Astrid crossed her arms over her chest. No nuts! I am aware. They'll kill me. I'm deathly allergic. I know, he said with a patience he did not feel. Nuts are an excellent survival food for the rest of the family. I'll be careful and keep them separate from anything you would eat. She looked at him like he was the crazy one. He felt the strain of their expectations, their needs. It was a burden he'd carried his entire life. Cyrus slouched into a chair at the end of the table and pulled out his phone but didn't look at it. He watched Jackson with an intensity that was disconcerting. 
Jackson met his gaze until he looked away. Furious with all of them, he clenched his jaw and fought it down. He was the peacemaker. As frustrating as they were, they needed him. And much as he hated it, he needed Astrid's help. He'd been putting off the Ruby Carpenter case for far too long. I have a case. You might be able to help. Astrid beamed at him. Of course I'll help you, big brother. I love helping other people. It's what I do. Ruby Carpenter. Her mom says she usually stays at the harbor. The harbor was a youth homeless shelter located just outside of Christmas. The facility provided a clean, safe bed for the night, drop-in laundry and shower services, and free counseling. In her great benevolence, Astrid volunteered two nights a week, when she wasn't out doing who knew what with Cyrus. Yes, I know her. She's been in and out since she was 12 years old. With a pang, he thought of Shiloh, out there somewhere, lost like Ruby. He thought of Cody, how he'd been trapped in that rambling house with Amos Easton, potentially driven to kill. They weren't the only ones who'd slipped through the cracks. The UP had seen its share of lost girls, lost boys too, mostly runaways, victims of overdoses, domestic violence, tragic accidents. They didn't have the resources to find them. He felt like he'd failed them all. She's not at the shelter, Astrid said. I check the logs. She hasn't been there in at least a month. Do you have any idea where she might have gone? Astrid shrugged. For someone who worked with troubled teens, she could be incredibly indifferent to the plight of others. She's had boyfriends in Marquette. There's a shelter over there she's talked about before. Don't remember the name. Sorry. He was headed to Marquette anyway. He could kill two birds with one stone. I'll check it out. She squinted at him. Why are you wasting your time with her? She's nothing but white trash. Your sister is right, Horatio said in derision. That girl is a chronic runaway. Her older sister was, too. That whole family is trouble. Besides, you have far more important things to focus on. Funny, the sheriff said the same thing. Sheriff Underwood isn't the sharpest tool in the toolbox, but he's right. Horatio Cross leaned back in his dining chair and studied Jackson. You want a prayer of being sheriff yourself? You need to reorder your priorities, son. Solve the important cases and stay in the sheriff's good graces. The city manager and the governor, too. Sheriff is a political position. As the prior sheriff of Alger County, his father's priorities were, and always had been, political alliances. Power, influence, and authority. Jackson cared for none of those things. While his father valued power, Jackson coveted a life of order, right and wrong, black and white. He sought order, rules, his faith. They were his solid ground, nothing more and nothing less. Her mother deserves to know where she is. His stomach twisted in knots. It was difficult to focus. He couldn't stop thinking of the empty storeroom, what that meant for their future. He had to escape this house. He couldn't breathe enough oxygen. Without another word, Jackson opened the door and left his feckless family behind. 30. Shiloh Easton, Day 5 Shiloh spent an hour listening to the wind-up emergency radio she'd borrowed from her grandfather's shed. She'd rather listen to music, Billie Eilish or Glass Animals, but there were only staticky messages about the power outages and satellites not working. There was still no power in town. At night, she drove the ATV down the long country roads. Even in what passed for town, it was dark and quiet. Those who had generators were careful in conserving what fuel they had. Using her lockpick set, 
She'd broken into Sheldon Murphy's shed behind his farmhouse and stolen the jerry can of gasoline he kept for his riding lawnmower. She felt bad about it, but not enough to stop. And then last night, she'd gone to Lindsay May Sutherland's out on Dancing Fern Lane because she baked chocolate mousse pies on Fridays to serve for potluck at church. Shiloh knew this because she and Cody had been dragged to church whenever their grandfather felt too guilty for slapping them around and decided God could save him. God never did. Shiloh had been devastated to find zero pies in the rank refrigerator. Instead, she'd rummaged in the cupboards and borrowed an unopened jar of peanut butter, a bag of Doritos, and five oriental ramen noodle packages. Jackpot. She never stole anything crucial. She took bags of M&Ms and Snickers, frosting-coated Pop-Tarts and Lay's potato chips. Occasionally, a book she liked, Call of the Wild, and The Man in the Iron Mask had been bootlegged from lakefront vacation homes. She'd discovered something else in Mrs. Sutherland's house. On the kitchen counter sat several flyers. The flyers featured a photocopied image of a girl with red hair, black eyeliner, and a hard, unsmiling mouth. Missing, Ruby Carpenter, was scrawled in big block letters above the picture. Shiloh knew this girl. Ruby had gone to the high school but had dropped out. Shiloh had seen her talking with Cody several times out by the bike racks after school. Cody would give her something, and she'd hand him cash, their movements sneaky and furtive. The hairs on the back of her neck had stood on end. But what did it mean? That's what she didn't know. Before she'd left, she'd stuffed one of the flyers in her pocket. Now it was somewhere in her backpack, a wrinkled mess. Her stomach rumbled. She put thoughts of the flyer out of her mind and set about making dinner. She'd brought some food, but not enough. Camping by yourself was harder than it looked. Gathering firewood, starting a fire, boiling water, catching food, and then cooking it. You had to be incredibly patient, and you couldn't make mistakes. She'd burned the first hair she'd caught in a snare to a black crisp. Hungry as she was, it was inedible. Shiloh had managed to recreate the Dakota fire pit the way Eli had shown her. She crouched next to the pit outside the mouth of the cave entrance and heated up a can of SpaghettiOs in a cast iron pan. She was tired and dirty, hungry and alone. Her scalp itched. Ants had invaded her sleeping bag, probably because she'd curled up there and eaten half the Doritos bag last night. She'd never missed a shower so much. Eli made it look easy. She kept thinking about him, how he wasn't what she'd expected, how he smelled of wood smoke and kerosene, not what a murderer should smell like. She'd gone back to his campsite three times in the mornings since she'd needed to refill her water bladder. She would hang back, staying within the woods where the shadows crouched, shielding her. Shiloh felt drawn to him, fascinated by this strange man who chose to live in the woods. She should hate him. All her life, she'd heard horrific stories about him, the terrible things he'd done, the boogeyman of her childhood, a monster, the cannibalistic Windigo. But she didn't see a monster or a Windigo. She saw a man who hadn't hurt her, who'd talked to her like she mattered who didn't belittle or scorn or send her away. She no longer believed that he'd killed her mother. He was dangerous, certainly, but a different kind of dangerous. Besides, she had the crossbow. If she felt threatened, she could always shoot him. When she visited the campsite, he never looked at her directly, but she had the feeling he'd known she was there the whole time. He tended the fire, gathered firewood, fished the stream, washed his clothes, and sterilized water in a weird gadget that looked like a small rocket. She watched him pull off his shirt and drape it over the handlebars of the mountain bike he'd leaned against a nearby jack pine. He was strong, his chest and arms padded with ropey muscles. Her gaze was drawn to the long, thin scars on his stomach, 
On his lower left side was a dime-sized pucker of shiny flesh, as if from a bullet. A minute later, he'd pulled out another shirt from his pack and tugged it on, hiding the brutal landscape of his flesh. He adjusted the pistol he carried tucked inside his jeans. Then he bent, removed a protein bar, and set it on a rock in the middle of his campsite, then went about his business. She knew what he was doing. He was coaxing her out into the open. It worked. She'd crept out of the trees like a fox, wary and anxious, but eager too, and so hungry. The crossbow was in her hands, nudged up against her shoulder, a bolt loaded. Hey, he said. She didn't respond. Eli sniffed. You smell. Had a bath recently? None of your damn beeswax. He angled his chin at her crossbow. You can put that down. I'm not going to hurt you. That's exactly what someone who's going to hurt you says. He sat on a log he'd dragged near the fire and studied her. Keep carrying it. Bet your arms are getting tired. Good luck eating that chocolate protein bar with your hands full. He made a good point. She edged closer. The crossbow did weigh a ton. Her mouth watered traitorously. Shiloh lowered the crossbow and set it on a large, flat rock, still loaded. Withdrawing her knife, she held it low at her side and snatched up the candy bar, then retreated several steps. Better? If you touch me, I'll peel your face like a potato. The corners of his mouth twitched. Understood. Keeping one eye on Eli, she ripped open the wrapper with her teeth and took an enormous bite. Flavor exploded in her mouth. Delicious chocolate and caramel and nuts. She wanted to close her eyes to relish the exquisite joy of chocolate, but she couldn't take her attention off the wolf. A tame wolf was still a wolf, and nothing about Eli Pope pointed to tame. Shiloh pointed to the rocket-shaped thing next to him. What's that? It's a solar kettle. You fill it with water, then open the sides, like this. The reflective sides conduct heat and boil the water, sterilizing it. You never want to drink water from the lake or the river without filtering it first. You can use the hot water to make coffee, tea, oatmeal, whatever. Why don't you just boil water over the fire? It takes a lot of effort and uses a lot of firewood, more than most people think. Yeah, it sucks hairy coconuts. She chewed on her candy bar. Her gaze settled on a rumpled shape draped across the log beside him. And that? That is called a ghillie suit. He showed her how he'd taken a surplus camo hunting jacket and sewed on strips of burlap from a coffee sack over brown netting using fishing line, 550 paracord, a sewing needle, and some glue. He'd used braided jute twine and demonstrated how he separated the twine into separate fibers. He tied them into the netting all over the jacket and then added twigs and leaves. It's the art and science of camouflage. It breaks up the human outline and helps you blend into your surroundings. This is how you disappear in plain sight. To sneak up on people before you kill them? He shot her a sharp glance. Something like that. Like a lion hiding in the grass while it creeps up on the antelope, she said, in awe, impressed. She wanted one. The river gurgled, the water running clear over mossy rocks and submerged branches. It was sandy near the river, the ground pebbled with stones. Black flies swarmed over the water's surface. While Eli worked on his ghillie suit, Shiloh dug one hand into the front pocket of the hoodie she wore, Cody's hoodie, and pulled out the small baggie she'd discovered in the pocket a few days ago. Through the plastic, she rubbed her fingers over one of the little blue pills. Shiloh knew what her brother did, that he gave certain kids Adderall pills in exchange for money that he was saving for art school. This was what he'd given Ruby Carpenter. She thought of the missing person flyer with Ruby Carpenter's photocopied face. Cody and Ruby had known each other. They were both missing. What did that mean? 
What was the connection? Was there a connection? And if there was, how would she find it? She wasn't acting like a hunter. What had she done so far? She'd broken into some houses and wandered around Christmas in Munising, avoiding cops, jumping at her own shadow. Downstream, a great blue heron stalked its prey. It stepped, stiff-legged, in the shallows. A moment later, it plunged its beak below the surface, then plucked a wriggling fish from the water. She watched the heron swallow it whole. Though it wasn't cold, she shivered. It was time to hunt. 31. Jackson Cross. Day 5. As Jackson drove 50 miles west to Marquette, he considered the case. The many threads that had seemed so disconnected, but might not be. Cody was a prime suspect in his grandfather's homicide. He had motive, means, and opportunity. He had a history of violence. His bloody footprint put him at the scene. And then there was Sawyer, always lurking in the background. Why had Sawyer called Easton so many times? Was there a connection between Sawyer using Cody as a drug dealer and the murder? Or the fact that Cody had borrowed a boat registered in Sawyer's name? There were too many coincidences. Jackson did not believe in coincidence. What if Sawyer had ordered Cody to kill his grandfather for some reason? But why? There were too many unanswered questions. He needed to talk to Sawyer himself. Even if Sawyer wouldn't talk to anyone else, Jackson might be able to get something out of him. Though far from friends, they had decades of history between them. Needing a distraction, he turned on the radio and listened to the news. Norway, Switzerland, Belgium, Germany, and dozens of countries across the Northern Hemisphere reported complete blackouts. The stock market had closed, along with all financial institutions. China's public transportation system was down. Hundreds of cargo ships were stranded off the ports of Singapore, Shanghai, Los Angeles, and Houston. Massive global shortages were being reported across the food, medical, and transportation supply chains. The authorities made no mention that the cascading effects might be permanent. Apprehension shivered through him. Things were getting worse. The old adage about panic was a thin excuse. People deserved the time to prepare. They deserved the truth. He entered the city and drove through the streets of Marquette. He passed long lines at a food bank. The gas station lines snaked around the corner. Grocery stores and hardware stores were packed. The afternoon's bright blue sky felt insidious, like Mother Nature was mocking them, playing with them, like the Greek gods played with human fates. At the first homeless shelter, room at the inn, they recognized his photo of Ruby Carpenter, her red hair and defiant pout. Astrid was correct. Ruby had stayed here, but not for over a year. No one had seen or heard a word from Ruby Carpenter. He gave them the standard missing person information. They promised to keep a lookout. He felt his hope dwindling. She was out there, somewhere. He wanted to bring her home, especially now with the looming disaster. He'd made a promise, and Jackson hated to break a promise. The second shelter was located on the outskirts of Marquette. It was a small home run for indigenous girls and women, called simply Nindanis House. Nindanis meant my daughter in Ojibwe. It was unlikely that Ruby had stayed here, but he would check anyway. At the front counter, Jackson showed his badge and pulled out the slightly wrinkled flyer. Have you seen this girl? The woman behind the counter was in her 70s. Wrinkles scoured her face, her silver-white hair pulled back in a braid. She was Native American, likely Ojibwe. She sat behind a plexiglass window. Two ancient computers sat atop the countertop, the screens blank. The cracked yellowish linoleum floor had seen better days. Two vanilla-scented candles set on the counter flickered, deepening the crevices beneath her eyes. The woman frowned as she took the flyer through a slot in the glass. 
She is far from home, if she is here. But I have not seen her. I am here every day. If she walked through these doors, I would know. Disappointment constricted his throat. He turned to go. Wait. The woman's chair squeaked as she wheeled across the room, opened a filing cabinet, and riffled through it. She yanked out a photo and squeaked back to the plexiglass window. She shoved it through the slot at Jackson. You come here, searching for your pretty white girls. But how about this one? You never come looking for them. Jackson held the five-by-seven photo of a girl of about 16. Long, glossy black hair, lovely dark eyes, high cheekbones. She wore ripped jeans and a tight white t-shirt, her arms crossed defiantly over her chest. Dark marks speckled her forearms. She was Ojibwe. She came from the Keweenaw Bay Indian Res, but she talked about a half-brother in Bay Mills. She stayed with us three months at the start of the year. She was addicted to heroin, but we got her into a sponsored treatment program with methadone. Many girls don't make it, but she was cleaning herself up. She had dreams, things she wanted to do. One of the ones who might make it. She grimaced, like it pained her to speak the words. Her half-brother offered her work in Munising, leading kayaking tours to pictured rocks for the tourists. I do not remember his name. She left in March and promised to call when she arrived. No one has seen or heard from her since then. My cousin in Bay Mills says that she never arrived. Jackson couldn't tear his gaze away from the girl's haunted eyes. There was something about her, something both tough and soft, tragic and strong. What is her name? Nibin is her real name. It means summer in our language. Summer, Tabasa, in yours. I'll ask around, see if I can find her. Her gaze hardened. Will you? I will. From the other side of the plexiglass, she jabbed a thin finger at him. Do you see those marks on her arms? He looked at the photo again. He saw them. He knew what they were. Cigarette burns. She didn't do that to herself. It was her mother. They say a mother would never do things like that. They can. They do. He swallowed. He'd seen those burns on child abuse victims, on addicts, domestic violence cases, and on Lily. Wild and haunted. A bright girl running from a darkness inside herself that he'd never understood in his youth, and still didn't understand now. No one cares about these girls. They die. They go missing. They leave with bad men and do not return. No one looks for them, not downstate, and certainly not here. I care, Jackson said. Do you believe the electricity will return? The old woman asked abruptly. He hesitated. No one had asked him that outright. No, he said finally. I think that things are going to get bad, very bad. It may be a long time before it gets better. She nodded seemingly satisfied with his honesty. If this happens, there will be more to fear than hunger. What do you mean? The monsters of society, they hide. But when there are disasters, when bad things happen, the monsters gain strength. They feed on pain and fear. I know. They won't need to hide anymore. They will hunt in plain sight. Who will stop them? He couldn't take his eyes off the woman, her beetle-black eyes. A tightness in his chest, his throat dry as old bones. I will, he said. I will stop them. She leaned back in her chair, 
scorn and disbelief in her wizened face. Do you believe that? Yes, I do. He tapped the photograph. May I have a photocopy of this picture? No electricity. The things done before can no longer be done the same way. She studied him for another minute, her bloodless lips pursed, wrinkles spanning the skin around her black eyes. Take it. You said you'll look for her? So look. Do what you have said you will do. He didn't know this woman from Adam, yet he felt her words like an accusation, like a pronouncement of guilt. Ma'am, he said, his words measured as he slipped the girl's picture into the pocket of his windbreaker. I will try. 32. Jackson Cross. Day 5. At Lake Superior Outfitters, the shelves were sparse. In another day or two, they'd be barren. The aisles were crowded, people hurrying with their heads down. A sense of quiet urgency permeated the store. No music played over the speakers. The fluorescent lights were off. Daylight streamed through the front windows and glass double doors. The deeper into the store he headed, the darker it was. Near the back, People used their phone's flashlights to scan the shelves. Jackson pushed the old woman's words out of his head and focused on the task at hand. He would worry about what she'd said later. He procured a couple of solar chargers and extra solar panels, a second camping stove, several wind-up flashlights, an emergency wind-up radio, battery and solar LED lanterns, and extra propane canisters for the grill and portable heaters he had in the garage. He stocked up on ammo for his Remington shotgun and Glock 17, then picked up the last solar dehydrator. With a dehydrator, he could keep meat preserved, along with fruits and veggies. When he checked the generator aisle, they were all gone. A smaller secondary generator would be helpful to augment their whole house generator, which hooked up to their propane tank. The checkout lines were long, 15 to 20 people in each lane. The store accepted cash only. The handwritten sign was taped to the front door. The next person in line could only purchase half of her cart's contents. She swore at the cashier and stormed off with the half she'd paid for. The couple in front of him tried to pay with a credit card. They had a solar generator in their cart, along with sleeping bags, a rocket stove, and a portable water purification system. The cashier explained in a flat voice that the machines were down. He looked bored. Not even an impending apocalypse could get a rise out of him. The couple argued, cajoled, begged. The woman had choppy blonde hair and wore an oversized hoodie with sweatpants. Her partner was a heavyset guy in a green Packers jersey. He smelled of cigarettes. We have a checkbook, the woman said. Come on. Just let us pay and get out of here, the cashier shrugged. Like the sign says, cash only. If you don't have cash, I can't help you. If you don't step aside, I'm gonna have to call security. The woman cursed and flicked him off. The man's hands formed fists, legs splayed like he was prepared to fight. His face reddened with embarrassment and anger. Jackson tensed ready to intervene. He wore plain clothes, but he carried a service pistol, concealed by his windbreaker, and he had his badge. This wasn't his jurisdiction, but he'd get involved if things got dicey. The cashier stared them down. Step aside, please. Move along, someone behind Jackson shouted. Grumbling, the couple left their cart where it was and stalked out of line. Jackson pointed to their cart. I'll take that generator. If you got cash, you can have it. That's the last one. He always kept cash on hand for emergencies. I do. Lucky dog, muttered the guy behind him, a middle-aged man in a plaid shirt and trucker hat that stated, truckers do it best. The cashier strolled around the counter and dragged the couple's cart out of the way. 
A pile of carts loaded with unpaid-for camping supplies crowded the front of the checkout aisle. The remaining folks in line grew quiet. The tension was tangible. A few lowered their heads, bills clutched in their hands, silently counting through clenched jaws. They eyed the abandoned carts greedily. Jackson peeled off a large number of $20 bills. Movement snagged the corner of his eye. A cop's intuition made him look up. The couple hadn't left the store. They lurked near the front doors. The woman kept her back to the checkout as she pretended to peruse a rack of sunglasses. The guy in the Packers jersey telegraphed his intent with furtive movements. He crept closer, his expression nonchalant. As the cashier counted out Jackson's change, Packers snuck up behind him and seized the cart with the solar generator. Jackson took three swift steps past the checkout counter and reached the perp. The man didn't have a chance to move. Beneath his windbreaker, Jackson nudged him with the muzzle of his service pistol. Packers flinched, startled. What the? Law enforcement, he said in a low voice, so only the man could hear. You don't want to do this. Trust me, it's not the way to go. The man froze, his face contorted in fear and anger. Release the cart, go to your wife, and leave the store. Don't come back. Do as I've instructed immediately, and I won't arrest you. Fear won out. Packers released the cart and lifted both hands just high enough to keep them in Jackson's sight without drawing attention. I'm going, man. I'm going. He hesitated. I'm sorry. It's just... My wife. The woman turned around, one hand on her swelling belly. She had to be eight months pregnant. Jackson hadn't seen that from behind. We've got another little one at home. Packer's voice was strained. She's five, and she's asthmatic. We need electricity to run the nebulizer when she has an attack. We know the power might not come back on for a long time. I've never stolen in my life. I would never. We need that generator. I'm sorry. Pity welled in Jackson's chest. He felt himself softening. He had the money. At the same time, cash was king. He knew he would want it later. And yet, it wasn't in him to turn his back on a young family. Not when it was within his power to help. The cashier stared at them, as did the people in line behind him. Everything all right there? The trucker asked. Everything's good. Just chatting with a friend. Jackson lowered his voice. Take the generator. Stunned, Packer stared at him, open-mouthed. He'd expected to be arrested, or at the least, forced to leave empty-handed. It's yours. As long as you take a word of advice, Jackson said. Burn that jersey. Get yourself a lion's one instead. The man blinked. Then a slow smile spread across his face. Hell no, sir. But I appreciate the thought. Packers took the card and returned to his wife. Their heads bent as he whispered something to her. The woman tossed a grateful look over her shoulder at Jackson. Together, they hurried from the store as if they feared someone would steal their treasure before they got it home. Give it a week or two, and they might not be that far off. Jackson waited for them to leave before he returned to the counter and accepted the change from the cashier. He loaded the back of the truck and headed for the nearest superstore. Near empty shelves greeted him. He imagined the only reason they weren't completely bare was the cash-only rule. With banks closed for days, folks couldn't access their own money few people had enough cash reserves on hand. Families hurried from aisle to aisle, dumping products into their carts as if in a trance. People looked tense, worried and anxious. No one made eye contact. The toilet paper was gone, as was sunblock and bottled water. But he managed to snag a few quarts of bleach for water purification. Their house was on well water. He was glad he'd installed the solar well pump a few years ago. Astrid had mocked him. But after the propane for the generator ran out, the solar pump would provide water to the sinks and showers and flush the toilets. He filled two carts with the leftover canned goods, 
like tuna, ravioli, green beans, and beets. Next was peanut butter, beef jerky, powdered milk, sugar, salt, and baking soda. Then he grabbed the last of the large bags of dry beans, pasta, and rice. He added five-gallon buckets, some mylar bags, and oxygen absorbers for long-term dried goods storage. By the time he finished, his cash reserves had dwindled to less than a hundred bucks. It was dark when he hit M28 and headed east toward home. Above him, shades of crimson, tangerine, and hints of green striped the sky in undulating curtains. He'd gotten no closer to finding Ruby Carpenter, or Shiloh and Cody. He'd just added another missing girl to his list. His truck overflowed with supplies, but it seemed meager compared to what lay ahead of him. What lay ahead of them all. 33. Lena Easton. Day 5. The tan turd rumbled along I-75, headed toward Toledo. The green rolling hills had flattened out as Lena passed corn and soybean fields. Heavy traffic had slowed them down. They'd had to refuel outside of Columbus, Ohio. Without generators, many gas stations were closed. The ones still operating were rationing, ten-gallon limits, cash only. She'd stopped at five stations, at different exits to fill the tank and the jerry cans, wasting three hours. There were long lines. Vehicles were backed up along the roads, horns honking, people losing their tempers. Everyone was edgy and agitated. No fights had broken out, but a few had come close. Now, though, every gas station she passed was closed. They had no electricity to run the pumps, or they had run out of fuel. With her jerry can reserves, she should have just enough to get to Munising. She scanned radio stations, chewing a glucose tablet and sipping an apple juice to raise her blood sugar. One station discussed rumors that the president, the vice president, the National Security Council, Congress, and the Supreme Court were being moved to undisclosed locations. Photos had been released of two white 747s leaving Andrews Air Force Base. They were the Night Watch E-4Bs that provided an airborne command post for the president and could direct large-scale military operations or respond to major disasters. They were also hardened against EMPs and CMEs. Both Pacific and Atlantic submarine fleets had been spotted leaving ports. Large numbers of military aircraft were rumored to be headed to undisclosed locations. State Guard units were being ordered to report to their staging areas. She shivered. She didn't know what it all meant, only that it wasn't good. How long until the country descended into pure chaos? When people's pantries ran dry in a day or two. She'd read that many families only kept three days' worth of food on hand. Paying attention to the early warnings could be the difference between making it and not, between reaching sanctuary and being stranded a thousand miles from safety with no vehicle, no gas, and millions of scared and desperate people standing between you and your destination. She glanced in the rearview mirror. Bear sat happily in the back, head stuck out the window floppy ears streaming against his skull, mouth open, jowls flapping in the wind. Lena couldn't help but smile. No matter how bad things might get, as long as she had Bear, she could endure it. Bear barked. I know, I see it. Something was up ahead. Lena slowed, but she had no intention of stopping. They approached a caravan of three vehicles on the side of the road, a minivan, an SUV, and a Prius. A kid of twelve or thirteen stood on the shoulder, thumb out to hitch a ride. Beside him sat three little kids in varying states of disarray, two of them crying. A little girl stared at Lena with wide and frightened eyes. Next to the Prius, four adults stood in a huddled circle, heads down, gesticulating wildly, as if deep in a serious conversation. They must have run out of gas. The little girl waved. Bear barked in greeting. Pity tugged at her. But what could she do? There were too many of them to hitch a ride. She couldn't afford to give them a drop of fuel, or she wouldn't make it either. 
Bear gave a plaintive whine. His huge head stuck out one window, his fluffy tail banging the glass of the opposite window. He was tired of being cooped up. He wanted to play. Mostly, he wanted hugs and kisses from adoring little people. Sorry, buddy. I'm really sorry, but we can't stop. It hurt her heart. Everything in her wanted to help. She had the sinking sensation that everyone would need help soon, and there would be no one to give it. The task was too overwhelming, too enormous. What would these highways look like a week from now, a month? She thrust the what-ifs out of her mind and focused on the here and now. The end of the journey was within sight. She just had to make it there. 34. Shiloh Easton. Day 5. After dark, Shiloh took Highway 58 out of Munising and drove the four miles northeast to Sandpoint Beach. She parked the ATV next to a gray hatchback. She recognized several vehicles that belonged to Munising High School students. Shiloh wore Cody's black hoodie beneath her jacket. It was still cold at night. Since the beach was tucked behind Grand Island, it was sheltered from the worst of the wind. There were lovely views of the bay, Grand Island, and the old wooden East Channel lighthouse. She wasn't here for the views. A massive bonfire had been constructed on the beach. Camping chairs and blankets were strewn across the sand. Dozens of teenagers ringed the fire, their faces highlighted in flickering lights from the fire and the aurora ribboning the night sky above their heads. Tense voices drifted across the beach. Someone had brought a battery-operated radio and set it on a piece of driftwood. A BTS song played at full volume, but no one was listening. Girls whispered to each other, their expressions tense and upset. The guys huddled in groups or threw stones into the lake. Couples sat in camping chairs, holding hands and staring at the sky. For once, no one had their phones out, probably because their batteries were all drained. She'd heard rumors of the bonfires at school on Monday, before she'd lost time, before she'd awakened to a nightmare. Some of the seniors had planned a party every night to celebrate the Northern Lights. With school canceled for the week and the internet fried, there was little else to do. Shiloh approached a couple of girls and asked them about Cody, and then Ruby. She showed them the flyer. They brushed her off. She was just a kid. No one wanted to pay attention. No one cared. She moved among the crowd, searching for someone who could help her. She heard snippets of conversations, complaints about the lack of social media, dead batteries, missed TV shows. Most of them were talking about the power outages, how long it would last, how the supply chain would be affected, what it might mean for graduation, for college and jobs, the future. Several people looked like they'd been crying. Across the bonfire, a Hispanic girl with long, curly hair sat on the sand, her head bent as she strummed a guitar. Shiloh recognized her. Gabriela Velasquez was a junior at the high school. She was one of Cody's customers. And she was friends with Ruby. Shiloh strode across the expanse of beach, circling the bonfire. The heat licked her cheeks. A drunk guy danced around the bonfire, arms held high, beer sloshing from his red solo cup. He almost spilled his beer on her. Hey, sorry, he called after her, his words slurred. Shiloh barely noticed. She halted in front of Gabriella. You know Cody. Gabriella stopped strumming and squinted up at her. Her skin was ashen, her features pinched like she was upset. Do I know you? You know my brother, Cody Easton. I don't know him. Like hell you don't. He's missing. She made a face. That's none of my concern. I'm busy. I'm trying to find him. Gabriella bent her head again, her hair a curtain across her face. Well, I can't help you. Frustration surged through her. Shiloh considered stabbing the girl, but resisted. It was one way to get exactly what she needed. 
but perhaps not the wisest method. You got more flies with honey than vinegar, or something like that. Instead, she said, You get your pills from him? Gabriella's head snapped up. Her bloodshot eyes narrowed. How do you know? Tell me what I want to know, and I won't tell the cops. Go away. I'm not scared of you. You should be. Shiloh stuck her hand into the front pocket of the hoodie. Her fingers closed around the baggie of pills. She didn't like that Cody had been dealing. But if it would help her get what she wanted, she'd do anything. I have some. Gabriella's eyes gleamed, her pupils large in the reddish glow radiating from the sky. What do you want? I'll give them to you, if you can help me. Abruptly, her hostility vanished. Okay, fine. Fine, I'll talk to you. I don't know anything about your brother, I swear. I'm sorry he's missing. I heard about what happened to your grandfather. Yeah, well, sorry doesn't fix anything. I guess not. Shiloh sucked in a breath. What about Ruby? You know her? Yeah, sure. We're friends. She's missing too. She'll come back in a few days with some wild story to tell about a new boyfriend or some cool thing she did. Her mom's freaked, but Ruby can take care of herself. She's not missing. This is what she does. Shiloh pulled out the baggie and dangled it in front of her. Tell me everything you know anyway. Anything weird. Anything out of the ordinary. Gabriella didn't take her eyes off the pills. She did say one thing about this truck she kept seeing over and over, on her street and outside the cafe where she works and stuff. Ruby's dramatic, though. She's always trying to make things more important than they are. What did the truck look like? It was blue, that's all I remember. I think she said it was the janitor's truck, of the school. It freaked her out. He was following her? I don't know, I don't remember. He's weird, though. He's been there, like, forever, and barely talks, but like, looks funny, right? You get it. She shrugged. I don't think it's anything. The only reason Ruby hasn't called is because the phones are dead. I don't know why you're trying to find her. That's my business. You gonna give me those or not? I could really use them. This whole solar flare situation has been really stressful for me. I can't stop crying. I don't know what's going to happen. It's the end of the world. Yeah, maybe. Gabriella reached greedily for the pills. Shiloh tossed the baggie into her outstretched hand. If you tell anybody I gave you these, I'll yank your tongue out and feed it to you. Gabriella blinked. Have a great night. She left Gabriella gaping after her as she spun and headed back across the beach toward the parking lot. 35. Shiloh Easton. Day 5. The lock click, click, clicked. The sound loud in the silence. Crickets churred in the night. The aurora danced bright enough in the sky that she didn't even need a flashlight. Shiloh wrinkled her nose her lower lip protruding as she concentrated on picking the lock of the trailer's back door. The front door had a new, fancy lock, but the side door that entered through the laundry room was basic, a simple pin tumbler lock, ripe for the picking. She smiled grimly at the joke. Cody would have appreciated it. Cody would appreciate it. When she found him. Carefully, she picked back and forth, moving the pins up and down inside the lock, until she sensed the gap between the key pin and the driver pin lining up with the shear. The door unlocked. The information that Gabriella had given her seemed flimsy, insubstantial. But she had nothing else to go on. No clues, no evidence, nothing. It didn't seem promising, but this was the only lead that she had. Calvin Fitch lived at the end of a dead-end dirt road. Rusty cars cluttered the narrow street. Glass glinted along the shoulder of the road in the grass, broken beer bottles tossed into the ditch. Most of the houses were in disrepair, 
sagging single wides set on concrete blocks. Shin-high weeds clutched at the faded siding. A propane tank was hooked to the side of the trailer. No vehicles were parked in the grass driveway. Two lawn chairs sat on a flat patch of dirt beside a creek that ran through the back of several properties. Black flies and mosquitoes swarmed above the black water. Fifty yards to her right, a second battered trailer sat on blocks under a great weeping willow. A rusted beater truck was parked at the front door. There was no driveway, only wilted, weedy grass. She glanced behind her. The curtains twitched. She waited, frozen, until they fell back into place and went still. Once inside, she closed the door behind her and stood for a moment, letting her eyes adjust to the darkness. The air smelled musty. The trash can in the kitchen was empty, but for a couple of Stouffer's frozen dinners. The dishes were done and dried on the counter. Shiloh searched the trailer, ducking beneath windows and using a small pen light. The beam pointed down to avoid detection. She'd parked the four-wheeler at the top of the street, off the road behind a cluster of cottonwoods. You could never be too careful. Cautiously, but quickly, she moved, her heart thumping against her ribs, her breath caught in her throat, her senses on alert for the rumble of a car engine or sweep of headlights. She flipped couch cushions and checked beneath furniture, careful to put everything back as she'd found it. No embroidered pillow out of place. In the first bedroom, she found an unopened box of condoms in the bedside drawer, Sports Illustrated and Car and Driver on the nightstand. A striped bedspread, the bed made. She upended the mattress, discovered nothing but dust bunnies. On the nightstand, stood a framed photo of a years younger Calvin Fitch, arm in arm with a bearded man who looked familiar. They were squinting against the sun, surrounded by old growth trees, a derelict cabin behind them, weeds, rotting wood, a rusty bird bath encrusted with vines off to the right hand side. She'd seen that face before, but she couldn't place it. It was benign, forgettable. A boring adult in a sea of adults. Balding hair, bland, chubby cheeks, weak chin. Making a mental note of the man's face, she returned to the search. On her hands and knees, she checked beneath the bed. A shoebox of old photos, plastic storage bins, a cardboard box labeled cat toys. Her frustration grew. She rifled through drawers and closets, and even unscrewed the grates from the vents. So far, the man was impossibly dull and normal. She rummaged through coat pockets, chapstick, a few quarters, lint, and a receipt for a boat rental from the marina. She switched on the laptop sitting on the desk. Nothing happened. It was dead. She checked the drawers, the filing cabinet, a side table against the wall with framed posters of various football players hung above it. Bills boring stuff. A bookcase with boring books on birding. Birds of Michigan, a field guide, and wild about Michigan birds. She grinned. She slumped in the black pleather office chair. The wheels squeaked beneath her weight. Hot, defeated tears stung her eyes. She'd checked everywhere. Nothing suspicious or out of the ordinary. Another dead end. It felt like running full tilt into a wall. She had no other leads, no strings to pull, no resources. Tilting her head back, she closed her eyes. The fake leather stuck to the backs of her bare thighs. She needed to leave. It was past time to go. And yet she couldn't quite give up. There had to be something. The double wide was so quiet. No ticking clock, no refrigerator hum. No rumble of a generator or the pings from various electronics. Absolute silence, but for her own breathing, the sound of her pulse in her ears. Shiloh stood, the chair pushed back, wheels squeaking in protest. She shoved it back into place, slightly angled away from the desk as she'd found it. Leaving the second bedroom slash office, 
she padded down the carpeted hallway into the kitchen, scanned it again. Cupboards, sink, countertops, fridge, and stove, and trash can. No food and water bowl in the kitchen. She sniffed the air. A bit musty and stale. No kitty litter smell. Swiftly, she jogged back through the living room down the narrow hallway to the bedroom. Kneeling, she bent until her cheek pressed against the vinyl floor as she swept the pen light beneath the ruffled duster. The pen light highlighted the plastic bins labeled summer and winter clothing. The Christmas box. The box labeled cat toys. Maybe his cat had died. It was possible. The box forgotten beneath the bed. Shiloh flattened herself onto her stomach and reached for the box. It wasn't dusty. No mothballs or dust bunnies. No grit on her fingertips. The floor beneath the bed, too, had been swept clean, as if it were accessed frequently. Pulling it out, she sat up, legs crossed, and set it in her lap. An oversized shoebox. No lock. No secret code or key required. It was nothing. Still, her hands trembled as she set down the pen light. The aurora pulsed red through the curtains. Shiloh removed the lid. Polaroids. Hundreds of photos filled the box. The second thing that registered in her brain. The photos were of girls. Most of them were older than her, but still teenagers. The poses. All that skin. Her heart went cold inside her chest. Her hands turned clammy. An ill feeling expanded within her belly. She nearly vomited. Everything in her wanted to hurl the photos away, to scour the sight from her brain, to burn her fingertips where they'd touched the pictures. Instead, she forced herself to riffle through them, gently, carefully, touching only the edges. There were no pictures of Cody, no boys at all. It didn't make her feel better. Gingerly, she picked up a Polaroid from the stack. A pretty girl with black hair and no smile. The girls in the photos were strangers. Somewhere, someone knew them, loved them. They had mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers who missed them. Nausea churned in her stomach. Disgust roiled through her. She felt violated. Rage crackled through her like a forest fire. This man was sick, the worst kind of windigo. He should be locked up or shot. Shiloh voted for shot. She'd volunteer her crossbow. And yet, at some deeply selfish gut level, she was disappointed. She'd come for Cody. What did this monster have to do with Cody's disappearance? What if it was nothing at all? She had thought that Ruby's disappearance must be connected. Two kids from the same town, gone. It had to be more than a coincidence. But maybe it was. She was grasping at straws and she knew it. A distant sound registered deep in her consciousness. She blinked, startled. The rumble of a truck sounded somewhere outside. Her heart leapt into her throat. It might not be him. It could be a neighbor. Nothing to worry about. No reason to panic. The rumble grew louder. The truck was on this road. Frantic, she placed the lid back in place, slid the box back beneath the bed. Was it exactly where she'd found it? To the inch? To the exact degree? Would he know? Would he sense her presence? Her touch? With shaking fingers, she smoothed the ruffled duster. Springing to her feet, she shoved the Polaroid she held into her pocket, seized the pen light, and switched it off. The guest bedroom was located at the rear of the double wide. The aurora outside was bright, distracting. No reason he would have seen it. She sprinted for the doorway, reached the hallway, and slid into the kitchen, as the twin beams of headlights washed across the living room. Shadows wavered across the walls. Would he glimpse a shadow among shadows? 
Wouldn't he be night blinded by his own headlights? He hadn't seen her. She'd get away by the skin of her teeth. Half crouching, she lunged across the expanse of the kitchen floor and reached the laundry room, slipped inside, nearly tripped over the broom leaning against the wall. And then she glanced down. Shoes in a neat row in front of the washing machine. A pair of tennis shoes, a pair of khaki-colored sandals, and a pair of work boots, black with white stitching up the sides, red laces. A cold darkness enveloped Shiloh, like she'd somehow fallen backward into her own shadow. She knew those boots, remembered the salvage yard, a crowbar dripping blood. No time to consider what it meant, time to go, to get out. She fumbled for the door handle, her hands clumsy as two blocks of wood. The knob turned, she wrenched it open. Her pulse thudded so loud, she couldn't hear a thing. He could be right behind her, reaching out to seize her braid and yank her back into Hades itself. Shiloh ran. Her feet pounded, arms pumping, breath ragged, torn from her throat. She sprinted across patchy grass, trampled through a garden at the rear of the yard, terrified. She sprinted through several backyards. Brambles caught at her legs, thorns scratched her skin. The glow of the aurora tinged the forest red. She could see. If they were looking, someone could see her. Twigs slapped her face. A tree root tripped her. She flung out her hands, caught herself on the trunk of an oak tree. Then she ran again, gasping, lungs on fire. At the end of the road, the Honda four tracks waited behind the cottonwoods. Relief flooded her veins. Her legs turned to water. She yanked the key fob from her front pocket and straddled the four-wheeler, then jabbed the key at the ignition. She missed. Her hands shook so badly, she tried twice before the key finally went in. Behind her, an engine roared, not her own. Down the street, the truck, a menacing growl like a living creature, a predator on the hunt. She cursed under her breath. Panic threatened to strangle her. But she turned the key, and the engine roared to life. She switched the gear control into drive while releasing the brake, both hands gripping the handlebars, and accelerated like a bat out of hell.